position is explicitly to be said post-philosophic or trans-philosophic. The possibility of a trans-philosophic, post-philosophic, more generally non-philosophic position is based in Marx's view on the assumption that there are no alternatives. If you understand the situation, if you understand the situation, you see there is only one possibility of change of action. There are no alternatives, and therefore the question of principles of choice does not arise. And therefore, the first difficulty we have here is this possible. Uh, it's not at least the alternative of a destruction of civilization there, uh, to say nothing of the other alternatives which would come out in a more detailed analysis of the situation, as it truly points in one and only one direction. Marx tries to replace the philosophy by the empirical study of society. And this empirical study is however not simply empirical, but it is based on a premise. The premise being that the relations of production are the fundamental relations. This we can say, if you look at it, as we tried to last time, is a dogmatic premise. Marx himself admits in passing the simultaneity of what I call things production and misproduction. And that is uh, in itself fatal to the opposition. We have later, we, okay, we must see later what the reasons for this dogmatism are. But I proceed now. The presupposition of the empirical analysis of society is the primacy of the relations of production. And this, in its turn, is based on a certain notion of man. In the passage in the first part of the German ideology, where Marx introduces the basic premise, he says one can distinguish man from the brutes by consciousness, by religion, or by whatever you please. Men themselves begin to distinguish themselves from the brutes as soon as they begin to produce their means of living. That is producing the means of living. That is the difference between men and brutes. And the whole, all the so-called materialistic uh, conception of history simply follows from that. Uh, we can also refer to the passage in Capitas Capital, to which we have referred the distinction between men and bees, for the example. Man is distinguished from the bees by the fact that he has a conscious project. Man is the only conscious social being. He's both conscious and social. In other words, in his way, Marx says what Aristotle said. Man is a rational animal. There is somewhere a passage, I don't remember where, where he repeats the Aristotelian definition of man as a political animal, as a zoon political, without any criticism. So in, uh, Marx has a definite notion of the essence of man. But at the same time, Marx says, no, man is a historical being, and therefore any essence of man is irrelevant. He doesn't deny that there is an essence of man, that is irrelevant. And this finds its clear expression in the rejection of anything called eternal ideas, of which we have found traces in the Communist Manifesto. Because if there is an essence of man, there would, of course, be an essential order of human things, something like justice, virtue, or what have you. Uh, that is simply denied by Marx. So there is an essence of man, but this essence is irrelevant. So the difficulty appears most simply as that called relativism. The emancipation of the proletariat is not simply the substitution of one class for another. 
The emancipation of the proletariat is the emancipation of man. I read to you a few passages uh, from his critique of Hegel's philosoph uh, philosophy of right, which we have not been able to read yet. The proletariat uh, is characterized by universal suffering. He does not claim a special, particular right because no special injustice is done to it, but injustice simply, the absolute injustice. And the proletariat cannot refer anymore to a historical title, like the British Constitution, you know, but only to the human title, to the human title. As a proletariat is characterized by the complete loss of humanity, and therefore it can only recover through the complete recovery of man. The proletariat is the absolute class. The emancipation of the proletariat is the emancipation of man. It's the same context at the end of this uh, work, he says, the emancipation of the German is the emancipation of man. The head of this emancipation is philosophy. The heart, the proletariat. When, uh, when all inner conditions have been fulfilled, the German day of resurrection will be announced by the noises of the French cock, meaning the, the revolution will actually begin in France. But as day of the resurrection, and it is not merely the resurrection of either the Germans or the proletarians, it is the resurrection of men, there is an absolute difference between the proletarian and any other class. There can be no question of relativism. The Bolivian Revolution is the revolution and not merely one among many. But how can this be if there are no eternal ideas? How can you, dis or, uh, to use Marx's expression, eternal ideas, how can there be an absolute class if there are no absolute standards? Otherwise, Marx's expectation from the communist revolution would be merely the specific ideology of the proletariat as one class among many. Now, how does Marx avoid relativism? We can say this, the historical process is not infinite. It has a beginning and an end. A passage to which I have referred before in this, what communism is the return of man. The communism has completed naturalism and a completed humanism. Communism is a true resolution of the conflict between man and nature and between man and man. It's a true resolution of the conflict between existence and essence between objectification and spontaneity, between freedom and necessity, between individual and species. Communism is a solved riddle of history and knows itself to be that solution. The riddle of history, which was always unsolved, is now solved and known to be solved. That's Hegel. Marx avoids relativism by uh, fundamentally the Hegelian way. I referred also to the passage uh, where he speaks that communism possesses a consciousness which transcends or surpasses the historical movement. To repeat, it is a Hegelian solution. There can be an absolute class because there is an absolute moment in history. The recovery of man, the resurrection of man. But does Marx have a right to the such a gain solution? Hegel had a right. Whether Marx had a right is not a matter. 
and he read right fundamentally because of the teleological character of his conception. The historical process is the unfolding of the mind. And this unfolding is a teleological process. The mind always wanted to know itself, desire that. And then it finally reaches this result in the full consciousness of the mind's activity in Hegelian philosophy. I will have to come back to that. I turn to another point, another aspect of the problem of the essence of man or the nature of man. The Protean Revolution means the removal of self-alienation, the removal of the division of labor and private property, the establishment of the society of free and equals without and the withering away of the state, therefore. The substitution of freedom for everything which has grown by nature, and not to exigence. The moral regeneration of man. Freedom means the freedom of developing all my capacities, with the knowledge that this freedom of developing all my capacities presupposes the freedom of everyone else to develop his capacities. Such a freedom means that everyone should become a universal man in the language of Leonardo da Vinci, homo universale, you know, a man who develops all his faculties fully. There is this famous passage which we have not discussed in the first part of the German ideology, which I read to you. In the communist society, society regulates general production and thus makes it possible for me to do today this, tomorrow that, to go hunting in the morning, to go fishing in the afternoon, to raise cattle in the evening. I mean, why is like, evening is a particularly good time for cattle raising, I don't know. <laughs> to be a critic after luncheon, as I like, as I just happen to like, without ever becoming a hunter, a fisher, a shepherd, or a critic. That, in other words, this division of labor means that I have a job. I, have, I am, for example, I happen to be a, a teacher. Uh, someone else is a shoemaker. And someone, other man is a playwright. You know, everyone is something. But no one is a man, a human being. Is the taking back of the what, of the qualities, into full humanity, that is the human meaning of the overcoming of the division of labor. This notion, Marx would say, that is not an eternal ideal, that's an idea which could become visible to man only at a certain stage of the historical process. Men we did not strive unconsciously for freedom thus understood. They were concerned with entirely different things. But once a certain stage of productivity is reached, this is the goal which presents itself to man. So it is historic. Yes, but it is also final. There is no question that this ideal or this goal, this notion of human perfection, however you call it, can ever reasonably be changed in the future. Therefore, we have to look at it. Now, if we read this description of this fishing in the morning, cattle rising in the evening, and after dinner at the Critic and so we can say, how can we distinguish the, this universal man of the jack of all trades? Is such a man who does all these things truly superior to the right kind of one-sidedness? What, what, what is the use of everyone being a critic? instead of uh, doing some uh, work for which he is competent to do. Another illustration is, uh, is offered by another remark occurring in the same connection. True intellectual spiritual wealth of the individual depends entirely on the wealth of his actual relations. Through that, the, in the individuals are liberated 
from the various national and local limitations are put into connection with the production, also the intellectual production, of the whole world, the spiritual, intellectual worlds of an individual, which Marx regarded, of course, much more highly than his monetary wealth, as it depends entirely on the wealth of his actual relations. Now, these actual relations become enormously enlarged as soon as you have a world market, as, as you have relations to all parts of the globe, to all kinds of humanity, and this makes you intellectually or spiritually richer. You only have to think of a man like Shakespeare, who lived considerable time before the full emergence of the world market, who never left England, uh, who knew what he knew of antiquity and other places from certain books, and he was probably judicious in selecting this book. He should have less intellectual freedom than a globetrotter of the 20th century. Absurd. This freedom of which Marx speaks here can hardly be described as a desirable one. This ideal can hardly be said to be superior to earlier ideas. Furthermore, do all men in fact have capacities for everything? Is the one-sidedness of most men not natural? and therefore the division of labor not fundamentally natural. Are men all equally gifted? Now, Marx admits the inequality of capacities, as we have seen last time. The capacities differ, in particular the intellectual capacities. But nothing follows from that regarding reward or enjoyment. You remember that. Because from everyone according to his capacities to everyone according to his needs. Now, I will not go into this question, although it is, of course, of the greatest practical importance. It is identical with the question of the incentives, whether most men will make the necessary effort required by society without having incentives other than the development of their capacities. One could raise another question that is admittedly a casual remark, but I found it very interesting, and that occurs in his critique of Proudhon, the misery of philosophy. Society as a whole has this in common with a factory, that it also has division of labor. If one takes division of labor in a modern factory as an example, in order to apply it to a whole society, then surely that society would be best organized for the production of its wealth, which had only a single entrepreneur as leader, and who would distribute according to a plan the functions among the different members of society. But as you know, the opposite is true. We have anarchy of production. In other words, here seems to be, I do not know how relevant that is for the work of Marx as a whole, but I know this is a fact. Marx mentions occasionally the possibility that the anarchy of production can be avoided only by a social planning, but that this social planning must itself, requires itself a hierarchy of planners. And in other words, does even precisely the communist society not even require an inequality? Yet Marx, to come back to the crucial point, the inequality of capacities, Marx is hesitant about it, as would appear from a number of remarks. He develops this in the clearest passage on this subject occur in his writing on economics and philosophy, which is now accessible in an English translation. Partly basing himself on Adam Smith, Marx makes this suggestion. The inequality of capacities, which is empirically undeniable, is the effect rather than the cause of the division of labor. So the inequality of capacity, in other words, is a social product, not a natural data. Great inequality of capacities is certainly the effect of the division of labor. The division of labor 
in its turn leads rather to the impoverishment of the activities of the individual. All this would seem to lead to the conclusion that with the abolition of the division of labor, eventually there will be equality of capacities. But does not the inequality have natural roots? Yet, what is the historical process except the conquest of nature? and therefore also to some extent of human nature. But to what extent is the historical process a conquest of human nature and therefore a conquest also of natural inequality? Marx is unable to give a principle here for the very, and that is a revenge for his contempt about the question of the essence of man. Because if the essence of man is so, that the man is so wholly indeterminate, how can you then have any principle here? Let us read the clearest passage of Marx on the natural root of the division of labor. With the development of property, the division of labor develops. The division of labor was originally nothing except the division of labor in the sexual act. Yeah, yeah. In other words, uh, that is, of course, an absolutely fantastic assertion, because if you want to be realistic, you would have to say that this division of labor is not limited to the sexual act. There is a, it has to do with procreation as a whole. You know that um, men do not become pregnant, but women do. And, uh, but this uh, wholly unreasonable limitation to the sexual act, is, as, instead of taking the whole procreation, is a characteristic of the whole procedure. Now, if you think this true, uh, think this through, what is the conclusion? If the, the division of labor is rooted ultimately in the bisexuality of man, it is the primary form. And the division of labor is to be overcome. Let's get rid of the bisexuality. You don't laugh. I mean, it is silly, but it is a very serious problem. And there is, of course, and you know, I'm not speaking of Mr. or Mrs. Jurgensen in particular, <laughs> but I'm concerned with, with the positive, what, what people have given some thoughts throughout the, the ages to the question of producing human beings in test tubes. You know, the homunculus problem. But that is a practically absurd suggestion. I, uh, the, that is clear. But we are concerned now what is the principle which allows us to say that is absurd and not merely some vague knowledge of what we can do and what cannot do. Marx has not, it doesn't have such a principle. But he does not have a notion of the essence of man, which is sufficiently clear. And yet, Marx's position describes itself as humanism. How can there be a humanism if there is no relevant, essential difference between men and truths, and therefore if there is no relevant essence of man? No humanism without a fixed nature of man, which may undergo any changes, but retains its identity within the change. I must here place our colleague Harold Nasser. Uh, when he say, erased his famous question, is this presidential address of the American Voice Association, whether we should not give human rights to robots. Do you remember? Because after all, they might do all kinds of computation as any social scientist does, and that's better than some social scientists. So, uh, then he was in a way more consistent than Marx. Because if this is wholly undefined for the human being, it's also loosely defined as a being which may do computations, for example. And then it is, of course, impossible to draw a clear line between men and, and, and I mean, the, the interest which Marx necessarily arouses is based on the fact that he had missed an essential difference between men and brutes. But he has no longer a clear principle to maintain that. The conquest of nature includes victory over man's nature. 
This has another implication. Who is the victor? Who is the conqueror? If man is changed in this process, man is as much conquered as a conqueror. There must be something in man which is a conqueror and something other which is a conqueror. The clearest formulation is a distinction between the spirit and the non-spirit. In other words, here we see how true it is when Marx says that communism, as he understands it, is a synthesis of spiritualism and materialism. Let me now turn to Marx's moral philosophy in particular. Marx starts from the phenomenon of the modern worker, in contrast, say, to the medieval craftsman. The modern worker does stultifying work for the sake of mere life, mere subsistence. Whereas the medieval craftsman did meaningful work. That has been said many times before Marx, and from this some reactionaries drew the conclusion, let's return to the Middle Ages. Marx regards this as impossible, and not only in a very general way, because you cannot turn the wheel of history back, as you say, but Marx says the medieval class himself was not in such a desirable situation. There was also a considerable lack of freedom there in the, and of, of uh, intellectual limitations there. More generally stated, even there, in the, the medieval craftsman could not find full satisfaction in his work. Even there, there existed the cleavage of pleasure and of duty. That, we can say, is the starting point of Marx's reflections. Uh, Marx rejects all moral teachings on this ground. Either they teach pleasure or enjoyment, um, Epicureanism or whatever, or they teach asceticism, duty. And one point is very simple. If you have an ascetic philosophy, that means something entirely different to the man who is compelled to live ascetically because he is poor, as it means to the, uh, to the other one. And still more so in the case of enjoyment. What does the hedonistic teaching mean to someone who is prevented from uh, having any enjoyments of life? One must transcend this whole issue of pleasure and duty. In which way? Duty and labor belong together, of course. Duty, labor, asceticism, self-denial, all this belongs together, and enjoyment of pleasure. And what is that? Creative expression of life is the formula. A satisfying activity, which is not as such labor. Even if it is a productive activity, it doesn't have this particular meaning of labor. Labor is connected with somehow with pain and self-denial and the other things which Locke so eloquently described. So the solution of the moral problem is transcending moral philosophy and looking forward to a mankind who are capable, where everyone is capable of the creative expression of his individuality, of his life, satisfying activity. This is, of course, not transcending moral philosophy. This in itself is merely return to Aristotle. For what does, is a good life according to Aristotle? It's a life according to virtue. But that does not mean duty in this sense in which Kant has meant it, but it meant to do the work of man to do your work as a human being and to derive enjoyment from this very fact, satisfying activity. Sure, Aristotle spoke of virtuous activity, and Marx speaks of the creative expression of life. What does this mean? No, for Aristotle, not everyone is capable of virtuous activity, at least not uh, on a, a, a full level. And partly because he is un, um, by nature unable to do it, partly uh, because of unsatisfactory conditions. 
what Marx does in, in opposition, in tacit opposition to Aristotle, is to abolish the distinction between the necessary things and the noble things. Virtuous activity is noble, but uh, to uh, earn your livelihood is a necessity. There's nothing noble about that. And Aristotle does not expect a sensible man to find his satisfaction in the mere earning of his livelihood. He might be so fortunate as to earn his livelihood by doing the work of a human being, but that would be a really accidental. The mere procuring of the necessities of life is necessary and not noble. Marx denies that. Uh, how can he do that? Ultimately, because in the realm of freedom, as distinguished from the realm of necessity, there are no longer necessities. I mean, otherwise the distinction is not fully justified. One can also put it as follows, that it's equally correct, that Marx in opposition to Aristotle denies that there is a hierarchy of human activity. So let us assume, for example, a fishing, hunting, thinking, painting. These are all activities which people can enjoy. You can't say one is a higher, the other is a lower. One can also say that it's only one uh, only different aspect of the same thing. Marx forgets in this statement about base actions. Because if, one, if the possibility of base actions exists, then you admit the necessity of a morality, yeah. by virtue of which, uh, of a moral teaching, by virtue of which you distinguish between the noble and base. What Marx implies is that the moral generation of man will be the necessary consequence of the proletarian revolution. There will not be, uh, ultimately, the, the moral defects and the cowardice, laziness, etc., which we find, can only be understood in terms of the defective social conditions. Once man has come into his own, uh, not only crime, but any kind of lowness, meanness, must disappear. I always say it deliberately, everyone will have become a beautiful soul, a soul which by nature craves the beautiful and noble and nothing else. A withering away of the need for moral effort, not only a withering away of the state. Is this a fantastic implication of the Modern version of the Protean Revolution, we must never forget. So, moral problem can also be stated in this term. The, the private good, the good of the individual, and the common good. For Marx, the expression of life is essentially social, expression of a social life. Expression of social. Now, in one sense, it is a simple empirical variety. You see, what, when you see, for example, the most egoistic people, the people who don't care at all for the common good, as simple criminals. What do they find their enjoyments? That is always determined by the taste of the society in question. You know, they also want to go to the most elegant nightclubs. They want to have the most expensive cars, and the kind of thing. So the meaning of an enjoyment is socially determined. We cannot, generally speaking, in every expression of our life, we express somehow the society to which we belong. But this is not uh, what, according to Marx, is the end of the process. What is, what is characteristic of communist society is a complete and conscious socialization of the individual. Complete and conscious. So the problem of duty has disappeared because I necessarily find my satisfaction in being a member of society and acting in accordance with it.
Now, here the difficulties are rather great. The rather obvious and the most obvious one is what uh, shows the impossibility of a complete reconciliation of the individual and society. It's a, it's a fact of the death of the individual. Marx hardly ever alludes to that. There is a remark here, the death seems to be a harsh victory of the species over the individual and to contradict the unity of the species in the individual. Marx's answer is this, but the particular individual is only a certain definite a social being and as such mortal, which is only a repetition of what we know already. The counter-attack on Marxism, which was made by existentialism, we can say started from the phenomenon of the, of the death of the individual as the clearest sign of uh, the inadequacy of the social solution of the human problem. Let me assess the problem also in the following terms. If we look at the, the situation without the assumption of Marx, we can see that there could be such a thing of, as the interest of the proletarian as proletarian. And as Marx would admit, the proletarian as proletarian is not concerned with the development of all faculties of each. He is concerned, at the most, with common ownership of the means of production. And as little work and as attractive work as possible, that we can assume. This, of course, creates immediately this problem. As little work as possible. What about leisure? What about leisure? The famous problem of leisure, TV, etc. With what right does Marx assume that this problem will not arise? That people don't know what to do with their free time? With what right does he assume that this victory of the proletariat will bring about a moral regeneration of man so that the problem of boredom will never come, as it in fact comes? Basically, the difficulty is this, that the union of primacy of material production and the resurrection of man is problematic. Why should man, after having conquered nature by appropriation of the means of production, be concerned with developing all their faculties and not be lazy, etc., etc.? If I'm not mistaken, this difficulty here is underlying not only the disagreement between communists and non-communists, but also the fight between Trotsky and Stalin. Trotsky still was, as I just as learning, still was very much concerned with the regenerating character of the communist revolution, with the liberating and spontaneous character of the movement, of the movement which claimed to be the movement of the large majority on behalf of the large majority. The policies devised by Trotsky were in agreement with that, at least in principle. Therefore, the, uh, his attitude towards the problem of the peasants was entirely different from that adopted by Stalin. As you know, uh, Trotsky wanted a period of 10, 20 years in which the peasants would come to see for themselves that private ownership is not good for them. Stalin didn't see such a necessity for such a respect for spontaneous movements, and Stalin won. And Stalin, one could say, had very good reasons for winning that, because Stalin did not share Trotsky's and then his belief that the revolution of the Western proletariat is just around the corner. And he looked at the massive dangers threatening him, potentially at least from Germany and so on, 
and is done in a one with the Second World War, which Trotsky would have lost in all probability. So, by abandoning the great hopes, the hope for the regeneration of man, Stalin succeeded, and in Khrushchev succeeds. And that, I think, is a kind of empirical, not proof, but empirical indication of the problem of Marxism itself. And I think the clear sign for us what is going on today, incidentally, is that when the famous Thor came in, in 53 and so, I always was waiting that the name of Trotsky would be mentioned by uh, Khrushchev. It never was mentioned, and on the contrary, Trotsky is still in the, on the dung, to use the Trotsky in expression, on the dung heap of history. And uh, it serves him right, because uh, as Marx put it, when ideas are divorced from real interests, as he put it, uh, then they have always made themselves ridiculous. And Trotsky's notion, after the success of the Bolshevik Revolution, which was due to certain very special reasons, became divorced from the interests of large masses of men. Marx believed that the massive interest of large masses of men will bring them into a situation where they cannot but be morally regenerated. That doesn't exist. That doesn't exist. Uh, you can have a, a bureaucracy and a very efficient bureaucracy, which means wars and uh, uh, takes uh, dispose of all revolution that you can have, but that has nothing to do with moral regeneration. And that I think is an indirect proof of the necessity of a morality and therefore also of a moral teaching as such. But to come back to the main point of the argument. I said Marx avoids relativism by borrowing from Hegel the notion that there is such a thing as alienation and the overcoming of alienation. Therefore, a beginning and an end. And that the process is in some way cyclic. There is, that is in Marx, but it is also, there is also the opposite. For the cyclical process, as Hegel meant it, is teleologic. See, takes a simple example, it's the seed leading to the fruit, and again to the seed, again to the fruit. But so that the seed is the less developed, thing, and the fruit is the end, if an end which recurs again and again. Marx rejects teleology radically. Let's consider what that means. The common ownership of the means of production and the classless society is not the end of history predetermined from the beginning, but is the common ownership of the means of production and the classless society is a need of one definite class, the proletariat. Therefore, it is not a mere idea or something tough. But let me make another beginning. We start empirically in our analysis of society from what exists now. We see now production is capitalistic, and this leads to these and these consequences, and to this and this prospect. And this, is, this prospect is the communist society. But what about capitalism itself? Capitalism that was not predetermined in any way, of course. Capitalism is an unintended or unforeseen consequence of feudalism. You had a certain social order which made it possible for serfs to run away to the cities. Become the potential bourgeois of the future is a runaway serf. A runaway slave in classic antiquity was not the origin of a possible future class and therefore antiquity decayed, whereas feudalism was able to be transformed into the bourgeois society. Capitalism, in other words, is the necessary consequence of feudalism. It is not the end of feudalism. The feudal society, either the rulers or the ruled, didn't dream of capitalism. 
They uh, did what they did for the reasons apparent to them, which were all ideological, religious, or what have you. But nevertheless, the necessary consequence was the capitalist order. Yes, but still, is it not strange that this meaning in strict sense, meaningless process, men produce only with a view to immediate ends, the ends which they understand. They uh, build up a whole social order. This whole social order suffers from contradictions. And without anyone really understanding what is going on, as a society is destroyed, replaced by another society, this goes on and on and on. And then at a certain point, you have the prospect of man's resurrection. How can, in other words, you have something which you cannot but conceive as the, or conceive of as the end of the process. And yet this end it presents itself as a mere accidental outcome of a mechanically necessary process. Man is now for the first time coming into his own. Otherwise, the whole Marxian teaching doesn't make sense. There is no teleology. There cannot be teleology according to Marx, and yet there is a telos. Spoken more popularly, the Marx position is caressed by an unfounded optimism. As I said before, in the case of Hegel, that optimism, if you may use that word, was founded. If history is the development of the mind, it is at least plausible that there should be an end in which the mind is fully developed. But if history is the development of man's product, productive activity, there is no plausible reason why a certain stage of that infinite development should coincide with the regeneration of man. Marx half accepts the Hegelian scheme without the Hegelian guarantee. I raise again the question, why should common ownership of the means of production, on the present level of productivity of course, be a sufficient condition for the res resurrection of man? Why should the liberation from bondage be a sufficient condition for men's making a wise use of that freedom. Oppression is a good enough reason for fighting, for, for striving for liberation. But it does surely not guarantee a wise use of that freedom. Only if man is by nature striving for a wise use of his freedom, and only if his bondage to nature and as a consequence of that bondage, his bondage to other men prevents him from achieving his end. Then he truly comes into his own by that liberation, and there is no further question what he will do with the freedom thus achieved. In other words, the whole thing may exchange a sense only on a teleological premise. But according to Marx, man does not strive by nature for the full development of all his faculties and the other things. And there is not even a nature of man to speak of, as I have uh, indicated before. Now let me come to, begin to come uh, to my conclusion. Nature is by itself, as he puts it. Let me read to you a few passages from this economic philosophic writings again. Marx speaks of the being through itself of nature and of man. Yes, I don't understand. Can man be said to be by himself? Must one not raise the question of the origin of man? Now, for the later Marx, that was a foregone conclusion, especially after 1895, after Darwin's book. But let us see what Marx says about this question of the origin of man. 
here in this early writing. It is easy to say to the individual, as Aristotle has said already, you have been generated by your father and your mother, and an act of the human species has produced in you man. You also see that man owes physically his existence to man. You must not look only to, as a one side, the infinite progress, according to which you will ask on, but who has generated my father, uh, who is grandfather, etc., etc. You must also consider the circular motion, which is sensually visible in that progress, according to which man repeats himself in the act of generation. And therefore, man always remains a subject. It's always man generating man, regardless of what's in it and so on. But you will, you will reply to me, is this circular motion granted? Uh, you must admit to me the progress which compels me to continue to ask, who has generated the first man and nature all together? I can give you only this answer. So, yeah, your question is a product of abstraction. Uh, ask yourself, how do you come to raise this question? Whether you do not raise your question from a point of view to which I cannot give an answer because the point of view is, is uh, wrong. Ask yourself whether that progress, namely from uh, to the cause of the first man, is one which exists for a reasonable thinking. Uh, when you ask about the creation of nature and of man, you abstract from man and nature. You posit them as not being, and yet you desire that I, I shall demonstrate to them that they are. Uh, this passage is important for more than one reason. But I limit myself to one point which Marx seems to make here. The question of the origin of man does not make sense. That he surely says. And that is interesting. For, one, for some time, Marx went so far in trying to conceive of man as self-subsisting, as coeval with being. If he had spoken only of nature, the difficulty would, would not arise the same way. But he speaks of nature and man in the same breath. That's remarkable. Then he goes on to say, speaking to his questioner, I only ask you about the act of genesis, just as I asked the anatomist about the, the genesis of a bone, etc. But for a socialistic man, the whole so-called world history is nothing except as a generation of man through human labor, as a becoming of nature for man. Man becomes man through himself. Metaphysically expressed, man is the causa sui, the cause of itself. I don't believe that Marx ever repeated these points but they show what he wished. Marx wished to make man the absolute being, the highest being. As he explicitly says, man is the highest being for man, but he wanted more. He wanted to make man the highest being, simply. Man is the substance, to use a Hegelian expression. Why is that? Proceeding empirically, we know only man and subhuman beings. We try to understand. We cannot leave it as a mere juxtaposition, man, not a subhuman beings. That we are in need of, for, of an ultimate unity. But, and that is the implication of Marx, we cannot understand man as derivative from the subhuman. That's a common vulgar nat naturalism, as you know. Is it not perhaps possible to proceed in the opposite way, to understand the subhuman in the mind of man? Another remark from this writing. 
the human being of nature exists only for social men. For in society, nature exists for him as, as a bond with man, as the existence of himself for the others and of the others for him. Only in society is nature, exists nature as a basis of his own human existence. Only in society is his natural existence. Has his natural existence become his human existence? And has nature become man for him? Hence, society is a completed essential unity of man with nature. The true resurrection of nature. Why does nature need a resurrection? The, the carried through and completed naturalism of man and the carried through humanism of nature. Let us try to understand that. Through society, nature becomes man. Man is natural and nature is human. And therefore there is one science which deals with nature and man, as Marx says elsewhere there. But granting that for a moment, is are not at least the points of view different? The points of view of a science of man and of a science of nature. I cannot read you all the relevant passages, but at least one, the most striking ones I should read. In German Ideology Part 1, we read this. The famous unity of man with nature. You know, the famous unity of man with nature, of which the poets have spoken, and uh, of which uh, quite a few people have spoken. The famous unity of man with nature has always existed in industry. Not the poet communing with nature at a brook in a forest, but in industry this unity exists. Industry is the actual historical relation of nature to man of not the relation of man to nature, but of nature to man. How remarkable. It's a practical expression, or the external expression of this, that the one all-comprehensive science which deals with the two parts of being, man and non-man, non-man, is economics. Everything subhuman, is essentially material for human life, potentially. And it becomes actually material by industry. As I put it at the beginning of this course, economics is metaphysics, the true science of the whole. We can put it this way, production discovers nature as material for human life, as objects not of contemplation, as a mere theoretical scientist would, but as objects of transformation, as objects of labor. Production dissolves nature into products of man, and there is thus justice to them. You do not understand the hair properly, by looking at it, describing its qualities. You, if you don't see the hair as po a potential food, you do not see the hair sufficiently. And that is done, that means to go beyond the theoretical understanding. And that it means it, um, to have a productive understanding. A productive understanding, now the, an understanding from the point of view of human production, that is. That is the true natural science, the true metaphysics. Because nature becomes human through industry and thus comes into its own. Because nature becomes human through industry and thus the unity of being is achieved. 
the relations of productions are the fundamental fact. In other words, the dogmatism of Marx is, you know, still remains dogmatism, but it is deeper. It is not a mere assertion about the process of history that in given situations, and that, that generally speaking, the relations of productions are the cause or the key to, have to the political, religious, and uh, artistic ideas of the people, but it is ultimately an attempt to account for the unity of the whole on the premise that man is a highest being. Now we discovered two fundamental difficulties if you look at Marx's philosophy. And the first is the dogmatic historical materialism. And the base of that is the fact that Marx conceives of economics as the metaphysics, the true science of the whole. And the second difficulty of which I have spoken before, why should the victory of the proletariat be, be identical with the resurrection of man? Is there a unity between these two propositions, the dogmatic historical materialism, and secondly, the victory of proletariat is the resurrection of man? If the whole becomes human through industry, and therewith man becomes truly human through industry, the victory of the proletariat is man coming into his own. In Marx's thought, man takes the place of the pure mind or the pure spirit of German idealism, as we have seen. That is uh, Marx siding with Feuerbach against Hegel, means exactly this. But there is this difficulty. By virtue of the conquest of nature, the nature of man, or man as a natural being, disintegrates. Only through that disintegration can one get rid of the natural inequality and of the natural distinction between the necessary and the noble things. Now, I have talked very long, but I would like to add my conclusion. Yeah, I think I will be too interrupted. My view of Marx does not mean, of course, that I have not learned very much from Marx, and I hope will still learn much from him. For me, the most important point, in Marx, the positive point in Marx is this is his notion of alienation, meaning his attempt to understand modernity in particular as the period of man's alienation. I think that can be shown that it is so on the basis of an argument to which Marx, to my knowledge, never uses. If you look at modern thought at its highest, in modern times, modern philosophy, one of philosophy begins, according to the textbooks, with Descartes, and Descartes' beginning is a universal doubt. What does universal doubt mean? The whole is alien to man. Alien to man. And man must conquer the whole. He must appropriate it in order to understand it. I mean, you see, incidentally, that there's a link up with the so-called economic things. I mean, Descartes calls men the master and owner of nature. That's says only impossible. Now, this view that the whole is alien to man implies an alienation of man himself, man's self-alienation. Because man can no longer understand, he loses his own status by conceiving himself as a stranger in the whole. Alienation implies that there was a state of thing in which man was at home in the world. Otherwise, alienation wouldn't make sense. He was at home in the world as long as he took the whole as given and not as an object of conquest and uh, of construction. 
uh, this was the original understanding of philosophy, the original understanding of man as man, only a part of philosophy. And the classic expression of that is Greek philosophy. I conclude my remarks with a quotation from Marx about the Greeks. That occurs in the introduction, not published by Marx himself, to his critique of political economy. There he speaks of the classic character of Greek, not philosophy, but of Greek poetry. And what does he say there? Yeah, uh, Marx admits it. They are truly, uh, the Greeks are the classics. Uh, the Greek, from the point of view of art, Greece is always the model. Uh, the difficulty is not to conceive that Greek poetry, a uh, Greek art and epic poetry, is based on certain social conditions. The difficulty is how can they still be enjoyed by us and, in, uh, and remain to some extent the norm and be inimitable, uh, be models which cannot be rivaled, that Marx admits, or come. Answer, there is a childhood or an infancy of the human race. And this infancy, just as in the case of, human, of individuals, it may also be true of the race, of peoples, they are naughty children and uh, pre precocious children. How do you say? A pre precocious children. Yeah? And all other nations of which whom we know, Marx says, they are either ill bred or precocious. Normal children, the Greeks alone, they are normal children. And therefore, that is the reason why their charm remains unaltered because we cannot help thinking as belonging to the mature epoch of mankind, looking back with long and admiration to the infancy of the human race at its highest. That, I think, is simply the question, disregarding altogether Greek philosophy, whether, say, Homer, for me, you know, we means when I speak of or the other uh, poets, whether their understanding of the human situation was infantile or not perhaps more mature than that of the 19th century, and in particular Marx. As this is uh, all I wanted to say. I'm sorry. I have not succeeded in what I hope to do, but in, in giving a perfectly lucid, unified account of the basic difficulty of Marx. I could only bring a number of points which I believe are important, but I have not succeeded in getting a full lucid account, and perhaps we, we, can, we can help one another in arriving at this. Yes? You stress one point in That is so. And you can say the conclusion from what is actual to possibility is surely valid. But that is not quite literally true, as you know, because many absurdities have been said. And I think this, if there is no essential difference, I give this simple example, which I should not hesitate to repeat. Uh, the fourth freedom, freedom from want. And Roosevelt didn't mean freedom from want for lions and rats. He meant freedom from want for human beings everywhere. Clear-cut distinction, essential distinction, which we always presuppose in ordinary life. Uh, you know there have been attempts made on the basis of revolution to account for the fact that in spite of all gradualism of species change, there is a certain, there are also jumps, leaps, essential differences. 
And for Marx, that was not difficult, you see, because uh, he had learned from Hegel the simple thing that gradual changes, quantitative changes, may become qualitative changes. Yeah? Uh, shall I give you a simple example of this deep truth? You have hydrogen. You have oxygen. Yeah? And you have all kinds of combinations with it. But then you make this combination and they cease to be gas. They turn into something qualitative different from gas. And in many other cases. And so the evolution in itself is not incompatible with the admission of essential difference. But the, the preponderant interpretation of evolution is, of course, incompatible with it. Whether the biologist as such is competent to solve this question is, is in itself wrong. Yes? Um, in order to be a humanist, you have to reject the uh, the idea of the Because man cannot be conceived of as a highest being. That's impossible. And if you say, well, man is a highest being for man, that, that means a lion is a highest being for a lion. Right? And that uh, won't help you. And that is, I think, humanism is true. Well, it has, if properly defined in certain contexts, you know, the, fa the famous humanists of the 16th century, and there were some other people in other countries in different times, for example, in Germany around 1800, and their humanism had a very defined meaning, and it didn't mean what you say now, or what you imply now, uh, that can be defined. But strictly speaking, I think it is impossible. Man, no, man, uh, well, uh, uh, to put it very simply as follows. Man, uh, this I think we can today assume, man is not eternal. The human race has come into being. Yeah? And if it, it's co if it can be fully understood in terms of the subhuman, out of which it is said to have come into being, then this subhuman is ultimately the key to everything. That is old-fashioned materialism or with some fashionable change. That's, that is at least to begin with the possibility. And equally, the other one that said some, <coughs> something suprahuman is the key to man. I don't want, man cannot be understood through himself. Man is not self-subsisting. Uh, to say, uh, to uh, deny explicitly what Marx says. And that I think one must face it. Then, uh, if that is so, how is it possible to postulate that man has an essential nature? If he is not self-subsisting. Is he not? I mean, first of all, there are characteristic differences between man and the brutes, as you would admit, yeah? Well, uh, you could say there are, there are differences in degree. No, I'm... Yeah, the question is, all right, that is of course a very common view to say man is uh, the only thing which we can find uh, is that man uses verbal symbols, yeah, as a clear cut difference. Uh, that is often said. But the question is, can the use of so called verbal symbols and their invention? be understood without assuming a radical difference between the human mind and the mind of brutes. I'm not, I'm not sure that, uh, that the answer to that uh, has to be a uh, no. You see, uh, you must not forget one thing. If someone uh, starts from a premise yeah, and wants to defend it by hook and by hook, he can do all kinds of things. But is it simply reasonable to begin with in such a very provisional discussion as we have here? I would say maybe not, because uh, experiments with cats, for example, 
and conditioned reflexes have shown that they react to symbols. Uh, for example, squares differentiated from circles will, will cause them to react in a different way. Now, uh, maybe this is a difference in degree between man's reactions. Yeah, but is that, in other words, that would prove that one uh, can, for example, have the possibility of uh, seeing a difference, yeah, is, is see that somehow, somehow that this uh, a shape oh, differs from another. That is, in Aristotle's language, that uh, they have common sense, in the Aristotelian sense of the word, which is not our sense. Uh, that has nothing to do with the problem of reason. The fact that it is a very massive fact which is frequently mentioned that man cats fundamentally live now as they lived as long as we have any records yeah, of cats whereas men live differently in, uh, in different parts of the world and especially in different times the inventiveness of man is obviously enormously greater to put it mildly, than of any other, of any beast we know. Yeah, this is so. Uh, I mean, I can admit this. Uh, I use cats as an example of, of simple reaction. But uh, of course, you may discuss man in relation to apes, or tilt down man, as they call them, or other men. Tilt down man is bad because that's <laughs> that's that has been shattered. But uh, but other ecological. Uh, uh, Yeah, but that's it. we would simply come to the old question that uh, taking the Hegelian formula, when you have the switch yeah, from quantity to quality, there are borderline cases. Yeah? There are borderline where, where it becomes difficult to distinguish. It's the same uh, that exists everywhere. There are spheres in which it's impossible to say it's a plant and that is a brute. And yet that does not make doubtful the fundamental distinction between plants and fruits. We have only to say there is a certain area in which, in which the distinction is not clear. There are always, in every field, extreme cases which are uh, abnormal, defect, uh, however you call them, uh, and uh, which, the question is whether they can be understood if we do not start from the normal case. Well, the assumptions of borderline is abnormal. Uh, yeah, but you have you, you have, but you have to give an account of the clear difference say, between an oak and a lion, and, and uh, you can also take more homely examples uh, than a an, an lion, and uh, you have to account and try to understand this, this peculiar motility which the plants, generally speaking, lack. And it is the fact that you have no right to assume that plants have sensations of pain and, and, and pressure, which, uh, which surely the, uh, which we observe in the broods, that's of some importance. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying that all matter is uh, undifferentiated. Uh, this, uh, this yeah, the, the, question, yeah, the question concerns then what is the status of the differences? What is the status of the difference? And I believe one, one cannot consistently in any field of uh, human investigation uh, get along without making a difference between differences of degree and differences of kind. Granted, a boy is different than a man qualitatively, uh, but uh, you might say that a, that a man is a part of the process, uh, is, is uh, one end of the process of what starts out as a boy. Uh, now, uh, this, this is a, a restricted formulation of uh, uh, in theory that you might postulate that there is some essential unity between all matter. That coal is essentially fossils, or once was living being, that, uh, that uh, uh, energy is essentially conserved. Uh, you might uh, make that kind of formulation and still establish gross categories of differences without it being. You must not also broadly speaking, the differences of species uh, as a support of the fact that cats generate cats, dogs generate dogs, in other words, it's not a kind of clear classification, external classification. 
now what we see is cats generating other things more similar to themselves. I mean, this is, this is essentially what we can say as a result of evidence. Uh, but uh, supposedly, uh, uh, some geologists postulate that, uh, that uh, seed living animals uh, at one stage uh, generated uh, land living animals. Maybe they're incorrect, but this is the Yes, you see, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but that is, uh, is yourself distinguished between what, for what we have evidence and what is postulated. Now, we must always begin with what we know. And then regarding, and surely we must have, but we might may be compelled to make postulates of some kinds, but then we have to go back to the basis of the postulates. You know, and uh, what is the perspective? What is the cognitive interest in using them to prefer this kind of postulates to other kinds of postulates? Well, One cannot simply accept the whole body of facts plus hypotheses of a science and say this is the authority, this is a starting point for any possible inquiry that we cannot do. I mean, I know that is generally done, but it's frequently done, but I think that is a sign of the fact that science has become what, by definition, it was never meant to become, I mean, authority. Granted that we must assume a skepticism to scientific postulates, but I think we also must assume a skepticism to a postulate which rejects... Yes, sure, sure. Scientific. Yeah, sure, but, but still we must make uh, this crucial. We, 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 I think we, we cannot deny the fact that our, the starting point of all science, I mean, our understanding of the world in daily life, that we can never lose sight of, that this is the beginning and therefore with also ultimately the end for all intellectual orientation. And in the case of Marx, after we are here now first concerned with Marx, we see this. Marx uh, differs from this, uh, from the now um, most common view uh, by uh, uh, admitting an essential difference between men and both. You have, I read you again this passage. Man begins to distinguish himself from the truth by the production, as he puts it. Yeah? This, this is not to me a big essential difference necessarily. It depends what you mean by the term essential difference. It could be that uh, he establishes arbitrary, uh, an arbitrary line. Uh, and when man begins to uh, produce things, or when he begins to have certain consciousness, yeah, but then it takes the other passage in this capital, they uh, uh, confront the building of a beehive and the building of a house, and says so there's a, ra a radical difference between the building which animals do and human building as one uh, specification of that. I think one can... Marx, how doctrine I think is unintelligible if there is no essential difference between men and brutes. I don't see that it is unintelligible. How would you do that? How, uh, what then does it mean that man is the highest being for man? I mean, uh, well, what does it mean? There is an, an, a clear gulf between man and non-man when you say that. That's a very about gulf uh, even between the boy and the man. No. Uh, Exists. No, a boy is a potential adult. I mean, if he, doesn't, if he doesn't die, he will become a man and, and we, we, we treat boys and not as we treat puppies and kittens. I mean, that's perfectly clear. A, a boy is a human being, a, 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 a newborn baby is not a human being as much as a grown up man, but and not yet fully developed. But you can take a, a puppy and you can take a grown-up dog that is in no way a potential human being. I, I may, uh, I may uh, disagree with you on this point. 
Yeah, but uh, can you really say, uh, uh, in any serious sense, the aid is a potential human being? To, I mean, to say no, I mean, the famous difficulty is that the precise possible ancestor of man has never been, uh, you know, there are great difficulties all the time up to the present day. But if, if I refer only to one point. Your whole position presupposes that the jumping from the transformation of quantity into quality is irrelevant. And for Marx it is very relevant. That I think satisfies the issue. And the, the interesting difficulty in Marx is this, that he somehow hesitates but my, uh, the hesitates between these two views, and not on your ground, but rather on the other ground, because he doesn't want to have... Uh, the ultimate idea is this, I think. If you have a fixed human nature, that is a conservative principle to express it. Uh, yeah? For example, if there is a clear... If you have the difference between men and women, and uh, the traditional view is therefore the function of man is different from that of woman, not only as far as procreation is concerned, but also as a woman has to, uh, her place is within the household, and the place of the man is the marketplace, yeah? This kind of thing which Aristotle speaks about. Every fixity of this kind it seems to be establish a principle of the stationary, of the conservative. And Marx wants to have an open horizon for all kinds of progress. That, I think, is a motive why Marx is so uncomfortable with the developed doctrine of the essence of man. It is not this theoretical uh, problem, I think. And one may even, uh, it would be an interesting question to see how far this concern with progress of man is not underlying much of the seemingly purely theoretical difficulties we have in the sciences. It would be also an interesting question. Otherwise, on the, on the uh, question of the relation between the relation between the human and the historical forces and ideas, uh, would you say that uh, it is it could be maintained that uh, the appeal of different ideas at different times uh, can be traced to a considerable extent to uh, the modes of production. And for example, uh, say the appeal of, uh, of a future life uh, times scarcity and the development of technology uh, and the possibility depends on, on special investigation of the situation, you know, that, is that uh, uh, but, but that it, that's a real, it's a, that is not the question. The question is whether the relations of production are the ultimate key to such intellectual fashions, let me say. That's the question. And one, one cannot leave it at very, at very general remarks, or something. According to a very widespread view, the Old Testament is rather free from a belief in the immortality of the soul. Yeah? I know that not everyone admits that, but the prevalent view among modern biblical scholars is that. Is this correct? Good. Well, could you say that the, the, uh, the Jews in the uh, biblical times, so between 1500 and, and 500 BC, were in a particularly happy situation, so they did not have to think of an afterlife. I mean, you know, every turn of the foreign policy situation between uh, Mesopotamia and Egypt uh, brought misery. And so, but they apparently didn't think of that. So that doesn't seem to be as simple as that. I don't believe that, uh, for example, Max Weber wrote an interesting book 
on uh, the sociology of biblical Judaism in the third volume of his uh, Sociology of Religion. And he brought out some very interesting things which I believe no one has ever considered. I mean, uh, what was the social certification of old Israel? Yeah? And quite a few terms which had been translated traditionally without any understanding. Gibo I don't know what the usual English translation of that is. A, a brave hero or something of this kind was a, was a German translation, which I remember. And uh, Weber was able to show that this is a very definite social category. It means something like a squire who can equip himself for cavalry service. Yeah? That, I mean, it has, it's not uh, of any great importance for the understanding of the Bible, but uh, still this particular part of the social order of all this became somewhat clearer, that you can do. But whether that you can understand the, the emergence of prophetism, the peculiar prophetism of Israel out of the social and pro, the relations of production prevailing in Israel, it seems to me a mere assertion without any evidence. Perhaps there are things where the, an explanation is not possible. In the case of the Greeks, people speak sometimes of the Greek miracle. Well, uh, that may be an unscientific expression, but I have never heard a, a scientific explanation in terms of relations of production or geography or what have you, which really explain it why this science and poetry has this particular very high development in this part of the world at this time. Yes. Are you reducing Marx here to an economic terms position? Or is there no distinction between historical materialism and economic materialism? No, yeah, but what, is it, what would you say is the difference? Well, I would think that the difference would be a superstructure for Marx. For sure. And that's yeah, the yeah, but ultimately, that is the point. That is the, the beautiful ambiguity. But what, what does it mean? Uh, that's the super, uh, there is an uh, uh, action and reaction between the superstructure and the infrastructure. With what right do you say that is a basic thing? That's a question. Uh, if you can empirically observe only an influence of the relations of production on the so-called ideas and an influence of the ideas on the infrastructure, and you have to leave it at this. That is what bourgeois social science does. And, uh, but with what is the meaning of the assertion? This is ultimately the key. That would be the question. I think one cannot begin to understand history if one does not assume that man is a being which is simultaneously thing producing and uh, ideas producing. Uh, 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 which is in a given case more important than the other that is, I think, uh, cannot really be decided because it is very different in different individuals. From the point of view of, uh, uh, of the economic interpretation of what Marx basically means, it would, of course, be the society as, uh, as a productive association as a whole. But in the case of ideas, Ideas are not produced by many people, if I may use this awful verse, like ideas and so are not produced by many, they are produced by individuals, by rare individuals much more. And when Marx gives these examples of the simultaneous discoveries, you know, uh, Newton and uh, Leibniz, uh, the calculus, and, and some, and some um, later examples where there were even four or five men who made the discovery at the same time, but that is really a very recent phenomenon. And uh, whether in the olden times there was, uh, as far as the great discoveries or inventions were concerned, that could be traced to a single individual, and that the invention of the idea was made because there was a previous need for it, is a mere assertion. The invention may have created the need. I mean, Marx is simply not empirical enough there. I, I know of no case uh, in which it is useful for the understanding of a doctrine 
to refer to the conditions, to the relations of production as such, as uh, helpful for the understanding of the doctrine. It may be so to a certain extent in certain secondary things in the 19th and 20th century, but in the case of economic doctrines, that goes without saying, because economic doctrines deal with the relations of production and will look at them. But in other cases, I don't, I'm not a, I don't know a single example. I mean, if you take a, a def- a parties representing the interests of large-scale industry or farmers or workers or what have you, so it's these uh, party demands which reflect the interests of the groups behind them, it's trivial. I mean, no one, it's not a, a serious assertion because everyone knows that. If you take, for example, the case of the importance of the fight against the inability and the more educated part of the middle classes, I say middle class, not bourgeoisie, because it would still need a proof that they can be uh, subsumed. I mean, the commoners yeah, who had high public office and uh, or were professors or writers and this kind of thing, uh, that they resented the arrogance of educated nobility. And this uh, plays a certain role, for example, in, in German literature, classic literature, is undeniable. But that is not yet uh, that uh, it would be perfectly compatible with the political interpretation of the whole thing does not yet require interpretation in terms of the relations of production. And uh, to say nothing of, I mean, on the, on the level of the co- most common discussion, you have the two great poets at the same time who have similar views regarding society even, and you may say, well, yeah, according to Marx himself, you cannot trust because his own case, you know, in the case of Engels shows that there are switches from one class to the other, at least as far as the outlook is concerned. But how will you explain the individual differences? How will you explain the, indi- the difference between Aristotle's and Plato's teaching by saying Plato was a descendant from one of the oldest families in Athens, and Aristotle came from northern Greece, who would be of not the slightest help? Uh, or Plato's uh, account of, Zen- of Sugares, uh, Xenophon's account of Sugares, Plato belonged to the nobility, Xenophon to the knights, the class of knights, yeah, uh, in Athens. No help, whatever. Uh, surely then, as a more sophisticated Marxist, we say we are not vulgar Marxists. I mean, we do not uh, believe such a simple correlation. All right, then they should show us in a sophisticated way the connection. And I, haven't se- I have not seen that. Relations of production, as Marx called it, uh, play a role for society as a whole ghost without saying. And the, but that in itself was not a new discovery. I mean, Aristotle's politics is full of that. The question is only whether they are the key. That is an answer. The ultimate key. That's an answer question. But Mr. Cox, you have to talk to him. I see. I see. Good command. Now, is there anyone else who would like to bring up some Mr. Gilden? Yes. the rejection of teleology. There cannot be an, an end. I mean, that is true. One can say that uh, the general characteristic of the modern development is to get rid of teleology, and to get rid of all teleology, to give an account of everything, including human history, in non-economic terms, in, in non-teleological uh, terms. And uh, uh, technicality. Part one is very long in comparison with part two. 
of Capital. And I'm sure that with the introductory matter and the uh, treatment of the content of part one, the discussion will run over into next time. So the approximate distribution of class time as vis-a-vis -vis the content of the book will be about one and a half sessions on part one and about a half a session on part two, but with the understanding that whoever reads the paper on part two has a very difficult job because he has to have digested thoroughly part one, Mr. Brown somewhere, Mr. Brown, and uh, well, then you probably know what the difficulty is. So your, your paper will be, although ostensibly two, it'll have to reflect uh, part one, and that uh, you'll, I'm sure, have grasped that by this point. Uh, Mr. Brown, no. <laughs> First part of capital. Well, that was a, a very good summary of that complicated and extended mass of material in the first part. Well, there were many points that you raised, but I think it's better to try to deal with them more or less in the normal course of things as we go over the ground. But uh, there, there were two questions that I thought maybe you could say something about. There's, for example, that relation that you correctly ascribed to Marx between the quantity of money and the number of transactions and the price level and the velocity of money. Do you happen to know any other formulation of that same relation? I've had to... Yeah. That, well, well it's, no, then the answer must be yes, because that's, that, is, that is the quantity theory of money. Uh, yeah. We're equipped for the negation, but not for the affirmation. <laughs> well, it's gone. Awkward. Yeah, somebody might uh, remember that in ordinary and conventional economics of some years back, and now resurrected by uh, a very impressive school of monetary theory that has its locus upstairs, um, there is a formulation of what's called the quantity theory of money. And the symbols are MV and PT. You probably have seen that somewhere before. M times V equals P times T. You know that? The quantity of money times its velocity is equal to the price level times the number of transactions. asserting could be reduced to this form, I think, without doing any violence to it. The quantity of money times the velocity of its circulation. For example, a thousand dollar bills multiplied by three, the number of times they go from hand to hand on the average. One of them might pass 30 times, and another one might not go at all for six years, but the average then would be three. If there was something called the, the general price level, suppose that the average price of one transaction for five dollars then the other term would fall out in consequence of the total logical character i think this would be right for this three thousand should be this this number of transactions now this what this implies is that there is a, a necessity for a quantity of money to do a certain volume of business do a certain number of transactions on the supposition that the velocity, the inclination of the people to transfer their money from hand to hand is somehow or other a parameter within the situation. I, it's, it's a variable in principle, but in any given situation it has a value. Now, I only say this to refresh your memories of certain things. Now, but Mr. Brown, I'm sure, no, you must have seen this in one way or another at some time. Now, Marx alleged, seems to allege something similar to this. Um, and in fact, what Marx alleges about the need for a certain quantity of circulating medium of money to fill the channels of trade in the community is a restatement of things present in Petty, William Petty, and Locke very massively, and a large number of people long before him. That, that's not his invention. I don't mean to derogate his work. 
But this is the point. Does that seem like the assertion of a, a rule which is true, generally speaking, in virtue of the nature of money and goods and exchange? Marshall, yes. In terms of efforts, well, that's the question. Whether this is an assertion which has some peculiar relevance to capitalist production, or whether uh, it could be imagined to have some broader application. That, that it, it might have some broader application. I think it might. And now, if that raises the following question, the name of this book, as you know, includes, uh, well, it's, it's called Capital, a Critique of Political Economy. Now, if we had vast resources of time and so on, I think it would be worth devoting the first meeting to that title. If we were to take this thing apart in the first place, if you were to ask yourself why he gives the thing the name of capital, the fact is a serious question because uh, he did not give the name frivolously, I'm sure of that. Somehow or other, capital was the central phenomenon and is even shown to be so by the name that he and others uh, commonly give to the system. It's a, it's a system whose principal characteristic somehow or other is derived from this thing called capital. And that will come up very shortly on the basis of things Mr. Brownstone said. Now, it's also called a critique, and it's called a critique of political economy, really meaning by that a critique of capitalist political economy. And Marx, in the, on, in the preface, in one of his prefaces, on page 24 in your edition, near the very top of the page, says, the old economists misunderstood the nature of economic laws when they likened them to the laws of physics and chemistry. Top of the page on the left-hand side. The old economists misunderstood the nature of economic laws when they likened them to the laws of physics and chemistry. Now, Marx's point here, I think, is uh, fairly clear. The laws of economics don't have the same durability for the same universality as the laws of physics and chemistry. <clears throat> and it was a mistake of the earlier economics to represent those laws as if they had that imperishable character. Now, Marx, by his own deeds, therefore, should be evolving a strictly critical economics. That's what this is meant to be. This is a critique of a certain kind of economics, but he obviously cannot confine himself to critical observations at all times, and so his criticism is often couched in the form of a, an opposing assertion. Now, the assertions, in some cases, tend to take on the character of affirmations in which the purely historical characteristic is hard to detect. And now, I mentioned this at the beginning, at the outset, once and for all. Marx, as you know, said many things on the non-economic side, and then he said many things on the economic side. And what he said on the non-economic side <clears throat> has the character of what we sometimes call methodology. Let me use that term for the time being. What he says in the non-economic works includes many observations on science, how it's affected by history and how it uh, has uh, an infrastructure and so on and so forth, of which it is the superstructure. Lots of things about how it comes into being and how it passes away. And you might say he has a sort of meta-science, a sort of science about sciences. And everybody knows that's rather easy to do. I, I think it's, it's, one should say it's easier to do that than to go about constructing the science. Now it happens that economics is the only science, as far as I know, to which Marx turned his hand and attempted to develop a form of it. So in the case of economics, one sees more or less how these, I repeat, methodological propositions can be made concrete or actually transformed into something. And I believe that some part of the difficulty that is intrinsic to the assertion of a pure historicity of the sciences shows up when Marx tries to construct his economics and on several occasions is led to make remarks which don't have any visible time dimension and which don't seem to be affected by these or those historical circumstances. So I repeat, when he himself 
goes to construct a science on the principles which he asserts ought to be applied, it isn't any way clear that he is simply under the influence of some local temporal conditions and that his, his product has this purely historical characteristic. It seems, in other words, as if the temptation to which the orthodox economists succumbed, namely to construct an economics as if economics, economic laws had the same character as the laws of physics and chemistry, somehow or other approved in cases too much for him too. At least this is part of what one has to be very uh, cautious about and something which I point out to you now so that as you read Das Kapital, you'll think about this and raise internally the question all the time whether this or that assertion of it, or very many, is, uh, is of this historical kind or whether it resembles the laws of physics and chemistry more than Marx would like it to do. Uh, incidentally, that remark is not a quotation from Marx, that thing on the top of page 24. That's a quotation from a book review of this volume, which Marx quotes with approval as being a, a, a decent statement of his own point of view. How could a statement on the velocity or quantity of money be taken as a total generalization rather than as a purely historical one when Marx conceives of the money type economy itself as a short run thing historically preceded by commodity? Theory. Well, you see, that's that's a question. Now, he, uh, he, he does not say very much about the details of the prospective society. There is one passage, and we'll come to it, in which he says about in about a page and a little over a page what he thinks it would, it would be like under the other conditions. But now, it isn't clear from that that communities under those circumstances will be able to do without money. No, I'm sorry, I meant uh, history prior, not, uh, not later. In other words, you can't kind of, uh, exchange purely on a barter basis at one time. Now, velocity theory or quantity theory of money couldn't apply to those times because there was no money. Yeah, yeah, sure. Now, that's that's quite clear. If there is such a thing as a prehistory from his point of view, you know, some very remote time, and something is true under those circumstances which is relevant to the social condition of man in concrete now. I mean, it's, uh, one can say very well, surely there was fire in the pre-monetary epoch of, of man. And the same things which were true about exchange then will continue to be true about exchange later on. Uh, I'm sorry, I'm not okay. making myself clear. What I'm trying to say is this, you're suggesting that the uh, velocity theory of money is a, might be met by Marx as a generalization, not really for capitalist economy, but yeah. transhistorically. And I'm suggesting that uh, since it deals with money, and since money has a limited period of life within the history of economics, Therefore, it can't be a total generalization, it must be a historical. I think I do understand it, but then I, apparently I'm not making that clear. So let me try another approach. Uh, suppose I were to say to you, what about the laws of aerodynamics? Now, the laws of aerodynamics presumably always were true. I mean, so far as they're laws, and I'm no judge of that, but I suppose there are some true assertions. Uh, they were before they were aircraft, long before. And if there is going to be a time when there won't be aircraft anymore, then those laws of aerodynamics, I take it, will still be true laws. Now, if we want to raise the question, is a law a law when there is no comprehending mind? I mean, that's a very difficult thing, and I, I, I'm sure you, that's not really what you are driving at, no. So, if this relation between money and so on and so forth is a, a truth, and in fact, the objection of most economists is that it's so much a truth that it's a useless truism, a mere tautology, but never mind, it's still true. But then it was true before there was money and it will be true after there's money and so on and so on. It might be irrelevant, as, as for example, the laws of aerodynamics would be utterly irrelevant among certain savages, that's quite true. Well, it would be a truth that would not be a truth for Marx, for the same reason that, uh, Gal that although Galileo eventually understood aerodynamics, and until he had light metals, he couldn't put it into practice. And in the same way, before you have money, these are not especially important truths, therefore they're yeah. not truths for Marx, because of this insistence that a truth have meaning in society and action. Yeah, sure, I know, that's, that's part of the difficulty, that if one wants to connect 
the truth with some historic lack of and actually this is the point but that I'm only now in a certain way raising again the question which has been raised many times but in a somewhat different form and with an application to this economic material but you're absolutely correct that is the question please I spoke to you this is a very striking and analytic and synthetic yeah. I, the thing I recognize it from that uh, we, we would call it reversing the order of summation you're just adding up all the sets in the one case you sum first over the, uh, over the objects and in another case you sum over the individual business and currency so it's yeah. Uh, the, the, the thing is, uh, is much less of a mathematical truth even than the aerodynamics. And the equation might be a synthetic truth that this holds. But uh, what this theory corresponds to is some simple process of simplifying one of the terms. You could have an equation of the form, the force is equal to the pressure times something else. Now this is a, uh, this is a meaningful assertion to take a point. Well, that would raise certain difficult questions, uh, and I don't want to go into that because then we would have to deal with economics externally from the, to the Marxist system. Some part of the controversy I'll mention only in passing has to do with the character of that that uh, velocity of money. And to what extent that is a, a fixed datum and to what extent it can, it varies. Now, if this has a simple relation with that, reciprocal, in effect, then almost nothing you do to this will have any effect on either of the variables here because every change here will be negated by an equal and opposite change in velocity. See? And then you won't have any way of influencing, for example, the number of transactions, which is to say the level of the national income and the volume of employment. So I don't want to go into all of that. There is an empirical question which is involved, in, and that's beyond our present scope. But taking it apart from all those complications, one fact about it is, as you have asserted, that this and that can't be different in value at any given time. It can't be different in value. This is a tautology in principle. And if it has any value at all for economic analysis, the value that it has is it's, it divides the same quantum according to two different principles. And therefore, it makes visible the fact that the same quantum can be viewed as being composed of the different variables, some of which are more interesting in one economic situation than in another. And therefore, it provides a kind of handle for operation you know that you can easily see if for example the main problem is somehow or other to may have an influence on the price level here then there are things that one can do presumably in there assuming there are not offsetting changes so now but apart from all of that it, it, i only mean to raise the difficulty which i think is inherent here as to whether marx himself is able altogether to avoid the assertion of these things in a general form which doesn't have that historical uh, provisional character but, uh, all right, so now, but then the other question, Mr. Brownstone, was this. Does Marx approve the connection of exchange value and labor, the expenditure of labor, in part one? No, he doesn't. He doesn't draw it out part No. Uh, on what is it based? The, that, that very important relation, in a certain way, that's the important relation between exchange value and the amount of socially necessary labor time expended. Well, you know, that, that was what you said, and correctly. Uh, do, do you know of any way in which he establishes that? How does he establish that? Does anybody know? Please. He goes through a deductive process in which he shows you that things will exchange for the same amounts. And he says, if they exchange equally, there must be something in common between them. And then he just simply asserts that that's something in common that must be later. Yeah, that's absolutely correct. He simply asserts it. It's on the basis of a kind of inference. They do empirically exchange the one against the other. This commodity and that commodity. You can see it. 
Uh, now that's a very curious thing that they exchange because one of them is eggs and the other one is hats. And that's very remarkable because uh, how can one find the principle of commensurability between hats and eggs? There isn't any, as far as anyone can see. And yet they go on exchanging all the time. Now, Marx said, people have thought about this question for a long time. He, he, this is the point at which he introduces Aristotle and the ethics and shows, incidentally, why Aristotle couldn't possibly have known the answer to this question. He couldn't have known the answer because of the conditions under which he lived, the historical, the social conditions that prevented Aristotle from seeing the fact, the underlying fact. So you have this peculiarity, qualitatively different things meet on a level of quantitative homogeneity. So the qualitative heterogeneity is overcome by a quantitative homogeneity. How does he know this? That's, that's merely a, a statement of a description of what one sees going on all the time. That's only a, a pedantic way of saying that people exchange hats for eggs, that's all. Now, but what does, how does it come about? There are, generally speaking, let's say, two kinds of answers. One of them is suggested by that uh, passage from Aristotle, in which the exchange is referred to a, a, a merely empirical occurrence. It happens that the people involved in the exchange on the basis of their relative demands, their wants, uh, agree to do it. Now, that's not the whole story, but that's as much of it as makes any matter for, for Marx. And Marx says, no, that isn't it. That's not it at all. What really connects them is a quantitative link. They exist on the same level of quantity. But what is it about them which is quantitatively comparable. And then he says, it must be the only one thing which they have in common. Namely, they're both the objects of human labor. Now, but that in a way doesn't help a bit, because one of them was the object, well, uh, eggs is not such a good example. Uh, let, 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 let me, uh, let me, it's a very bad example, in fact, but let me some, take now instead of eggs, there are boxes, boxes and hats. Now, uh, people exchange them, let's suppose. And what's there in common between them? Only that. Uh, now, that's not, uh, it's not so obviously true that they have nothing in common except that they're both the objects of human labor. It might be that they both have in common that they're both the objects of human want. That's also a fact. That the boxes are wanted by A, although owned by B, and the hats are wanted by B, although owned by A. Now, I don't know whether that's relevant or irrelevant, but it's a fact. It's also true, as well as that they're both the objects of human labor. Now, he has some reason, in other words, for excluding all the characteristics, and for that matter, you could say, sure, and in addition to this, that they, they consist of matter, matter in motion with void in between the particles and so on and so forth, which he would be the first one to admit or even insist on. They've got lots of things in common. Now, but he isn't on quite such bad ground as this would make it appear, because he asserts this act of exchange, this is what he calls a social act. This happens among human beings, and you have to find out what is humanly relevant, let's say. Now, he's willing to make that kind of distinction, and uh, I'll come back to this in a minute, between what's humanly relevant and what isn't. And so, but I must say that it, it's, it, it isn't by no means a clear and a demonstrative line of reasoning that points up to the labor theory of value in Marx. The, the labor theory of value is in its important character, uh, aspect simply asserted on the, about the second, the third page of the, uh, of the treatise. You know, and after that, it's taken, and it is never proved. I point that out to you. Uh, I don't know whether that, that has a devastating effect on Marx's uh, doctrines or not, but it is a fact that I, I know of no proof of this except by exclusion. That when Marx sits down to try to think of what kinds of things the qualitatively homo uh, heterogeneous commodities have in common, what, what they have in common, which would make commensurability possible, he in effect says, I can't think of anything else except the incorporation of human labor, and not only human labor, which would only lead to the same problem, because human labor, as Marx insists a thousand times, 
is the labor of box makers, the labor of hat makers, and so on and so forth, i.e. qualitatively different. Not only, therefore, is it human labor, but it must be that there is some basis upon which all human labor can come to be compared and made commensurable. Now, so then, the problem of the hats and the boxes is only reflected on a more interesting level in the problem of the hat maker and the box maker. See, from the, from the hat maker proceed hats. From the box maker, boxes. What's true of the hats and boxes is simply a repetition of what's true about the hat makers and box makers. So if you have incommensurability among the commodities, you must have incommensurability among the makers of the commodities. This is what he calls the qualitative differences. If you think that I'm, I'm going to point out not lead up to some big problem that he failed to see, you're wrong. This, I'm, I'm only telling you now what he said, but in somewhat different words. Please. Uh, to a certain extent, uh, of course, this is not a final answer, but he can and does fall back on the fact that in the tradition of economics as a science, this theorem of the labor theory of value had been developed prior to him through Smith and McCarthy. So that, in a sense, uh, proven it is almost unnecessary. I mean, it's been done. It's been proven. Yeah, that's only true in a, in a certain sense, though, Mr. Benjamin, because Marx is in the position of asserting that nobody else has really understood economics before him. And uh, yeah, he was as much a self-conscious destroyer and, and regenerator, I suppose, as Hobbes on, on the other side and in the bigger dimension. No, and, of course, and not only Smith and Locke, but Petty, who is in a way even more important. Petty has a certain observation about labor being the, the father and uh, earth the mother. Form and the matter, in other words, uh, of the process of production, which uh, certainly must have made Petty appeal to Marx, and he does. But fundamentally, none of them ever understood the process of production properly. Nobody before Marx grasped, that's right, nobody before Marx grasped the labor theory of value. And I will tell you that there is something to this claim, too. That's no idle uh, nonsense on his part. That the radicalization of the labor theory of value was never achieved until Marx, as far as I know. And you won't understand the full bearing of this until you come to part three, which is a terrific piece of work. And you'll have great respect for the man who conceived it when you see how he handles the question of surplus value, the mass and rate of surplus value, on the basis of his findings. It's a very impressive achievement. But still, let's answer the question. How about that, that uh, level on which the qualitatively different kinds of labor can meet? See, if you can't find that, then, uh, then everything collapses after this. Well, he refers to total labor or uh, the totality of social labor and says that the given labor in any two objects may not be commensurable, but you can measure it in terms of the total uh, labor of the society at a given time. Now, that has to do more with the transformation problem, Mr. Benjamin, the, the problem of the transformation of, of uh, values into prices, where he says there's not an exact coincidence between the, the, the value of this and the price of it. But if you take, take them all together, sum the values and sum the prices, then, and this has something to do with that, his theory of money is the link between the, the sum of the values and the sum of the prices. Then it works out to be perfectly all right, but that is not the answer to this question. Please.
Marx would say, you know, it's not a question of, of how badly the shoemaker wanted the appendectomy, that if he felt very much concerned and terribly upset, he'd give him a hundred pairs of shoes. You know, but so then the question must be, what, uh, what principle exists? In other words, the shoemaker has to give shoes to the precision, the precision has to be very clear that how much. That's the point. And in Marx, there's no reason to establish that too much. But he does. That's not. The whole labor theory of value leads up to that, exactly the solution of that question. That this man gives so much of his, but so much of the other. And this is not arbitrary. It's not, as Aristotle said, simply dependent on how they feel about things and practice and law, in other words, demand and, and prescription and things like this. But that can be reduced to a, a perfectly intelligible quantitative relation, which overcomes the qualitative difference. Yeah. Mr. Benjamin, please. The number of hours of uh, work that each do, and the, he does not uh, give any kind of discount for talent. It's the number of socially useful hours that they operate. For talent? I mean, in other words, he does not. You would think that a doctor's hour would be worth more than a shoemaker's hour, but he just says that it, his, his basis is hour for hour. No, no. No, who, Marx? Yeah. No, no. Marx says, no, oh no, that's, uh, he says, if, if one man's labor somehow or other could be known to be twice, twice as complicated and intense and so on and so forth, then you have to take that into account. Oh yes, he, he did that, but, uh, but still, that doesn't answer the question. Why is it that, that one hour of one man's labor can somehow, even though he's a hat maker, can be uh, translated into one hour of a shoemaker's labor. Let's let's make believe. What is it that's common to them both? You have to think about it. He speaks of it from time to time, but not in, not open. It's the time they give. It's the time they give. Yeah, but it, but time is not the time is not of the essence here. No. No. This concept of average labor, uh, labor time, which he uh, becomes somewhat of a relevant concept from day to day or from year to year, but it's a, uh, this concept of average, which he thinks is somehow absolute. But uh, I can marry the question here. Yeah, the averaging helps out in the computations, but it doesn't solve the fundamental problem. Well, look, let me ask you a question, Mr. Brown. What do you mind? Makes it worse because they all require the same subsistence. No, uh, because he talks about uh, the skills uh, and education uh, that is required for skilled labor uh, goes into uh, subsistence. You mean, so in other words, if a man has to spend four years in graduate school, that you have to add on the four years subsistence spread out over a long period of time later on? In some way, yes. I, I don't I do it, but. No, it doesn't exactly, but but look, suppose that you have a, a shoemaker sitting in front of, of a pile of leather and a hat maker sitting in front of a pile of felt, and suppose each of them spend two hours sitting there each in front of this matter. Something has to happen before, before these piles of material become transformed. As he says, the reason I spend so much time on this is that if you won't be able to understand a certain very difficult part in the third part, unless this lesson comes home early. Now, something has to happen to that matter that's sitting in piles in front of these two men. Machines. Mm, well, let's make, let's make believe the machine. Let's leave the machine thing out of it for the time being, because that's only a more advanced form of the same process. With machines and without machines, it's in a fundamental respect, it's the same, because the machines are congealed labor from before, and it's only a devious way of doing this thing. But to the labor and materials that Yeah, somehow that's a good figurative way to begin. Uh, Locke would say maybe you have to, he has to mix his labor with it. But what does that mean more exactly? You have something there which is inert and motionless, the matter in front. And what has to happen to it? 
Will it change if there isn't motion applied to it and energy, something of this kind? That was how it's Well, no. I, I don't know enough about this to carry on, but isn't it socially embodied like It will become that when the things become transformed into commodities, yes. But could you not say, as Marx himself does, that the whole productive process could be understood as the, the bringing together of nature and man. That's what he says. He says it much more emphatically, much more clearly in the contribution to the critique of political economy, and I'll come back to that in a little while. But you have the nature the, in, the substantially inert for the time being, and man, which is the, the source of energy. And Mr. Brownstone used that term. He used it, 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 it went over very quickly, and so you might well have missed it, but that was in, in a way a, a key to the, to the whole discussion. If the laborer, the human being, is a source of motion. The human being is a source of motion and of force, which is applied to an inert matter. And it's on that basis, ultimately, and I believe only on that basis, that these qualitative differences can be resolved. You could, you could in fact, look on these men as if they were automatons. If you had sufficiently intelligent, you know, sufficiently intelligent machine makers, that would eventuate in, uh, in machines of a sufficient degree of, I call it for the time being, intelligence. They could replace human beings. As a matter of fact, to a certain extent, they have. What does a machine supply to the inert matter? Emotion. Uh, this is Marx himself, he even says this from time to time. Now, I am at such length on this question because it appears to me as if the overcoming of the qualitative differences in the concept of the homogeneous, socially necessary labor time is only one step away from the reduction of the labor process to strictly mechanical operation by which nature is moved by some other natural forces. And then if you begin to think of the wage question, you'll notice the subsistence operation is a kind of restoking, a fueling up of a source of energy. And what is it about the, the wage level under some kind of the wage level and also the relation between the surplus time and the necessary time? Those of you who have read the head will know what this means. That there were those terrific abuses of the working people, young and old, in, the, in England in the 19th century, those absolutely unbearable conditions, <clears throat> those were, to some extent, merely a, a source of indignation, and to another extent, a spectacle of a, a physical abomination, <clears throat> because there was an attempt to get more output, more energy output than energy input. And he speaks about this that they were in a way like run-down machines, these men and children. And if you try to get a man who would ordinarily live 50 years to work instead of 12 hours a day, 16 hours a day, he'll be exhausted in 37 years. It's very simple, because there's a certain elasticity, a certain energy and mobility, which is contained in the organism as a source of motion. And you can, you can extract that as an effluent either at a slow rate, somewhat more rapid rate, or a very rapid rate. That has something to do with the length of the working day, that famous question. All right, Mr. Dennis? Well, uh, this seems a rather strange view, because how, how can Marx ever account for things like service, if you know, that in, in, uh, in our computations of national income and most national products, we count goods as, as well as service. It seems to me that in the case of the physician or the educator or uh, any of this rather large sector of our economy, which is comprised solely by services, uh, this sort of relationship simply doesn't hold it when we play. Well, I think, Mr. Dennis, that's not quite fair to Marx. I don't think he would have any trouble handling the situation of a certified public accountant, for instance. Now, the accountant doesn't uh, produce a product in the ordinary sense. He might only audit a friend's books, something like this. Uh, <clears throat> if it takes him 15 hours to do it, and Marx sees that this is not an unusually inefficient man or something, but he does everything in the proper way, 
Then he would say, well, he has produced a product of 15, worth 15 hours. You know, and if you compare it with 15 hours worth of surgeon's work, it's about equal or something like that. If you mean that the product must be tangible, he didn't fall into that error. Well, but you spoke of it as a kind of uh, source of energy acting upon inert matter. In most cases, that's true. Yeah, well, but the, the, well, even as a source of energy, is this physician uh, acting on his patient or is an educator acting on his pupil? Yeah. Uh, is this really something you can, you can translate into terms of energy uh, or to motion? One of, these, one of these two? Yeah, I would be the last one to try to convert the operation of a, of a teacher on his students into uh, something like that. I don't know that it can be done in important cases, and really what I suspect is in the most important cases, I believe it can't be done. But on the other hand, if it is not somehow or other at the bottom of what Marx is asserting, then I fail to understand the ground on which these qualitatively different activities are made to meet. No, I, this is all that I mean to assert. I believe that the, the real ground of Marx's resolution of the qualitative differences in the the concept of homogeneous human labor. I think that that resolution comes down to a further reduction of the homogeneous human labor to some lower level, which is to say an output of energy. And that the process of production and consumption with distribution and exchange in between, that can be viewed as a kind of conservation of energy. And Marx's problem, why he calls this thing capital, this book capital, and why he calls the system capitalism, and why the explanation of capital is so extremely important, I think all this has to do with a uh, difficulty that he saw, trying to understand how something which starts out of a certain size at the end of a particular economic process has a larger size. It's more at the end than it was to begin with. transformed into a certain amount of commodities that's purchased and then the commodities being transformed into money again that's sale and he says what a remarkable thing if you compare this and that they're unequal in value this is a crime and crime the only way that this could happen would be if there was somehow or other an apparent denial of a law of, of a law of the law of conservation of mass, something gets to be bigger than it was to start with, and you can't, you can't find the accretion. He says there is an equality at each point. The amount of money given for the commodities, that's exactly on the basis of the labor theory of value, let's suppose. No cheating, no advantages, nothing. Then this commodity gets transformed into a certain amount of money. It's more. And yet there's still that same equality. And he tries to understand that. Oh, you know what it is, the difference between the two. That difference is surplus value, or what, what in the more conventional language is called profit. That's what you're trying to understand. Now, the, the problem of capitalism is that accretion, how it happens with nobody being cheated from one point of view. Now, I know what you're thinking, that of course somebody's cheated. And uh, he makes it quite clear that uh, the laboring man is being exploited. I mean, that that's the way that the cheating takes place. But that has to be explained. It looks as if it's impossible. Some mass has grown into a larger mass. That's only explainable, according to Marx, on the basis of the labor theory of value and some peculiarity of one kind of commodity, but only one kind of commodity, which can be put into that position and for which this accretion will take place. That commodity is labor power, as will emerge shortly. But uh, the general principle, the conservation of mass, that's built in energy, that's built in, so to speak, to the labor theory of value. Now, why all this? 
there is an objection made to the formulation of economic laws as if they were similar to the laws of physics and chemistry. <clears throat> it's remarkable that that should have been said and that Marx should have approved the observation of his book reviewer. It's, it's probably the only, uh, the only book I know in which favorable reviews are quoted in the preface. Even some unfavorable reviews come to think of it. But why? I mean, why was he so fond of that a remark that was made about his book? Because for one thing, his doctrine with respect to the historicity of all views of economics requires it, so that they, the laws of economics cannot have this character of being immortal, like the law of the conservation of energy. But yet at the same time, I believe that he would not have been able to overcome the problem of qualitative heterogeneity without resorting to something which doesn't seem to have a dimension in time. You see? That's really what makes it possible, I believe. As well as I can understand it, I believe that this is what Marx's, uh, what Marx's formulation depends on. He doesn't prove any of this and doesn't assert it in these words, except sometimes uh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> in uh, 
social development, or production by social individuals. Hence it might seem that in order to speak of production at all, we must either trace the historical process of development through its various phases, or declare at the outset that we are dealing with a certain historical period, as for example with modern capitalistic production, which as a matter of fact constitutes the subject proper of this work. But all stages of production have certain landmarks in common common purposes. Production in general is an abstraction, but it is a rational abstraction insofar as it singles out and fixes the common features, thereby saving us repetition. Yet these general or common features discovered by comparison constitute something very complex, whose constituent elements have different destinations. Some of these elements belong to all epochs, others are common to a few. Some of them are common to the most modern as well as to the most ancient epochs. No production is conceivable without them, but while even the most completely developed languages have laws and conditions in common with the least developed ones, what is characteristic of their development are the points of departure from the general and common. The conditions which generally govern production must be differentiated in order that the essential points of difference be not lost sight of in view of the general uniformity which is due to the fact that the subject, mankind, and the object, nature, remain the same. The failure to remember this one fact is the source of all the wisdom of modern economists who are trying to, to prove the eternal nature and harmony of existing social conditions. Thus they say, for example, that no production is possible without some instrument of production. Let that instrument be only the hand that none is possible without past accumulated labor, even if that labor consists of mere skill which has been accumulated and concentrated in the hand of the savage by repeated exercise. Capital is, among other things, also an instrument of production, also past impersonal labor. Hence, capital is a universal, eternal, natural phenomenon, which is true if we disregard the specific properties which turn, up, which turn an instrument of production and stored up labor into capital. If there is no production in general, there is also no general production. Production is always some special branch of production, or an aggregate, as for example, agriculture, stock raising, manufactures, and so on. But political economy is not technology. The connection between the general destinations of production at a given stage of social development and the particular forms of production is to be developed elsewhere. And finally, production is not only of a special kind, it is always a certain body politic, a social personality that is engaged on a larger or smaller aggregate of branches of production. The connection between the real process and its scientific presentation 
also falls outside of the scope of this treatise. We must distinguish between production in general, special branches of production, and production as a whole. Now, there are uh, lots of things in that passage. I raised the question that I did, not because I thought Marx was unconscious of the difficulty. On the contrary, it seems to have been very much present to his mind. That in a certain way, he was saying things which are affirmations about an unchanging subject and an unchanging object. That's man and nature. And it's, it might surprise you that Marx went so far as to say this. But, I mean, for thinking of certain things that he asserted, that might appear to be uh, a bit off the main line of his general speculations. But he says that. There are the permanent things, man and nature, and then there is the fluctuating or historically ascending and descending, maybe, condition of combination of those two. He somehow or other has to find his way between them, between the permanent and the obviously transitory, in order to give an account of the whole. The way in which he tries to do that is, I think, only made concrete in his economic treatise. That's why I, what I meant when I, when I said before that in his other works he spoke about the sciences, but in the economic he had to try to do it, and then it becomes, you know, it becomes very difficult. And it doesn't appear to me that the, the enterprise has been made altogether successful, but I'm not sure whether everybody agrees. I think Dr. Strauss is not quite no, convinced. I mean, I, I've made a great distinction of embryonic stages. 
practice and more fully developed. And if you take merely the most, you get something sub embryonic, which is very unreal. So we let, let the best thing to do is to look at the fully developed. There you get only a clear vision of how these universal concepts really fit together and what their root of relations is. Now, regarding this point, Mark says with the same uh, treatise, that the bourgeois economy is a key to all early economies, i.e., the only economy empirically known to us which we can study. And which has the advantage of being the most developed of the people is a good way. Therefore, we start. But we do it with an understanding of at least the possibility that there might be the still superior form of economy. And I think that belongs to the whole thing. If the world might not be developed only because it is actually up to now. But it is also very theoretical. The most reward, uh, if you have slaves or serfs, uh, the value is not as clear as if you have free labor. Takes this as the most important as well. And uh, therefore, that is. But with the following understanding, which uh, is of course absent from the classical terms, this may be changed. That may not be the end. Marx is sure it is not the but we as sober students uh, transform this certainty into a reasonable doubt. And then it is a reasonable decision. Yeah, well, I would go further and say I, I'm, I'm as sure as he could possibly be that it's not the end. Uh, on the, on the, the pious principle that all things that came into being have to pass away. Yeah. Sure. But the question... Which Marx did not sufficiently consider. I think, yeah, <laughs> at least at, not at the other end. Uh, and no, I wouldn't doubt that, but my, my point, of, and let me only try to say it very simply. There will always have to be something which in the present time is called, say, capital formation. Now, he would say, of course, it's not called capital formation if capital has ceased to be. But the, the process of production, it, it, taking man side by side with nature, man applies this motile force, transforms it. Now, if he eats up everything that he makes in the course of the year, the community does, that has a certain effect on the prospects for next year, which are irrespective of capitalism, communism, or the hot and hot. Now, where does that, what the conventional economists call surplus, come from? It comes from the fact, or it has as its necessary condition, that it does not take a full day's labor to keep a man alive for a whole day. Now, that's irrespective of all social forms. What is dependent on historical circumstances is, in some cases, a man might have to work for a day in order to stay alive for only 22 hours, in which case there will have to be some subsiding of the population. Uh, but in, in other cases, a man could stay alive for two weeks on the output of one day's work. So that's social, all right. But the, the prospects for accumulation depend on this differential. That's not social. That's, that's as physical as any like law of mechanics. So in a communist society, there will still have to be accumulation. The accumulation will be possible or impossible, rapid or slow, depending on some privations. People are going to have to give up some part of their daily output for the sake of this other end. What will be the mode of determining the relation between how much they're allowed to consume and how much they must give over to the other function? I don't know of any answer to that question which is strictly authoritative. Well, Marx didn't say surely, but what, what Lenin would say, I, I don't know, it's a difficult thing. It might be in the same class with the lynching problem, that is to say, by public opinion. That is my question. 
Yeah. Then you get the presented as being quite easily foreseeable. And what's not foreseeable is a sort of detail, whereas as a matter of fact, what's not foreseeable is really the most important thing. And what's foreseeable, yeah. But, so it's only from this point of view that I would say certain things don't appear to depend, and by Marx's own reasoning, don't seem to depend on simply passing occurrences on historical things. And I, I let me say, I leave it with you as a question, uh, how far. Because if you try, I go back to the first point. If you try to understand on what basis the overcoming of the qualitative differences by quantitative comparison of homogeneous things, on what basis that rests, I don't know of any foundation other than this, let me put it that way. And now you might say, but this is only a critique of capitalist economy, and therefore it, is, it isn't meant to apply to all uh, situations. I would say, that's both true and not true. It certainly is true without qualification, so far as what he means is we're trying to account for the process of exchange. Things exchanged by capitalists, private owners of the means of production. And then you have to make use of this thing because uh, it happens all the time. You have to give an account of it. But what would take the place of this in the post-capitalist society? Well, it would not be exchange, presumably. There wouldn't be exchange. There would be from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. So I take it that means that everybody would work as hard as he was disposed to work under the influence of a good conscience, and that the output would go into a common storehouse, and that everybody who wanted to could come day or night and cart away refrigerators and, and uh, sailboats and everything. Honestly. And now, but people wouldn't do it. I mean, they wouldn't just come away and, and be swine about it and, and move out with a truckload of refrigerators because they could do it, and no, which would also be useless, except if by that act they could develop a black market. <laughs> but I, let me, I don't want to descend into, uh, into petty uh, details. Under those conditions, it's true, no exchange, no exchange of the visible kind, there would be simply be taking. And he says, and Marx says, they can't be always taking if there isn't some production. And he takes care of that. There will be plenty of production. Everybody will produce exactly the way they take, out of a, out of a good heart. Yeah, well, sure, but now that doesn't rest on any social physics. That doesn't rest on anything. The other thing, the other thing rests on social physics. That you can understand as you can compare it to the thermodynamics and aerodynamics and all other things. They were long before us and they will continue long after us, so they always were true and will be true. Uh, that's never been true, and I don't know whether it will be true, but there's a kind of presumption against something which has never been true, or been found to be true, you see. So that's what I mean by saying that what's peculiar to this other thing, that transhistorical, that's altogether high in the sky. But what the analysis of visible things rests on, and an incredibly deep analysis, that that, uh, that has to be depreciated as being only historical. <clears throat> See, by his own terms, it's very odd. Well, now... Yeah, and in, incidentally, in line with this, this same notion, uh, let me point this thing out to you. The introduction to the critique of, to the, the introduction to the contribution to the critique of political economy, that's what I, from what I read you, that was 1857. If you look in the Oxford, anyone, I guess the OED or uh, Oxford, any one of the Oxford dictionaries, you'll find this definition of, of work under physics and mechanics. The operation of a force in producing movement or other physical change, especially as a definitely measurable quantity, 1855. 
that's the date that they have uh, attached to this definition. I don't think I'll say where they got it or what, but I, said, I take it that's from some book about physics or something which appeared in the middle of the 19th century, 1855. Now, I don't mean to draw any, any powerful conclusions from this, but I think it wouldn't be going too far to say that Marx was, after all, not altogether free of the influence of positivism and of some attempt to account for the human things by a reduction of the human things to the non-human things. And, and how this was achieved by a blend with historicism and with this terrific inheritance from Rousseau, that is a very large question. But I suppose by my speculations to this point could in a way be summarized as follows. I believe that his support for the labor theory of value itself rests rather heavily on a kind of scientism. Scientism is crudely understood, maybe even positivism, and that this was very much at home in Marx's doctrine because of his avowed materialism. You could put it even that way, maybe that the, the, the true basis for the labor theory of value is Marx's very radical materialism. And maybe that would be even better, that, the, that Marx made economics really articulate with uh, uh, radical materialism, and that that is the foundation for the labor theory of value. Now, yeah, there are very many points in this first part, and. I'll try to come back. Now, we still have a half of the next meeting to give over to part one. And then the second half will deal with the rather short uh, part two. But before uh, closing altogether, I'll tell you one of the points that we ought to have in our mind for the next discussion. And that is, again, a recurrence to the title of this thing. I have to tell you just a very little bit about the the coming to be of the book as a book. book. Book one, he published in his lifetime, 1867. He promised three others, if I remember correctly. Book two, which was to be the process of capitalist circulation, and book three, the, capital, uh, the capitalist process of production as a whole. This one, volume one, is book one, is the process of capitalist production. What we have spoken about so far is the, the capitalist part of this title, the capitalist production, and whether Marx succeeded in generating a critique of capitalist production without somehow or other being compelled to rely on things which transcended capitalism and the capitalistic period. But the second point is why capitalistic production? Why did he begin with production? And that question has been raised. Dr. Strauss spoke at some uh, length, and, and you know already why the, the production theme is so important on the other side, on the non-economic side. We'll have to pay a bit of attention to the place of production uh, on this economic side. And there are some passages which I'll read to you from the critique, contribution to the critique in which he makes that clear. Then let me explain one additional thing. Why do we have to have so much recourse to the contribution to the critique of political economy? This book contains several false starts on Das Kapital, in effect. He began it, and then he, he stopped. Now, this is a respectable-sized book. Quite a few people would be content to have written a book of this size. This was only a bad start for him, and he, he didn't throw it away. But what he did was to realize that he didn't begin in the right mode. If you look at the introduction to the contribution, it's printed here at the end, the last 30 or 40 pages. That, I believe, was probably his very first beginning. I'm not sure. I'm, I, I'm surely no scholar of these manuscripts but, or texts, but I believe that was probably his first beginning, 57. 59, the body of this thing, what's called the contribution to the critique. Then 1867, finally, book one as we have it. If you look at the first introduction, he deals very explicitly with these abstract themes, which from our point of view is best. He talks about nature and history in, in compact form. And, and we can grasp what he's talking about, and uh, the concepts are 
uh, clear. That evidently was not what he was out to do, and he realized it would have been a bad, uh, a bad show that way. I mention this for the following reason. Book one, as we have it, is, is prolix to the point of being, uh, well, it, it could drive you to despair, because there, there are places for pages and pages and pages, a repetition of what looks like a very little point. And indeed, it is a very little point. It could have been said very much more briefly. If he had continued in the style of the first introduction, he would have had a short book. But that was not, I believe, his purpose, and he was well advised not to proceed in that way. He then would have been in the position of having addressed a bunch of scholars and not having addressed the bulk of mankind. And I believe he meant in this book, as we have it, to be absolutely crystal clear beyond the power of any a third-rate human being to misunderstand him. There's a question as to whether he achieved quite that, but uh, because there's still there are places in this book which are very tough, as you know. But that, uh, I believe, is part of the reason for the, the book having its general character. I believe it was addressed to the mass of mankind, as well as he was able to do that, that its, its virtues and its vices are connected with that fact. And that if you want to have a more abstract, condensed statement of the theoretical skeleton, that uh, you might look to some of his discarded draft beginnings. It's too bad that he didn't finish them and, uh, and put them aside. He was a man of, of infinite patience and industry, a man who taught himself the whole body of economics down to his time, who was a thoroughly accomplished economist and a man capable of extraordinary ingenuity, inventiveness. He invented this, this system to a large extent. That the elements existed before him is totally uninteresting because they never meant that to anybody else but him. And he did this thing with great consistency and very impressive structure. Uh, and that he describes uh, at, at great length. That it, that it was also a calamity is a, that's uh, an untrue in many ways that's beside the point for the time being. All right, so then we'll continue with the book one next time. Next last time, uh, Dr. Strauss has a few observations that he'd like to make, and so we'll begin with that and then proceed to the other order of business. Well, uh, the points which I want to make have become necessary, I believe, after Mr. Copsey's very incisive and clear statement last time, uh, so that we do not lose track of the philosophic problem. I said one should begin from the fact that Marx's doctrine or position presents itself as trans-philosophic, a turn from philosophy to empirical study. Now, this point has become much clearer last time because the empirical study proved to be much more precise social physics, as I, because it, what Mr. Cox said about really to this. Marx discovered, as it were, that the social physics thought, for example, by Kant and by many others, is ready at hand if you understand economics properly. Now, in passing, is this view of Marx that economics is a true, exact science of society is in a way confirmed by present-day practice in so-called bourgeois society. Economics appears to be the most scientific of the social science. And I thought for one moment we should consider why this is so, as what we can learn from Marx, at least what I learned from Marx, why this is so, why economics has this great advantage. Now, two reasons appear to me. In economics, I mean, the general situation in the social science, I believe, can be stated as follows. You strive for acceptance, but acceptance doesn't guarantee relevance. And uh, the criterion of relevance has nothing to do with acceptance and vice versa. But in economics, it seems that the most relevant is at the same time the most exact, and therefore it works. Now, what is the most relevant, according to Marx, the homogeneous, homogeneous labor, 
homogeneous labor. That you have to find again and in all forms of labor as well in all forms of commodities. Yeah? And so the most basic, the most substantively relevant is the very root of all possible acceptance. I read to you one passage at the beginning of today's reading by Simon. If we abstract from the material substance of the circulation of commodities, that is from the exchange of the various use values, and consider only the economic forms produced by this process of circulation, we find this final result to be money. This final product of the circulation of commodities is the first form in which capital appears. We abstract from the matter, the material substance, and limit ourselves to the form. Uh, that is not materialistic language, that's a language of mathematics traditionally understood. Yeah? In this sense, only is a maximum position, yeah, just as a modern scientific position, uh, mater uh, materialistic. The second point is this, money. Money is a conventional thing, but there is an essential difference between money and all other conventional things, as follows. Let me take this example. We cannot think without using language. Thinking is a natural process. Language is essentially conventional. Money is also conventional and has to do with the crazy natural process of exchange. But there is this difference. There exists no universal language. People have tried to make it. I said it was an effort which hitherto has always failed of individuals. But in the case of exchange, or of money, you do have something, a universal means, which emerges without any inventor uh, discovering it, namely gold and silver, as Marx said. Now that, of course, is also, as becomes clear, even on the basis of general knowledge to general knowledge of Marx, that it is not strict, the gold and silver are not strictly speaking the means of exchange universally, but they are quasi-universal. In other words, here in the field of money, in the field of exchange, the convention has a quasi-natural character, which it does not have in other ways, that I think are important points. But let me come back to what Marx intended. Because the, uh, the social physics of capitalist society. But that means also that only capitalist society, or at any rate pre-communist society, can be understood as social physics. That was the point where there was a slight disagreement in formulation, I believe, between you and me. Now, here's a crucial point, is that that became very clear last time in the discussion between Mr. Popsi and me, that, that the fact that the communist society can no longer be understood in terms of a social physics is based on the premise of Marx that the communist society is based on a moral regeneration of man. I use non-Marxian terms. Because if that were not, you would always need these lousy incentives which you need in capitalist society. There are two formulations of Engels which are helpful, which I have here in his writing on scientific and utopian socialism, where he says, these laws of exchange and so on are unknown to the producers and must be discovered only through long experience gradually. These laws are effective without the producers and against the producers as blind working natural laws of their form of production. The product rules the producers. Therefore, there are natural laws. There is a social physics. Now, what, what, but what will be the situation in the communist society is the laws of their own social doing, which hitherto looked like foreign natural laws dominating men are in communist society applied by men with full knowledge of the matter and therewith these laws are controlled by men. Here you see the ambiguity. The laws are still effective. 
as an annual use. Whereas in, in our conscious use, whereas in capitalist society, they are effective and not used, not controlled. Here you have both the case for your interpretation and against you. In one sense, the laws go on, but only man uses them now consciously, and therefore he is no longer simply subject. The other view, however, is they are no longer effective, there, these laws. We must leave it at that. Now, the crucial point, however, for any limitation of the social physics is the assumption of a moral regeneration. The moral regeneration consists in the communist society. All men live spontaneously, according to the maxim, from each according to his capacity and to each according to his needs. No other incentives are required. Which means, of course, that in each knows somehow what the capacities of each and the needs of each are. But how do they know the truth of that maxim? From each according to its capacities and to each according to its needs. Everyone desires not merely just to live, but to express himself, to develop all his faculties. And reason tells him that he cannot develop his faculties fully if everyone else does not do the same. In other words, it is not all, what I have naturally is a desire to develop my faculties. But what I do not have naturally is that I think of the other fellow that he also develops it. How can Marx make this transition from what I desire and from, from, to what reason tells me? Uh, to see the fantasy of Marx's maxim, you know, one has to consider the fact that it is a, a modification of an earlier maxim. That means this that no one's freedom can be secure unless everyone is free. A constant resource thesis. But that thesis implied realistically that it is perfectly possible for some men to be free while the others are not free. <coughs> Only the freedom is not secure. <coughs> there is no security, but it is not a matter. And uh, after all, it is not difficult to show empirically that men can develop their faculties in an amazing way, whereas not all members of their society were able to do so. Think of uh, Plato, Shakespeare, and other interesting examples. Now, the expression of this utopianism of Marx, the superfluity of selfish incentives, is the distinction between the realm of freedom and the realm of necessity. Now, the mere mortality of the human race, which was emphasized especially by Engels all the time, shows the untruth of this premise. If the human race cannot guarantee its eternity, the realm of necessity is coeval with men. Now, how does this untrue premise, the possibility of a realm of freedom, affect the social physics? That's the last point I want to make. Marx sees the economic world as a whole in, in the capital because he stands outside of it. He is not a capitalist nor a believer in capitalism. Marx sees the economic world as a derivative world. The primary fact is not the world, the world is not the world of commodities. That's to say the genesis of the capitalistic world becomes for Marx the guiding problem. Now there are two ways, there are two ways of standing outside of the capitalistic world. The first is a pre-capitalistic, and the second is we may say the post-capitalistic. The first is represented by Aristotle most clearly, the second by Marx. And Marx was fully aware of it in a crucial passage of the first part. Uh, page 66 following, he speaks of Aristotle's analysis uh, of fundamental economic facts. Now, what's the difference between Aristotle and Marx? For Aristotle, the starting point is a natural society, a society in which the exchange of commodities is not in the center of life. Yeah, it's not in the center of life. Uh, for Marx, the uh, starting point is not the natural society in the Aristotelian sense, but the anticipated communist 
society. So, you know, the base of Aristotle is truly empirical. The other society has been, the other is merely anticipated. In other words, the Aristotelian economic world is one which can be taken in well in one view by every producer or consumer. There is no need for an economic expert there. The Marxian post-capitalistic world requires the infinite complexity of the social plan which is drawn up by economic experts. This alienation in the sense of not being able for everyone to understand the whole exists, of course, as much in the post-capitalist society as it exists in capitalist society, although in different ways. Now, this is connected with the <coughs> substantive difference. Aristotle raises the question exactly as Marx was, and Marx knows that, of What makes possible exchange of qualitative different things, the X and the hats? Yeah, we had last time. What makes it possible? Marx says, because they are both product of labor. Aristotle says, no, labor is the same as production. No. What makes it possible is that, that there is something equal on both sides, namely need, need or want. As the economists call it demand, but I stick to the Aristotelian expression, as the need. What does this mean? Aristotle means, what does this difference mean? Aristotle has in mind, here as well as in the other points, man's dependence on nature. The emphasis on labor and production marks is the emphasis on man's mastery of nature. You see how this general point I mentioned before is connected with it. Is there a possibility of a realm of freedom, i.e., where man is simply the master, denied by Aristotle, asserted by Marx, and reflected in the analysis of economics whether one asserts need or production to be the most fundamental fact. Yeah, and as this is of course crucial for Marx in the uh, critique of political economy to which Mr. Propsy referred last time, Marx tries to prove that the ordinary distinction into production, distribution and consumption is superficial, merely commonsensical, and that a deeper understanding would show that the fundamental fact and the overarching fact is production. Uh, uh, consumption is not the end. Uh, the very needs, the needs which are satisfied by consumption, are themselves generated by production, and, and such other arguments uh, of the same nature. Uh, I think I leave it at that now because otherwise I take up too much time. I can see a possibility that we'll stay on on part one indefinitely if I try to respond to some of the things that Dr. Strauss said. Uh, I, I won't do that. I simply won't do it. Uh, there are many points that were raised which are a clarification of what went on last time. And then there are other points to which I might have something to say, not by way of a, a rejoinder, but by way of some expression of how it strikes me. But I think that I ought not to, and we'll get on with with what I regard as my duty, namely to give a more or less connected account of the economic thing down through Mr. Brown's paper, and then we'll, we'll pick up. But I'm I, uh, obliged to say that uh, Dr. Strauss's remark on the qualified conventionality of money in Marx's formulation was almost in the same term something that I meant to point out, and in a way cut the ground out from under a certain portion of the subsequent discussion, but uh, not uh, harmfully. And uh, I would only call your attention now by anticipation to the fact that I believe Marx was addressing Locke and similar people. In Locke, the argument that money is arbitrary and strictly speaking conventional is very prominent. And it has something to do with the also conventional transition from the state of nature to the state of society. In Marx, uh, I would have said that money is not so much conventional, arbitrary, or accidental as necessary. That uh, the nature of economics 
dictates money, and that sooner or later it must show up. And help it, and more or less in the form in which we have it. But I think I would too. So what in what will follow? I'll try to give, as I say, a connected account of the matter of part one in the first volume. Marx begins with the notion of commodities and defines them in a way which we can render as things of use and value. Commodities are, roughly speaking, things of use and value. The distinction between use and value leads to the distinction made on the top of page 42. I won't read it, but you might look it up. Leads to the distinction between quality and quantity as appropriate to the things of economics. This distinction of use and value, which leads to the distinction quality and quantity, is repeated or leads on a higher level to the distinction between utility and value simply. I will use the term utility. Marx doesn't use it, but I think that it will it will not distort the discussion. So you have use, use and value, quality and quantity, and then utility and value, value now in a more technical sense, which emerges from the following consideration. Utility, Marx asserts to be connected with or to flow from labor as specific labor, i.e. the labor of this or that kind of working man, a spinner, a hat maker, a carpenter. As opposed to utility, there is value which emerges from labor as homogeneous labor or undifferentiated labor, not the labor of this or that kind of artisan, but the expenditure of human energy, uh, muscular, nervous, and so on and so forth. Marx, uh, on page 48, refers to his discovery of this distinction as being of the utmost importance. He says, I was the first to point out and to examine critically this twofold nature of the labor contained in commodities. As this point is the pivot on which a clear comprehension of political economy turns, we must go more into detail. As far as I know, he doesn't emphasize any other single finding as much as he does that. And we have to take him more or less at his word, at least for the time being. Now, in speaking about specific labor, as distinguished from undifferentiated labor, he remarks on page 50, we see then that labor is not the only source of material wealth, of use values produced by labor. As William Petty puts it, labor is its father and the earth its mother. So that with respect to use value, it would not be proper to say that it arises only out of the expenditure of human effort. Use value really differs from value simply because use value has as its elements or its progenitors, both man and nature, and man as specific artisan, rather than as the mere source of an undifferentiated energy. Now, specific labor is what eventuates in use value, and use value, or the usefulness, the want-satisfying power of the goods, that, we can say, depends upon perfectly trans-historical elements, man and nature. Homogeneous labor, or undifferentiated labor, that leads to exchange value under the capitalistic form of production and social organization. That exchange value, as it emerges out of homogeneous labor, by way of value simply. <coughs> that is a historical product, results from the desire to produce for exchange rather than to produce for use, i.e., from the social organization of production for gain. That social organization has as its primary characteristics the private ownership of the means of production 
and the free sale of labor power. Those two characteristics, the private ownership of the means of production and the sale, the free sale of labor power. Those are, so to speak, the institutional bases for production for exchange or production for gain, which in turn leads up to that uh, line of categories back to, to quantity. That is to say, private ownership of the means of production and sale or free sale of labor power are a certain form or stage of freedom, of human freedom, a certain kind of social organization which is characteristically described as free, but which is of a kind of freedom which, according to Marx, has to be overcome or superseded. Now, Marx's treatment of these questions leads to the, or is based upon the distinction between utility and value, or exchange value, in the capitalistic condition. And uh, let me say for the time being, he, he lays these, quote, side by side. Utility and value are laid side by side, but value is decisive with respect to the conditions of exchange. Value is decisive because it is the category which is most intimately connected with production. Production is, in the Marxist understanding, or in Marx's own understanding, objectifiable. One can speak of production as objective, and that has to do once more with the considerations raised last time uh, flowing out of the development of a social physics. Let's say, therefore, that the attempt to put economics on a perfectly scientific base led Marx to attach decisive importance to production and to play down what was taken by other people to be of some importance, namely the utility or usefulness of the commodity. Now, political economy, which I contrast with the Marxian understanding, political economy also makes use of the notions of utility and value or exchange, exchangeable uh, quality. But in political economy, utility is equatable with demand. Demand is not simply need or want, but demand is want mitigated by purchasing power to begin with. Value, on the other hand, is uh, a sufficiently close restatement of what Marx means by the conditions of production or the conditions of supply. And so out of this, one has the putting not side by side, but athwart each other, utility and value. Both are asserted to be decisive with respect to the determination of exchange value. But exchange value is now for certain reasons called price rather than value. One could say then that political economy admits consumption along with production as having a bearing on the determination of the value with the understanding that value now is reflected as price. And those of you who've read the material will know that Marx takes note of this distinction and we will come back to it and try to clarify it in his terms as well. Now, when one admits consumption as one of the determinants of value or price as political economy does, then one has admitted or allowed to enter what the modern economists call consumer preference. Consumption means the preferences of consumers. And that, we could say, is perfectly subjective. So that to contrast the Marxian understanding with that of political economy, we could say that Marx attempted to make the determination of value perfectly objective by causing production to be decisive, and that political economy, in ways which I couldn't try to explain right now, causes the determination of value to be quite subjective, visibly through the introduction of consumer preference, but more subtly by the redefinition of cost, also to include a reflection of consumer preference. Those of you who've had some exposure to economics will know what I mean when I say that the modern understanding of cost is reducible to the doctrine of alternative cost. 
That is to say, there is no longer any such thing as the absolute or intrinsic cost for the application of a certain factor of production, but that the cost of applying a factor of production in line of use A has to be understood in terms of the maximum foregoing of output in all the other lines of production to which that factor of production could alternatively have been applied. If necessary, I'll make this a bit clearer. If a ton of iron could be applied to the production of locomotives, uh, structural steel frameworks, or magnets to be used in children's toys, the cost of applying that ton of steel in any one of these directions is not intrinsic, but is given by reference to how much of value has to be given up by depriving the other two lines of the use of that one ton. Is that sufficiently clear? So that in other words, not only does is consumption or demand affected by this subjective consideration of consumer preference, but supply, as it's now called, is also affected by a, a shifting of the ground and a refusal to allow even the condition of cost to be inherent to the thing <coughs> whose cost is being considered. Right? That's the doctrine of alternative costs. Right? So that we could say this subjectivism of the determination of price in the formulations of political economy has some connection, which we couldn't develop here, with the doctrine that nothing is intrinsic to the thing, that all of its characteristics are, let's say, imparted to it or empirical, and how this is congenial to Marx's doctrines of a total lack of an essence, and how, on the other hand, it leads to an entirely different conclusion from that of the Marxian denial of an essence is something else that we can't go into now, but which I would call to your attention as a question. Now, Marx goes on from this point to consider the form of value or exchange value, i.e. the expression of the valuableness of a thing, of a commodity, and he develops the notions of relative form and equivalent form of value. That's the example in which he speaks of the 20 yards of linen as being equal to one coat. The problem is to find some way of expressing the value of the 20 yards of linen. Now, he's, he begins with the perfectly sensible observation that you cannot say 20 yards of linen equals 20 yards of linen because it would be true, but it wouldn't be in any way helpful. It would be perfectly firm and unobjectionable but not useful. Therefore, it becomes necessary to find some something other than the primary object in the terms of which one can express the value of that primary object. To put this more abstractly, the value of any one must be expressed in terms of other. And I think that if you were to conceive this remark as written down with the word one in capital letters and the word other, in capital letters, and you might be reminded of Marx's observation in that short paper that we read at the very beginning of how that no object is intelligible or possible really except in the light of other, and therefore some difficulties arise with respect to the possibility of a whole and so on and so forth, but I wouldn't want to get into that. Now, a specific thing as a result of this observation, a specific thing must therefore become the quintessence, in quotation marks, because he doesn't use the term, of value. Because you cannot express the value of 20 yards of linen in terms of linen, you must express it in terms of something else, some other, say, coat. And the, the value of the linen becomes, in a certain sense, objectified in, or alienated to, that other thing, which is still a coat, but becomes, for the purposes of this expression, a mere embodiment or crystallization of the valuableness of the other thing. So the 20 yards of linen have a value, which is the result of their incorporation of labor. And then on the other side, you have a coat. And that coat looks perfectly different from the 20 yards of linen. It is not itself value, 
The code isn't value. What the code contains or embodies a value. And for the purposes of this relationship, it can be thought of as being nothing but the incarnation of value in the same degree to which it exists in the 20 yards of linen. Now, you might say this is a terrific amount of trouble to go to prove something which is quite simple. The fact of the matter is that this is what leads up to and makes possible Marx's discussion of money. See, obviously, you must be able to see this thing coming, that money is what does this for all other commodities, and therefore this preparation is not capricious on Marx's part, but is necessary. Now, it's at this point, I think, that we could take note of uh, Dr. Strauss's observation that money is not simply arbitrary in Marx's scheme, but is, strictly speaking, necessary, both in its character and as well as in its simply empirical function. If we look at page 99 in the text, we see where he even says it in so many words. Beginning of the first complete paragraph on the page, money is a crystal form of necessity in the course of the exchanges, and so on and so forth. It, uh, it's bound to arise. Now, money, we could say, is implicit in the notion of homogeneous labor. If there were not homogeneous or undifferentiated labor, then it wouldn't be possible for one thing in its specific or qualitative character still to be the incarnation of the valuableness of other things. So it's the incorporation of labor in things and eventually in that thing that becomes money that makes money possible and even necessary. However, this has some consequences. This way of building up to the idea of money has consequences which accompany Marx's development entire through and from beginning to end. I'll put it for brief purposes as follows. Marx conceives money in such a way that he is saddled with a hard monetary policy a hard monetary theory, let me say, policy would be absolutely out of place. He's saddled with the impossibility of monetary policy is what it amounts to. Significant monetary policy would be substantially impossible in a, a community that's, that's got nothing whatever to do with what happens in the Soviet Union, obviously, where they have monetary policy. What I mean by uh, hard monetary theory is this. Hard monetary is unfortunately the phrase which is imposed on me in trying to say something about hard money. Hard money is, has as its adjective hard monetary. That's the way in which I mean it. That means, in effect, the domestic and international gold standard without qualifications. Money gets its, let me say, the meta metallic metals get their character as money because they are the embodiments of a certain quantity of homogeneous, undifferentiated human labor. How much money there is, what the relation of money will be to a day's wage, uh, the relation of gold to a quarter of wheat, all of this is in one sense determined by the amount of labor that's absorbed in the production of an ounce of gold. Uh, that it becomes a point of great consequence later on. I'll tell you only in a short form by anticipation what the consequences could be. Marx is led to accept certain traditional formulations with respect to the quantity of money as a result of his beginning from these premises. The acceptance of those premises and the conclusions that flow from them compel him to regard effective monetary policy as impossible. The quantity of money is itself determined by certain other variables. The quantity of effective money is determined by those variables. I, I could remind you of the formulation we had on the board last time. The quantity of money here, that we can solve for. Marx says these, and he has a, a, a very sophisticated grasp, incidentally, of this view with respect to money. He, he saw many things. These are variables. The price level, the 
the bulk of the transactions or the quantity of the output and the velocity of the money. These are variables. Once they are somehow or other settled for that community, this falls out as a necessary consequence. Now you can have, you can try to jam into that system three times as much money as would be indicated by the solution of the other relation. What will happen will be hoarding. Then there will be a certain amount of saving. You know, money will go into stocks, the uh, stocks of money, I mean, not, not securities. There is a, a channel of circulation, and that has to be filled. He speaks of the conduits of, of trade and circulation of exchange. That has to be filled. In order for there to be a sufficient filling, there must be a reservoir out of which and into which some quantities can flow in order to keep the conduit sufficiently full itself. But fundamentally, there is a quantum of money which is required by the circumstances of the society. And that, that is what there must be. There can be quite a few variations in prices. We'll come to that. He doesn't by any means ignore some empirical circumstances of modern life, but his understanding of them is, we could now say, primitive. It's primitive, and I don't make this point in order to show what a, a superficial thinker he was and how clever the subsequent economists have become. That's not at all my, my object. But the point is, the extent to which he has, in a way, been mistaken goes to the root of his understanding of economic and political things. I'll be very brief. If money is really a dependent variable, and if there is a, a kind of immutable law in capitalism, I say nothing about trans-capitalistic things. If there is an immutable law in capitalism that makes the quantity of money conform to some other variables, then one can say the line of causation always goes from right to left in this equation. I say nothing at all about what might affect these, but uh, suppose that they're somehow or other at a particular level, then the quantity of money falls out as a dependent variable. Now, the whole understanding of monetary policy at the present time is to the contrary effect, namely that money can be understood as itself an independent variable, which has consequences for the price level, for the bulk of transactions, and maybe even for the velocity of money. Now, you might say that's not terribly interesting, except to people who are curious about some obscure uh, recondite matters, but that's not so, because this P has very much to do with the level of economic activity, i.e. the control of what Marx called crises and what we now call fluctuations in the, the level of business or uh, business cycles. To the extent to which it's in any way true that the credit phenomenon, the increase or decrease of the flow of money itself has an effect on, in the other direction from left to right. His understanding of the inevitable collapse of capitalism is affected. I wouldn't say that everything turns on this, but this is symptomatic of something. The extent to which it's possible to control certain developments by policy is by Marx minimized. And if it were not possible for Marx, and maybe even necessary for Marx, to minimize the control over events by policy, I think much of what he says about historical materialism or the determinism of the historical process in, in uh, response to some underlying economic conditions would be made insecure. This is not taken to be, I don't intend it to be, a sweeping a contradiction of Marx's whole position, but I think that it points to, to a very large difficulty, namely, to what extent is the motion of the institutions so much governed by things which he regarded as uh, quite beyond the human control. You see, the question becomes of some concern because Marx apparently had at the end of his view the overcoming of the alienation of these economic laws. They work, so to speak, under the capitalistic system as controlling man. And Marx says this is in a way a uh, perversion of the correct order of things. The economic laws are not things in themselves which have an existence and an authority independent of the human subjects. 
They only appear to be so under capitalism. And when we look at this section called the fetishism of commodities, we'll see another example of this. How relations among objects are mistakenly regarded as being somehow self-subsisting, that they have their own meaning and their own validity. And Marx says no, when once it comes to be understood that these things are really subject to human operation, then in a way capitalism will be on its last legs practically as well as in principle. Now, uh, I mention this because to the extent to which his monetary policy leads him, I beg your pardon, his monetary theory leads him to a certain conception of the policy possibilities under a capitalistic order. Those possibilities being very, very limited, then he is put in the way of making enormous mistakes. Now, you might say that's merely empirical. The, the point here precisely is whether the course of history is or is not merely empirical. If the course of history is itself more empirical than Marx would have one believe, then one can't say these considerations have no uh, great abstract merit. And then what you're trying to assert is that the prospects of capitalism depend on certain shifts which we can devise and so on. But I would say that's quite possible that the prospects of capitalism or of any other order depend upon certain shifts, if you like to call them so, and which some men like Edmund Burke found a more elegant way to describe what Mr. Dennis, I believe, you have a difficulty. I think I follow your general line of argument, but I got a bit lost in some of the details, which is quite Perhaps some of them got lost too. So at times, maybe I can ask one question about: um, Is this is this a, an equation that Marx would buy? I mean, as as you stated it here. Um, yeah, pretty much. Pretty much. So, it's price here, uh, then really is the price level of what of all goods yes. at a particular moment. Yes. And transactions would be what the the volume of goods. The volume of goods. Oh, yes. Uh, let me see if I can find you the exact price. The price of money. No, 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 no. P is the price of goods. It's the reciprocal of the value of money. The, price, the index of the price level would vary reciprocally with the value of money. The quantity of price of money. Well, I mean, let me give you a very simple example. If, uh, if at one point one dollar will buy one air. But another time, the price of a pair of socks becomes two dollars. Then, whereas before one dollar would buy two socks, it will now buy only one. It requires two dollars to get both socks, right? So that, that would mean that whereas the value of socks in terms of dollars has doubled, the value of dollars in terms of socks has fallen to a half. <coughs> Each dollar will buy half as many socks as before. That's what I mean by saying that the, the price level is, the, the changes in the price level are related reciprocally to the changes in the value of money. But I think that he would have said something very much like this. I'm trying to find the page. It's in the, it's in the chapter on exchange. You can look it up. The price of money really never changes. He doesn't speak of the price of money. You could speak of the value of the monetary metal or the value of a, of a pound sterling. That's right. That, uh, that would change with the change in the technique of producing the monetary metals. It seems, it seems difficult to conceive of the price level changing under these kinds of circumstances. Oh, it, it does all the time. I mean, uh, no. If you have the, if you have the value of money things, um, well, the value of money doesn't enter into this as a. V is the velocity of money, and is that possibly a source of difficulty? V is the velocity of money, the number of times on the average that one unit changes hands. Now, this formulation I've by no means properly explained to you because it has two different bearings. I mean, one with respect to total transactions and one with respect to income. Okay. There are two Vs, income velocity and uh, the simple a aggregate velocity of money. And we would have to take that up if we wanted to go into this for its own sake. But I didn't mean to get so far into that. But is it all right so far? Yeah, I think I see that. Uh -huh. 
Mr. Benjamin, please. The same thing, but I can I can understand the formula if it read B equals P T over M, but I can't understand it as money equals P T over B. In other words, uh, the total transaction times the price divided by the amount of money would indicate the velocity at which money was going was was moving. You mean this? Yeah, that that would make sense. To me. Well, Mr. Benjamin, you astonish me. Uh, I mean, algebraically, there is nothing to choose between them, is there? No. Nothing. Well, let me put it this way. I think it always, incidentally, it's, it's a good idea to try to reformulate the relation between these variables in some non-mathematical or quasi-mathematical way. One could say the quantity of money varies directly with the product of the value of goods sold, and inversely, with the number of times on the average it changes hands. So, yeah, the problem, I guess, is that uh, well, the velocity would have to be determined by something else. Yes. And therefore, I, I, you know, I can't see how you would derive a figure for the velocity, whereas I can see easily how to derive a figure for m. Yeah, you've seen something which is of, of considerable value to the, the working economists. When in practice they try to use these things, it's quite true. V is the one which is the, the residual. That's the one that they can only find out by consulting the relation of the other three. That's quite true. But, but which, which only really means that that's the one they know the least about. And they, they don't conceal that fact. It's the hardest one to understand. That is the one which is most nearly connected with what people feel like doing. See, and what they feel like doing can be affected by thousands of things, and it's very hard to make that precise. But I think, Mr. Nelson, did you have a question before? Well, I, was, I would say that the uh, Marxist formulation on page 135. 135, yeah, it's in that neighborhood. Yes. Uh, I believe that, as a matter of fact, that's where I have it noted in the margin of my copy. Mr. Gilton? Um, well, I just wondered about this. I understand that, that in one of the exchanges between prices and value is not relevant to something. Yeah. Of course, but later on, you indicate that price fluctuates uh, and varies. Varies from value for a consideration. Yeah, he Does makes he ever speak of the value of money in the same way? The value of money as varying? The, the distinction between the value of money and the price level. Yeah, the value of money would be the reciprocal of the price level once more, and he, he understands that thoroughly, sure. So it's the value of money in that sense. He did make a distinction between value and the price in relation to both. Yes. Sure, that can happen. I mean, he speaks of, in the uh, contribution to the critique of political economy. He tries to show how the conventional economists have misunderstood this problem. And he uh, analyzes Ricardo and a number of other people with great skill. I mean, he really grasped that subject. He had a thorough understanding. And his understanding was always illuminated by the fact that he knew what he wanted, you see. He knew where he was going. And he always had a, a point of view from which he could look into these others. Now, and he saw certain things about their formulations, which uh, really they would have to have answered. Um, of course, Ricardo was long dead uh, when this was done, which goes without saying. But no, it, the question of the relation between price and value is taken up by Marx in Volume 1, although you're right in saying that it isn't of primary importance there, but he knows that it is of primary importance, and it is promised for later treatment. Now, you, I think everybody knows the history of that subject. I won't go into it, that uh, he, Marx died before Volumes 2 and 3, would be published, and so Engels had to put them together out of very difficult manuscripts, and he did a, apparently a, a remarkable job. And it's in volume three, which came out in the 1880s, if I'm not mistaken. No, it must be later than that, maybe 1890s, uh, in which he deals with what's called the transformation problem, the problem of the transformation of values into prices. <clears throat> and that let loose a terrific dispute which had been burgeoning for a long time. And a man by the name of Bram Bavek, who was one of the leading Austrian economists of the marginal utility school, i.e. of the subjective value school, then wrote a book called Karl Marx and the Close of His System, 
which has been republished in the late 1940s in this country. You probably still get, uh, and it's edited by a man named Paul Sweezy, a, a very competent American Marxian economist, who uh, indicates, and I'll pass this on to you, that the close of his system didn't mean the demise of his system, but simply the publication of volume three, the bringing to an end of the, the long written discussion. Now, it's true that Van Bavik also believed that it meant that the showing up of the fallacies in the system and the impossibility of solving the transformation problem in, uh, in Marx's own terms. And then there was a lot of controversy back and forth, and it became highly mathematical, and in late years, very highly mathematical. And I think nobody it really cares anymore whether you solve it. Because when you look at the operation of a Marxist community, i.e. a community which tries as well as it's as possible to, to operate a large economy on the basis of Marx's fundamental principles, it turns out that what was called the transformation problem is solved empirically. And so the, the precise relation becomes irrelevant. And uh, as well as many other things that go to that segment. Please. This may be very excellent. The reason I brought it up is this. If I remember the thing that determines the difference between value and price, supply and demand plays a role. Yes, indeed. Now, for supply and demand also plays a role, the difference between value and price in relation to money. I don't see why Marx said couldn't accommodate all of these problems. Yeah, because obviously there is there is this difficulty. The supply of money you can easily understand. The demand for money is a very complicated notion. And he has no place to that. In fact, as well as I know, that's not discussed. The demand for money. He speaks of hoarding, and there is a subsection in one of the chapters on hoarding. And that would, by modern economists, be called one of the elements of the demand for money. But Locke dealt with the question of the demand for money in a, in a few sentences. He said, in effect, it's infinite. So there is no uh, uh, theoretical difficulty. Uh, with, uh, with Marx, that, that wouldn't go down so well. And so, uh, I mean, it's not very satisfying, theoretically. But I think that probably we ought not to linger longer on this question. It really is outside the scope of, of volume one and would only be introduced if we tried to say something about the theoretical completeness of the whole Marxist system. And in book, in uh, volumes two and three, he goes at great length into the questions of credit and, uh, and business cycles and things like that and shows how very deeply he thought about all these questions. He was, he was not a, a, a dilettante in economics, and no one should get that idea at all, but we simply can't do it. Now, section four in chapter one, as it is very important, called the fetishism of commodities. I'll try to state in one sentence what this fetishism, in the first place, a fetish, as everybody knows, is an object of superstition. It's something which is thought to have a power or a character, which in fact it doesn't. And everything of any interest about a fetish is simply thought onto it, you might say. It's a little doll or something like that, and then somebody says, well, if you, if you do certain things, stick pins in it, it'll do so and so to somebody and if you genuflect and so on and so forth. Now, but, but according to Marx, it's sheer superstition. Now, the relations of use values and values, i.e. of things, is presented as objective rather than social or historical. That's the fetishism of commodities. The relations of use values and values, the relations among the things, is presented in the light of this fetishism as being objective rather than being social. But social here means historical. It isn't objective in the sense that it's really in the things. It's only imparted to the things. It's of the nature of the subject more than of the nature of the object. So I suppose what this is in a way Marx's way of showing his disrespect for Hegelian idealism. Whereas uh, Hegel would say the substance and subject must eventually coincide or do coincide, Marx would say as long as the substance is really tainted with the subject, in a way it isn't yet thoroughly understood. But there is an element of error or imagination or whatever, in this case of the historical, of the non-objective. 
And then the, the historical replaces the subjective in this formulation as the transient or the impermanent. And I think, generally speaking, one could say, if Marx asserts of a certain relation or understanding that it's merely historical or, or that it's social, having to do with the character of the, this or that society, that's a way of depreciating it as being not of the character of the real. Now, we won't raise again the whole question of what's the real against the background of a, a shifting historical foundation. It's in the section on the fetishism of commodities that Marx has a very important, as far as I know, the only account of communist society that even pretends to be uh, a little bit pictorial. It's on page 90. This, this of course, is a kind of, looks like an exception to what I've just, just said, and in a way it is. Everything produced by him was exclusively the result of his own personal labor, and therefore simply an object of use for himself. The total product of our community is a social product. One portion serves as fresh means of production and remains social, but another portion is consumed by the members as means of subsistence. A distribution of this portion amongst them is consequently necessary. Now, the mode of this distribution will vary with the productive organization of the community and the degree of historical development attained by the producers. We will assume, but merely for the sake of a parallel with the production of commodities, that the share of each individual producer is the means of uh, and the means of subsistence is determined by his labor time. That formula has to go, as you know. Labor time would, in that case, play a double part. Its apportionment in accordance with a definite social plan maintains the proper proportion between the different kinds of work to be done and the various wants of the community. On the other hand, it also serves as a measure of the portion of the common labor borne by each individual and of his share in the part of the total product destined for individual consumption. The social relations of the individual producers with regard both to their labor and to its products are in this case perfectly simple and intelligible, and that with regard not only to production but also to distribution. Now, this is not put forth as, in so many words, as being a statement about the post-capitalistic society, but it obviously has much in common with what we've been led to expect from Marx's writings. And, uh, You'll notice that at the crucial point, uh, how would the output be distributed? He says that would uh, that would depend would depend on circumstances. What he means by that is, one wouldn't be able to assert anything about to each according to his needs or wants, except if the productive system was so enormously elaborated that there would be no scarcity. That is to say, that everybody could have as much of everything as he wanted, or that everybody would be so conscientious in the technical sense that even if there were literal scarcity, there wouldn't be any need for an external or an imposed system of distribution or of rationing, such as the price system now imposes on all consumers. But that's left altogether open, and Marx doesn't say anything about what could precisely be expected, and that's simply a sign of his his realism on, in the best sense. Now, that's been the gist of chapter one in brief. Chapter two is entitled Exchange. The point of this, I believe, is that uh, exchange is, a, is primarily a relation among men and is not primarily a relation among goods, as it seems to be. It's social, hence historical, and money plays a role in that process which is not simply arbitrary or accidental, but is necessary. Exchange without money is ultimately incomprehensible. That leads, obviously, and you notice the, the clear line of progression in the argument, that leads to the third chapter called money. The first chapter was called commodities, then exchange, i.e. the exchange of commodities, and then money, that which the exchange of commodities leads up to, necessarily. Money, subtitle, or the circulation of commodities. The first subdivision of that chapter is on the measure of values. Is, uh, you'll notice the next one is called medium of circulation. 
He's now dealing with uh, what are now called the functions of money, as you'll find them laid out in any textbook of economics. That money serves as a measure of value, as a medium of circulation, a store of value, and certain other things. Now, uh, money as a measure of value is intelligible only under the authority of the doctrine that money has a value as a commodity itself. That is to say, money is a metal which absorbs a certain amount of labor. There is a process of production of money. It has to be mined, smelted, so on and so forth, minted. And that's what determines the value of money. Now, on page 114, he, uh, he has a statement about price. The question of the relation of price and money and value is bound to arise. He says, price is the money name of the labor realized in a commodity. Price is the money name. That's the top, top, top line on the page. Price is the money name of the labor realized in a commodity. Now, that, of course, is part of the difficulty as to whether price is simply the money name of the labor realized in the commodity. Now, he understands that, and then he begins to speak about the disparities between money, uh, price and value. And uh, this occurs on page 114. Here, uh, again, further down the page, he says, if now circumstances allow of this price being raised to three pounds from two pounds, and so on and so forth, then some other things will arise. Circumstances. What those circumstances are are not of particularly great interest to Marx. One could say that's what distinguishes him from the political economists. Those circumstances are of great interest to, Mar uh, to the political economists. Those are the conditions of the market, i.e. what are reflected in the variations of supply and demand. And the difference in point of view is obvious. Uh, is not worth dwelling on. The, the political economists are interested in explaining the operation of the market system, and Marx is interested in understanding the fallacy of that operation and in how to transcend it and what will succeed it. But uh, it doesn't quite uh, settle the question, because if his understanding of that same set of uh, uh, occurrences or phenomena differs radically from theirs, the difference would have to be resolved one way or the other, and then something for his overall understanding might emerge from the rightness or wrongness of his view of that set of phenomena, i.e., the disparities between prices and values. Now, Marx's notion of the rectification of the relation between price and value depends entirely on the unhindered operation of the gold standard. Some of you know a bit about international trade will be aware that there is a relation between the rates of exchange and the currents of trade. And that when, to take an obvious example, when the price level rises in a certain country for some reason, never mind what, that country becomes a bad place in which to buy, and that country will then experience a net deficit on its current account with an outflow of gold, and the outflow of gold shrinking this will cause the price level to de de decline. The relation between this and the numerator is a direct relation, right? And then the price level falling, that country will be a better market in which to buy, and the current of flow of gold will be reversed in exact synchronization with the reversal in the current of trade, right? so that one doesn't have to assert any changes in the value of the, the gold proper. One only has to refer to the ratio of the gold and the goods and call this a temporary maladjustment which will automatically extinguish itself by certain adjustments in the distribution of the monetary metal over the whole world. Right? That's the simple statement about the articulation of the domestic and the international gold standard. This was developed before Marx and was adopted by Marx. It is certainly the, the view of money and the currents of trade which is most consistent with the labor theory of value rigidly construed. All right, so now, obviously, if the experience of the world with respect to the gold standard has any meaning, i.e., if the abandonment of the gold standard by every, every significant nation in the world has any significance, 
Uh, if, in other words, it's possible, only empirically, I don't know what this means theoretically, but empirically it's possible for nations to survive, prosper, live, all kinds of things, in the absence of the uh, rigid uh, domestic and international gold standard, uh, I suppose somebody professing to make a theoretical account would sooner or later have to recognize it. Uh, it might have something to do with the irresistible currents of history, and so on and so forth. I'm talking now, in other words, about the possibility that political judgments might somehow be able to have an effect as a counterpoise against these alleged economic immutabilities. Now, the second section of that chapter three, called Medium of Circulation, this is where he deals with the metamorphosis of commodities, a very important question for the subject that Mr. Brown someday in our life is going to get a chance to tell us about in greater detail. This metamorphosis of commodities is the act of selling and the act of buying. He represents it by notation C to M, the transformation or metamorphosis of commodities into money. That is selling, if you had to be told, and transformation of money into commodities, that's buying. And now you might say it's in the course of the discussion of the transformation of commodities into money, i.e. of selling, that Marx pays his respects to the problem of demand. I can't afford the time to go into it, but I refer you to the pages 119 following in the capital, where he speaks about the possibility of changes in demand and how this will have an effect on price, but not necessarily on value. And then the rectification of disparities between price and value will occur, as I've already suggested to you. He also deals with the question of the socially necessary labor time at this point. And for purposes of brevity, I'll say only this. The amount of labor socially necessary is what really determines the exchange value, not the amount of labor incorporated simply. If a man feels like doing something in an inefficient way, he cannot thereby increase his, the value of his product. That's number one. It's a clear case. What about if a man occupies himself with the production of something in a thoroughly efficient way, using minimum resources, but he ends up making something that nobody wants? It won't have any value, according to Marx, notwithstanding its, in, its incorporation of so much of human labor. That causes a certain difficulty, but let's say he understood this problem. He did not give it the same place in his formulation that the political economists would insist it has to be given, and then we're back where we were at the beginning of the lecture, and I don't want to start that all over again. Now, when he combines the, the two metamorphoses, then he comes to the, the United formulation, C and C, the transformation of a commodity into money, and then the retransformation of the money into commodity. Somebody first sells something in order to be able to buy something else. So far, there are no particular problems. At this point in the discussion, from pages 127 and following, Marx uh, discusses uh, a question which it took the, a large part of the economics profession a quite a long time to catch up with him in respect to which uh, I could recast that, but then, you know what I mean. That he, it took until approximately the time of Keynes before economists were massively impressed by this thing, which Marx understood perfectly well, that it isn't true that every time somebody makes something, somebody else is going to be around to buy it. It seems like a simple observation, but it, 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 it could have been sidetracked and was for various reasons of the impetus of some theoretical developments. It was known already to Malthus in a certain form, in a very rather sophisticated form, and it was not Marx's invention, but it, it took a certain amount of common sense to see it, and that wasn't always available. What he asserted was that you could have crises, fluctuations in the level of aggregate activity as a result of the fact that a lot of people would make things and a lot of others wouldn't want them. And then as a result, some people would be thrown out of work 
in order to restrict the supply, etc., etc. And Marx ascribed to the process the same approximate source as many other people uh, have done since, something having to do with the distribution of income. That because some people got a great deal, and uh, quite a few others didn't get very much out of the whole national product, the possibility arose that some people would not have to spend their whole income. So a man who gets a million dollars a year does not have to spend his whole income, doesn't have to spend it. That means there's always the lurking threat that he will withhold some part of his income and desist from returning it to the stream of income. And then there might be a constriction later on, which will eventuate in the unemployment of some number of men. That has to do with the question of the relation of saving and investment. And uh, I think you'll agree we don't have to go into that right now. Now, it's at this point that Marx's treatment of monetary phenomena be, would become of some practical importance. And I repeat that in the area that we're now moving in, things which are of practical importance eventually can come to have even theoretical importance. If there is a way of overcoming these difficulties by policy, by taking back these tough rules and making them pliant under the hands of political men, then some of these inevitabilities can perhaps be avoided. I.e., in simple language, if there is such a thing as competent monetary and fiscal policy, then some uh, anticipated difficulties of the revolution of the proletariat through perpetual immiseration and so on and so forth, not to speak of the proletarianization of the bourgeoisie, can be substantially mitigated, I wouldn't say any more than that, which could be of some interest. Now, at this point, we're ready for Mr. Brown, but it's 10 minutes before the hour, and let me ask Mr. Brown, do you think you could do your job in about 15, say 15 or 20 minutes? That's what you suggest. Should we do it or should we let Mr. Brown start yeah, next time? Yeah, please. Mr. Brown. Well, after this, and next moment, unless you could take two papers in the meeting, succeeding one of the next time, it is called the public speech. I think in order to answer some of this, so you better read about that next one. I'm anticipating that. You mean you're going to raise certain questions which you think I might get? Mr. Brown, this time, then we will the discussion. Then we will the paper and study Yeah, how about that? Then Mr. Brown will lead off next time. That gives us approximately eight minutes in which we can try to stave off the opposition that I suppose has been generated among you, or maybe not. Mr. Brown, is that all right with you if we start with your paper Sorry, last time? Uh, I, my point was that uh, you were concerned with conserving time. Uh, if I presented it now, then maybe you could answer it. <laughs> answer it next time? Yeah. Well, it depends partly on the, on the disposition of your audience. I think they have a legal right to leave after seven minutes from now. <laughs> They might. <laughs> I wouldn't undertake to say. Why don't, why don't you do it, Mr. Brown, and we'll, we'll impose this learning on the rest of the people. Well, a number of points. I'll take up the small ones first. Uh, in Marx, contrary to what I took your assertion to be, would agree that everyone is better off through the exchange of barter of commodities. But that this is irrelevant for the capitalistic process. This means that there's an augmentation of use value, but there isn't any augmentation of exchange value. Unless I misunderstood what you said that you would have denied that this uh, increase of aggregate utility to the that's not terribly important because it doesn't affect this. Uh, it was not necessarily better off. No, not necessarily. But after all, if one man has uh, grain and the other one has wine and they exchange it voluntarily, the assumption is that they're better off. And now,
Now, with respect to your objection to his, to the labor theory from the examples of wines and antiques, I think he would say that's not very interesting. Uh, the truth of it would substantially this argument is that that kind of illustration has always been present as a sort of thorn in the side of people trying to understand that. And uh, modern economists have devised something called the category of quasi rent, which takes care of some examples like this, and which only means that the cost of production becomes rather unimportant because of the impossibility of duplicating. Itself and therefore substantially the value is derivative from the, the demand. And now, uh, with respect to Marx's the notion of the, the possibility of squeezing out more, more labor through overtime or speed up or something, of course, that is the subject of the chapter, the long chapter on the length of the working day, it speaks of the rate and mass of uh, uh, surplus value. So that, well, I'm sure you know that he, he took care of that question later on, if I understand what your uh, was. Did you question what the people had? I question the other, whether he really has taken care of it, not that he has a deal with I believe he took care of it, but uh, so we'll have to wait and see. I mean, uh, you know, the objection of the curve is that through labor saving devices, you don't necessarily have to. Appreciate the value of labor. Uh, in fact, uh, experience seems to be the contrary in many Well, it depends on how you take the application of those labor saving devices uh, to be. If you mean labor saving devices used on the production of what working men consume, that's one thing. But if you mean labor saving devices that displace working men from their work, that's another thing. But if either conditions have to follow. Yeah, well, well, then you would have to be uh, fair to Marx's assertion that these labor saving devices are themselves congelations of labor. And if you use uh, a million dollar machine, it's only one man, that might not be a net reduction in the amount of labor, which is an argument against technological unemployment that makes very good sense as we now see when we have more higher ratio of capital to labor than ever before, but the population and the workforce constantly increases, and we don't find large numbers of people out of work, you know, for that reason. But the interesting question was whether uh, Marx's discussion of the value of labor power really has the effects that I think we uh, believe it has. Now, there's a very important distinction that has to be made, and that is the distinction between the value of labor power and the value of the output of labor. Suppose, I'll, this is a way of, if I'm in a way, an anticipation of things to come, and I won't go into it now, but only to sketch an answer to what Mr. Uh, Brown has raised as a difficulty. Suppose that it, it requires six months to grow the grain and produce the fruit and everything else that are the food for a working man's family with the understanding that this is at such a level that the population of working men is neither decreasing nor increasing. So in other words, this is not the condition for every working man and his wife having a family of 10 children, nor is it the supposition that on this level, working men will not be able to support any children but it means that the population of working men will be substantially steady. And suppose that in that same half year, the food as, and also the clothing and everything else which you correctly say is uh, part of the subsistence level as conventionally determined. He does say that, it's quite true. Sure. Suppose now that the six months takes care of the working, the requirements of the working population for a whole year. Let's reduce the scale. That means that in a working day of 12 hours, six hours must be supposed devoted to the subsistence of the working man. Right? If, if a half a year, then also a half a day, is what Marx would call necessary labor time, or necessary 
labor. He makes the distinction between necessary labor and surplus labor later on, which corresponds with the distinction between the surplus value and the whole bulk of value, but we'll uh, not take that up right now. Now, suppose that the equivalent in monetary metal of the subsistence for a working man, I think the monetary metallic equivalent of six hours of labor in a working man's day of 12 hours is equal to five dollars. So there is the same amount of labor incorporated in five dollars worth of metallic metal as there is in the subsistence of the working man and his family for one day. Okay. Yeah. No, the subsistence for the whole day. Five dollars equals the value of subsistence for a whole day. But five dollars worth of monetary metal can be produced uh, in six hours. That's only another way of saying that the subsistence for the working man and his family can be produced in six hours. But it's enough to keep him going all day. The value of his labor for a whole day, the value of 12 hours worth of labor power, see, is equal, it has the same value as the output of six hours of labor. You have to keep clear the distinction between the value of his labor and the value of his labor power. His working for a whole day eventuates in 12 hours worth of output. That can be bought by a certain man, the capitalist, by paying him the equivalent of six hours worth of product, either in the form of money or let's say in the form of goods or whatever it should have to be. The value of his labor power for 12 hours is equal to the value of his labor, or of anybody's, of undifferentiated labor, for six hours. That's the ground for that transformation of the very correctly The consumption of his labor power, that commodity of labor power, <coughs> is absolutely unique. That's the only thing that you can buy, the only commodity you can buy, the consumption of which leads to a larger mass of value than what you had to begin with in order to buy it. And the reason for that is one thing and one thing only that there is a difference between labor and labor power. Laboring is what the man does the whole day. That, that labor, and it's the result of his labor power being in him. He exerts his labor power over the period of 12 hours. But for the reason that you properly asserted, 12 hours worth of labor power has a value which is different from the value of 12 hours worth of labor performed. <coughs> That difference is the difference between the whole working day and that part of it which Marx calls the necessary part of the working day, the remainder being the surplus. I believe that, uh, that, that uh, the difficulty that you raise really is not a difficulty on the strength of this Set of facts. I believe that you didn't give due weight to Marx's own distinction between the value of labor power, which you properly asserted, and the value of the output of that labor power as transformed into labor. See, labor power, you could say, is a kind of potency, a potentiality, power. That has to be transformed. It's transformed through moving arms and legs and so on and so forth in the body. Perfectly physical change could be described as an output of energy, which incidentally is not my idea, that's Marx's own formulation. Uh, I think that he does make the distinction between labor to value sure. and labor to process or labor to oh, That's what I'm saying. Yeah. But this led me to question whether or not your search for some standard of commensurability for labor value itself in terms of actual labor power 
rather than in terms that Marx himself says is the commensurable standard, that is what will maintain in the laborer himself at his subsistence, that this was conclusion. Yeah, well, uh, I tell you what, I believe we won't be able to settle this in a short time. Uh, why don't we stipulate this, that at the beginning of the next we'll try to dispose of the question, you know, reasonably briefly. Uh, maybe you and I can discuss it in the meantime, so that for the benefit of the class, there won't be a long exchange of And with that understanding, let's uh, close this session now. the discussion of part two, which was begun last time by the Brown who read his paper at the very end of the hour. And remember, we didn't have a chance to speak about the, the matter in Marx. Then after that brief statement, Mr. Nelson will read his paper on part three, which is on the production of absolute surplus value. And then I'll try to give some account also of the matter in in part three. First, then, a few remarks on part two. Part two is called the transformation of money into capital and begins with what Marx calls the general formula for capital, which culminates in that expression money being changed into commodities and then the commodities being changed into money. Again, with the understanding that the final M is larger than the primary M, and properly speaking, should be written with a prime, with the further understanding that the purely formal M prime equals M plus some increment of delta M. And one could say that the problem for some part of the text from now on will be to explain how that increment delta M arises. That is to say, what there is about the investment of money in the capitalistic process that leads to profit. And now, this delta M, which is called technically by Marx surplus value, arises only under the conditions of capitalism. That is to say, it arises only under the conditions of the purchase of labor power by an investor, an entrepreneur, and then his consumption of that labor power under such conditions that the consumption itself has something to do with the augmentation of the values in the process of circulation. Now, uh, having stated the problem in chapter four, roughly as I've just outlined it, Marx goes on in the fifth chapter to speak of the, what he calls the contradictions in the general formula of capital. Those contradictions being essentially reducible to the difficulty in explaining why something can be exchanged for something else of equal value. And that something else can in turn be transformed into something still else. And the value will be larger at the end than at the beginning without any fault in the process of exchange. That is to say, there isn't any point at which you can say, here somebody was cheated, and the thing which he turned over to somebody else didn't have the same value as what that other party gave back to him in exchange. And yet, nevertheless, in spite of the fact that what everybody exchanges with everyone else is uh, equivalent in value, nonetheless, at the end, the quantum of value is greater than at the beginning. Now, then Marx takes up two main hypotheses which might be used to explain this augmentation for the sake of rejecting them. The first is the increase of aggregate use value might be the source of the increase in value. That is to say, as Mr. Brown brought out perfectly adequately, and I won't go into it, if two men exchange uh, one man his wheat for the other man's uh, wine, and uh, each one feels better having what the other formerly possessed, that could be described as an augmentation of the ag aggregate of use values, but it doesn't say anything whatever to the question of the increase in value proper, because the two must have been exchanged as equal values 
exchange values to begin with. That was the ground for their being exchanged, as was elaborated in the earlier part. The second possibility, nor is it a mere adventitious gain by one party against another. That is to say, it isn't true that what one capitalist gains comes out of the loss of another capitalist, because that would lead to a surplus value or a profit equal to zero net for the whole community. And Marx says, no, that's, if that were true, there wouldn't be any capitalism. What we're trying to explain is the positive net aggregate, not the zero aggregate, or in other words, not the individual case. The conclusion, therefore, is that this delta M is not produced by the process of circulation. It must be produced by something else than the mere transferring of the values from one hand to another. And that leads Marx to give his own affirmative explanation in chapter 6, which is called the buying and selling of labor power, labor power being the, the C in there, the commodity. Now, Marx's formulation is that in the process M, C, M prime, the change in value takes place in the course of the consumption of C, <coughs> labor power, as a use value. And I believe that the best expression of this comes on pages 185, uh, 186. The change must therefore take place in the commodity bought by the first act, MC, but not in its value, for equivalents are exchanged, and the commodity is paid for at its full value. The labor power is bought at its full value. There isn't any cheating at this stage. We are the, and now, as to the value of labor power, I'll come to that in a little while. I'll add parenthetically that Brown and I had a, an extended discussion since the last meeting of the class, in the course of which I think we resolved our difficulties, and I, it would take too long to go into the details, but the net consequence of our conversation was his suggestion that maybe if the explanation of the value of labor power and the difference between labor power and labor were made somewhat ampler, the difficulty that he and I had in understanding each other might not arise to trouble the rest of the class. And so I'll, I'll try to uh, follow that suggestion in, in the proper place. And now let me repeat. For equivalents are exchanged, and the commodity, i.e. labor power, is paid for at its full value. We are therefore forced to the conclusion that the change originates in the use value, as such, of the commodity, i.e. in its consumption. Now, this C, therefore, is to be understood as labor power, and that raises the problem of the possible definition of the value of labor power. Now, Marx has already laid down a rule, which is to the effect that the value of every commodity is given by the quantity of socially necessary labor time incorporated in its production. Whatever it happens to be, it was stated as a, as a perfectly general rule. Now, at this point, uh, one might think Marx is going to be uh, embarrassed by the definition that he gives of labor power as itself a commodity, because it would appear that he would now be compelled to say the value of all commodities is given by the quantity of labor absorbed in their production. Labor power is itself a commodity, and therefore he's stuck with the need to say that the value of labor power is itself given by the quantity of labor incorporated in its own production, which is precisely what he says. And so there is no awkwardness whatever. The only difficulty is how could one explain the quantum of labor that goes into or to say that the quantum of labor time that goes into the production of labor power. And that's not so difficult, really. Marx says that means the amount of time used up in the production of the means of subsistence. So that if it, and now we're, we're, I'm, I know I'm repeating something I said the other time, but it bears a bit of repetition. If it should take six hours to produce the subsistence that will maintain a laborer at the level that will itself sustain the the race of laborers for a whole day, then the value of one day's labor power is equal to six hours worth of output, which is, let's say, a half a day's work. The practical consequence of that is that one can buy the services of a man for a whole day, and it goes without saying, therefore, appropriate the output of that man as 
his labor is spread over 12 hours, but give him only the output of six hours, because that is the value of his labor power. The labor power is literally a potentiality, a potency. And when that potency is translated into act, it has a different character. But labor power is such a commodity that it needs to be paid for only at the value it has qua potency, to use somewhat uh, extraneous language, but it might be intelligible to some. If one properly understood all of this, then in a way the rest of Das Kapital, would, uh, volume one, would be superfluous, because everything else follows from that. That's the source of profit. Certain comparisons made internally to that explanation lead to the various ratios and masses and so on and so forth that Marx described. And all of, from now on, it's a, the book is in a way an elaboration of this fact that it's possible to buy labor power at a, at a price which is equivalent to its value. But the thing bought, i.e. the labor power, when it is used, i.e. when it's when it as potency is transformed into it as a, a concretion or an act, that leads to an expansion, an enlargement of value. And there is no other way for value to be brought into being. <clears throat> That's a corollary, which will have its full meaning only in the third part on the production of a relative surplus value. Now, Marx's clearest expressions are on page 189 and 191 with respect to this. The value of labor power is determined, as in the case of every other commodity, by the labor time necessary for the production, and consequently also the reproduction of this special article. So labor power is in no way an exception to the rule of the value of commodities. And then on page 191, almost in the middle of the page, the beginning of the second complete paragraph on the page, the value of labor power resolves itself into the value of a definite quantity of the means of subsistence value of the means of subsistence. Now, Mr. Brown very correctly pointed out last time that the, the subsistence level is defined by Marx to have a conventional character and isn't simply that minimum input of matter which would enable a human being to continue to live and do his, his proper work, but that there is a, an increment to that which comes about from historical circumstances. But it must be said that Marx makes nothing whatever as well as I can understand it, of that distinction, so that from there on the subsistence wage is treated as if that qualification to it uh, didn't have any particular importance. And now, that settles the question then of the value of labor power, and what we have to do next then is a rather small matter to see how that value is itself expressed in the form of the wage, and in order to understand that simple transition from the value of the labor power to the wage, one needs simply to remind himself of Marx's doctrines with respect to money. The labor time necessary to produce a given quantity of gold, i.e. money, is translated into the labor time necessary to produce the subsistence of the worker, so that if the, necess the necessities for the laborer which it takes six hours to produce, uh, constitute his real wage, then his money wage will be the same amount of gold that could be produced in that same period of time. So the six hours production of gold would constitute the wage or the price of labor power spread over 12 hours. And you can easily see it right away how the, the differential would arise, because if the output of 12 hours is sold for, let's say, four days output of gold, whereas the, the wage constitutes two days production of gold, the profit would be equal to the value of that difference, which is two days production value of gold. That would be how you would find it in money. So as far as this goes, Marx has no particular difficulty. You'll notice that the, he, does, uh, he does pay attention to the difference between the wage and the value. And I might say more largely that he pays attention throughout between values of things and their prices. But uh, in a certain footnote to which we'll come later on, he says he reserves the resolution of that difficulty to uh, volume three, to book three of Das Kapital. And then I told you that there's an enormous difficulty as to whether he actually resolved it. I will add parenthetically that the 
In the most recent judgment on that question it culminates in the following proposition. The transformation of the values into prices depends, or let me put it more exactly, if Marx's old structure with respect to the transformation of values into prices is valid, it is made valid by a certain assumption with respect to the organic composition of capital in the gold mining industry. It's this on which the whole thing theoretically turns. The organic composition of capital means the distribution of the investment of the entrepreneur between constant capital and variable capital, and we'll come to that distinction later on. But this is a this is not a, a, a simply colossal a point, this organic composition of capital. Now, so one could say there is something odd about a vast theoretical construction which either stands or falls on the basis of some proposition with respect to the organic composition of capital in the gold mining industry. And now, this was the, the effort of a Marxist, a man, a very, incidentally, a very well-trained economist who uh, made the best effort that he could to evaluate the controversy and, uh, and uh, decided without prejudice against Marx, let me put it that way. So this was not regarded as an attempt to trivialize Marx's conclusions, but on the contrary, to show how they might be uh, perfectly sensible. But uh, I leave you that thought simply to ruminate on. It has something to do with the argument concerning the absolutization of economics and how much ultimately then must be made to depend upon some technicalities. And uh, if those technicalities are themselves questionable, then the consequences are enormously out of proportion to the interior interest of those technicalities themselves. Now, that by way of a, a preparation for the more interesting matters, which arise in part three, on the production of absolute surplus value. Part two is very important, but it's preparatory. The foundation is surely there. Now we have to see in what way Marx exploits that preparation. And Mr. Nelson, maybe will be so good as to read this paper. Thank you very much, Mr. Nelson. Uh, very good. What I would suggest is that uh, I take up a very few points that you made which uh, struck me. And then I believe Dr. Strauss has a number of things that uh, came up partly here, but uh, were there not some things that... Uh, yeah, and so maybe this would be a good point at which we can then. But first, with respect to those very few things, your uh, remarks, Mr. Nelson, with respect to the unity of the productive process at the beginning, uh, we're not quite clear. No, they're not clear to me. Well, I don't know. Feel something. Uh -huh. Yeah, that, there is a difficulty there. But now, uh, when you ask why the uneducated are so, Marx has an explanation which is different from yours. But, and Marx's explanation resembles in many ways uh, what is generally thought to be true by hordes of non Marxists in the Economic and Philosophic Manuscripts of 1844. He has a short piece on money. And uh, he, he there says, the overturning and confounding of all human and natural qualities, the fraternization of impossibilities, the divine power of money lies in its character as, as men's estranged, alienating, and self-disposing species nature. Money is the alienated ability of mankind the alienated ability of mankind. Now, what does he mean? That which I am unable to do as a man, and of which, therefore, all my individual essential powers are incapable, I am able to do by means of money. Money thus turns each of these powers into something which in itself it is not, turns it, that is, into its contrary. If I long for a particular dish, or want to take the mail coach because I am not strong enough to go on foot, Money fetches me the dish and the mail coach. That is, it converts my wishes from something in the realm of imagination, translates them from their mediated, imagined, or willed existence into their sensuous, actual existence, from imagination to life, from imagined being into real being. In effecting this mediation, money is the truly creative power. And then he goes on to speak further by saying in a fact that the answer to your question would no, be... Uh, provided, one has money. Yeah, 
that's the whole thing. And he says that those who have the vocation of being a scholar, but who don't have any money, can't be scholars. And those who have no particular vocation, that's the word which is used in the translation, I suppose it could mean something like a calling or an inclination or something. And they can be, they can at least look like scholars or, or go through the motions, you know. And so he would say, yeah, what we have to do is to get rid of that hindrance by through the want of money and have universal opportunity for education up to the highest level provided socially you know, by the state that goes to that saying that's driven away under the best conditions. But I think he would deny you know, the overtone in your argument of the primary inequality, although the truth of the matter is in Marx's earlier statements, some of them contained in this book, the concessions that he makes to inequality are uh, a bit surprising. Uh, and the point of his objection to communism and the need that he sees for it to be replaced by socialism is the... Uh, pardon? No, the com communism is the... Uh, that's the majority. Yeah. The trouble is that communism is crude equalitarianism, as he says. And the only one one rises above that into that final movement of freedom. That's the thing. What is the terminology that is a must want the class? That is a free Marxist usage. Which he simply uh, sees the virtue of, I suppose, or if I must take no one. Yeah. The utopian communism, which was simply that they and which would mean arbitrarily freeze the present and the existing inequalities in life, by the life. Yeah, Whereas that's what he has in mind is an equality as a terminal section, you see. We know we are meant to put one equally gifted and not equally ungifted. Now, as a divided of communism would reduce their higher to the law. Marx wants to elevate the lower to the high. Then I think it's a black difference. Yes. He, he speaks of a difference between uh, yeah, know, the communism yeah. alpha and beta yeah. and so on. Then when he speaks about the final condition, however, this is on page 141, if anyone is interested, it's a very remarkable statement that he has. Um, assume man to be man and his relationship to the world to be a human one. Then you can exchange love only for love trust for trust, and so on. If you want to enjoy art, you must be an artistically cultivated person. If you want to exercise influence over other people, you must be a person with a stimulating and encouraging effect on other people. Every one of your relations to man and to nature must be a specific expression corresponding to the object of your will, of your real individual life. <clears throat> if you love without evoking love in return, that is, if your loving as loving does not produce reciprocal love, if through a living expression of yourself as a loving person you do not make yourself a loved person, then your love is impotent, a misfortune, which seems to imply that on this, even in this ultimate condition there are some irreducible differences which might even look like inequalities when properly evaluated, but I don't want to go into that because that's a very long thing and I suspect Dr. Strauss has a few things to say on that very question. But now, as to your remark, Mr. Nelson, about the imputation of value on account of the variable capital, I think if I, it might be that I misunderstood you and that I didn't catch the drift of it, but that actually the variable capital isn't so much responsible for imputation as distinguished from constant capital, but it is responsible for the addition, to which you brought out very clearly in other passages. Imputation, uh, when you're through an accounting procedure, the whole increase. Yeah, that's correct. And then finally, your remark to the effect that the factory acts were maybe the result of the reactions of the workers. I really wonder about that, and I, I think that one gets the impression, even from Marx, Marx's own treatment, that this was a, a kind of gratuity handed down, not through the agitation of the laboring men, but because there were some people in positions of influence, clergymen and factory inspectors and others, who saw that these conditions were really abominable and that something must be done because it was inhuman to go on like that. You know, because in the early time the, that they were talking about, there was, no, there was no political 
They didn't vote. One other thing is that it was later. Uh, I mean, when, by, before the, the whole uh, working class got the, the suffrage, I think this movement for the reform was incipient. But right? some people still saw that this was necessary. The were the in the 30s. Oh, sure, there were plenty there. And long before that, too, there were objections against the what was called technological unemployment, and, and the, the peasant revolts and so on could be classed in the same form. But as for the acts of the parliament with respect to these abuses, I think that there was probably as much of the, the let's say, conscience speaking of the ruling class as, uh, as of the agitation of workers. But Dr. Strauss, I think you will. Uh, I was going to say, did Marx ever elsewhere impute fact reacts to desire of the part of the landed aristocracy to embarrass the new rising industrialists? Anywhere this else? Is, this, is a, this would be a, available to He does. Anywhere else than where? I mean, besides in this? Yeah. Uh, I don't know where else. Does I don't know, but he clearly does here. Yeah. Well, that has something to do, again, with some things present in Ricardo uh, and in Adam Smith, who, when these two men laid out the scheme of distribution, they, uh, they saw that there was a tension between the well-being and the secular development of the distributive shares, respectively, of the landed gentry and for the rent takers and the manufacturing class. Very simple argument. As the pressure of population increases, Rent will increase because of the taking into production of increasingly bad land and therefore unfriendly land and therefore increase of differential rent, which means the increase in the uh, uh, money wage in order to subsist labor and therefore a decrease in the share left for profit, with eventually in Ricardo the rate of profit falling to approximately zero. Um, and of course the contention over the corn laws was as much a dispute between the the two property on classes as was any other single thing. So that was long before Marx, that was on wellness. Yeah, there, there, are, there is one point which I would like to take up. Uh, which I think is very important, but I believe I do it at a later stage. And that has to do with Marx's interpretation of capital in contact of the capitalists in contradistinction to the to labor. The difficult, I think Marx is compelled by his principle uh, and uh, also by the whole situation to conceive of capital itself as labor. But he calls it dead labor, congealed labor versus living labor. And uh, that has something to do with a much broader issue which arose much earlier in political theory than in economic theory, as far as I know. Namely, the question, the proper relation of the past and the present. For example, in the traditional notion of liberty, of freedom, it was meant freedom under law, as was clear. But what about the law itself? The law could be the law of the past. And in the traditional notion of freedom, say in the Middle Ages, it was taken for granted that the law is very old. But this very old law protects present freedom. And now, in connection with the modern doctrine of sovereignty, the modern doctrine of sovereignty can be expressed as follows. The sovereign is a present sovereign, because if it is otherwise, he wouldn't be sovereign. It seems to be trivial, but it's of crucial importance. It means then also this. You are not free if you are subject to a law to the making of which you have not contributed. In other words, the law must be the present law. It's the present law. Now, as long as the old law guarantees your freedom, the past, as they say now today, is a tradition, is stronger than spontaneity of the present generation. And Marxist doctrine is a strict parallel to that in terms of the economic problem. It is living labor which produces value, not congealed labor. Uh, we have to go into uh, that, I believe, on another occasion. But the point which I want, which is immediately connected with chapter three, is this. Now, you said, Ms. Anderson, you said at the end of your paper, you 
sketch the difference between Marx and Aristotle. Could you restate it? I've forgotten the precise formulation. It has to do with the proper relation, uh, proper economic relation between man and nature outside him. And uh, the Aristotelian formulation, I would call it the politics, the proper economic relation is that between man and the use that he makes of the. I remember now what you want. I will make a child be easier. I spoke of it also. It, uh, for my, the place which labor or production takes in Marx is taken in Aristotle by need. By need, yeah, that's the fundamental difference. And that it has, it has to do with a wholly different understanding of man. And now that has very much to do with the question of teleology, to which we have referred more than once. I would like to say we have here a few very interesting passages on that subject. As regards the term social physics, I saw now uh, somewhere, and that may by no means the first occurrence, but that is much older than uh, uh, Marx, or Marx, and that is in Quetelet, a Frenchman of the 18th century, and he called social physics, uh, he called what is now called vital, vital statistics, social physics, uh, that uh, I mentioned only in passing. Now, here's a passage which I have in mind is on page 198. The elementary factors of the labor process are, for A, the, per, the, the personal activity of man, i.e. work itself, B, is the subject of the work, and three, its instruments. And there is not a word said about the end. I mean, the labor process takes the place of what in Aristotle would be productive art, i.e. what Aristotle calls art. And the art, can, or say the Schumacher, can of course not be defined with, with reference to them. On the same page, at the top, setting in motion arms and legs, head and hands, the natural force of his body, in order to appropriate nature's productions in a form adopt, adapted to his own wants. The so form is absolutely secondary compared to the appropriation. Labor is primary appropriation. So even the form, uh, what I so call the formal cause, is absolutely supported. The so product is outside of the process. He, on page 201. The so product, i.e. that at which we aim, the end, is outside of the process, and since we have to consider the process, the end is irrelevant. Uh, in on page 203, there are no ends in themselves. Whether something is an end or not is determined by the process. So the labor process is the overriding a consideration. Page 205, top. Labor process, labor process is a necessary condition for effecting exchange of matter between man and nature. I believe this is such as you had primarily in mind in your exposition. The human action is a condition. The human action, which is such, is of course teleological, is only the condition for such an exchange between of matter and man, which could then be understood as a mechanical process. There is something more, even clearer, on page 199 in the note. Note one, the quotation from Hegel. I haven't found the exact passage yet. I don't have this edition of the logic and couldn't find the page, but I think the only passage I think the logic which I know where he speaks of the rules of, of reason's cunning is, is born in paragraph 209 of Hegel's logic. No, encyclopedia, 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 paragraph 209. However this may be, what Hegel means and what appears, I think, also partly from Marx's quotation, there is a mechanism. There is a mechanism. Reason causes objects to act and react on each other in accordance with their own nature. In this way, without any direct interference in the process, carries out reason's attention. So the process itself is a purely mechanical or maybe chemical affair. But of course, what Marx does not emphasize, the one thing is a mechanism, or the chemism, or whatever it may be, 
And the other thing is the use of that mechanism for which you establish that. Now, what then is the reason for this quasi-oblivion of the end? The, I believe this. The end is embodied in the use value, in the consumption. But in the infinite process, MCM, the, uh, the, we abstract from the use value. The use value is subordinated to a process in which the use value and therefore the end does not occur, except as a purely extraneous end of profit, which the capitalist, of course, has. Now, there is one more uh, passage on page 218, which I thought, if, uh, paragraph two, if we proceed further and compare the process of producing value with the labor process, pure and simple, we find that the latter consists of the useful labor, the work that produces use values. Here we contemplate the labor as producing a particular article. We view it under its qualitative aspect alone with regard to its end and aim. Shoe make a shoe. Even the egg, properly understood, as having to be fetched from the, from, from the, away from the hand. But viewed as a value-creating process, the same labor process presents itself under its quantitative aspect alone, and here Marx is simply silent about the end or aim. Here is the question merely of the time occupied by the laborer in doing the work, of the period during which the labor, labor power is usefully expanded. Of course, the end is still there, but the end becomes almost invisible uh, in the labor process understood as a process. Now, uh, that, of course, is in perfect agreement to the thesis of his earlier critique of political economy, according to which production, not consumption, is an overarching phenomenon. But it is important also to realize that this non teleology reappears on the highest level. The highest is, uh, you may recall this from Marx's uh, discussion of the moral problem. You have ethics of duty and you have an ethics of pleasure. Both are one-sided, he says, and, and even hypocritical. The true unity is satisfying activity, which as satisfying has something in common with hedonism. As activity, it has something in common with duty. But it is not, it, it, it is not, it's not, does not longer appear as a duty because it is satisfied. Now, this satisfying activity is also called by Marx Lebensäußerung, expression of life. Expression of life. Yeah, but an expression of something has, of course, non teleological character. You do not aim at something. It, that follows from the fact that you live, that this life expresses itself. And therefore, I think. The, and Aristotle would deny this only on the following ground. He would say, Lebens also, say, expression of life. That means, of course, the right kind of expression of life. So, as a form of expression can, is also exploitation, to take a Marxian example. But this one, so the virtuous life, is, of course, an end in itself. And therefore, it does not have an end outside of itself. But for us, who are not always virtuous, the virtuous life appears, of course, ordinarily as an end, and must have been so. But still, for Marx, as we know, the virtuous life, or the, the spontaneous expression of life, or the full development of the faculties, as he also calls it, is a foregone conclusion for us, without effort, given a certain state of society. Incidentally, the development of human faculties is itself, of course, also a teleological expression. Yeah? And you have them first undeveloped, and uh, that what you all have to That was all I had to say on this point, because uh, the other things can be dealt with, uh, will be dealt with by Mr. Popsy. There is also a remark on the uh, materialistic philosophy of history, which is interesting, I thought, on page 200 in the note. <coughs> The least important commodities of all for the technological comparison of different epochs of productions 
are articles of luxury in the strict meaning of the term. However, in our written history up to this time, notice the development of material production, which is the basis of all social life, and therefore of all real history. Yet prehistoric times have been classified in accordance with the results, not of so-called historical, but of materialistic investigations. These periods have been divided to correspond with the materials from which the implements and weapons are made, and with stone, bronze, and iron ages. And that, uh, I think, is this usage throws some light on the meaning of the term materialistic theory of, of history, material production. Uh, and this has even to do, in the first place, with the production of material which is not so uh, clear uh, or, or um, uh, uh, throughout. And that only confirms what I said before, and I said uh, at an, uh, on an earlier occasion, that uh, uh, the primary uh, position of Marx's whole analysis, of whatever it may be, is this dogmatic assertion that man is primarily a material producing uh, being, to use his language and secondly, a thought producer. Uh, and that is, of course, never, it's never true. And in some way or other, that is bound to affect, so I cannot show this in detail at all, and his very analysis of the economic phenomena. You know, I mean, the, whether you look at, uh, at man, say, say from the Hanasari or from the Marxist point of view, will naturally show in the analysis of uh, economic phenomena as well. That is true. That's that passage on two, page 218 that Dr. Strauss referred to is, uh, is the difficult one, where Marx contrasts the process of producing value with the labor process, pure and simple. The process of producing value that's connected with the absorption of homogeneous human labor and leads under capitalism to the exchange value. <clears throat> now, the other alternative is the viewing of the labor process under its qualitative aspect alone, i.e., with regard to its end and aim. That has to do with the production of the use values. Now, from a certain point of view, uh, I think what this means is uh, Marx criticizes the capitalist mode of production and economy generally because it elevates the quantitative, the one which leads to value and therefore to exchange value. And it doesn't do what the process of production ought to do simply, i.e. to aim at use values, those things which are produced with an eye to the end and aim and which would, if properly attended to, I, that is to say, if the social situation was such as to make this possible, would have the following consequence. People would simply work. Uh, they wouldn't work for the sake of making this which they can turn into a larger sum of money. That's part of that fetishism of commodities. <clears throat> it looks as if the commodities are really good only for the sake of doing that with them. And Marx says that's like, like genuflecting in front of the golden calf or something like that, the Israelites in the wilderness. That's, or anything else, it's a superstition. That's not what the, what the goods really are for, but that's only sort of a historical encrustation. Now, the, apparently then, looked at from the broadest point of view, the productive process ought to have more that character of consulting the end and aim. I think, unless this other, which is the capitalistic perversion of the, yeah. And so that, I think, uh, is an extension of the, the remark that, or, I mean, looking at this remark that Dr. Strauss made from uh, this somewhat more technical point of view, but comes to the same thing. Yeah, but from the highest level, surely we produce things for the sake of human life. That's clear. But how is the human life itself understood? And there it would appear that human life itself understood as a kind of aimless production. Yeah. And then you would enable me to say this more vivid than yeah. I said it before. Yeah. Labels is also an expression of life uh, for its own sake. Yeah. 
And uh, that, of course, makes sense, but is very inadequate uh, once we consider the absolute ambiguity of that. And we have to find out what kind of expression it is. Yeah. Or you have to find uh, what kind of human doings are genuine expressions of human and Then you have to use it again and again. And that must rise to a point. Yeah, no, uh, this is yeah. only a provisional yeah. remark and doesn't say something like that. Absolutely necessary to make, yeah. but I think it's a difficulty in the well, the, yeah, surely one, one would have to consider what this economic thing is all about, so to speak. That is yeah. to say, what kind of a social arrangement yeah. it's supposed to support, even under the best conditions, which this doesn't do. The subtitle of this book is a critique of capitalist production, as you know. And it is really more negative than affirmative, but still a great deal is implicit about the, uh, the affirmative that Marx would have in mind. Well, now I, I have to do one of these rather uninteresting jobs from your point of view, I'm afraid, and, and simply try to clarify things that he said. Because the argument is at some points hard to follow for merely technical reasons. And I think I would not be doing my simple duty if I uh, slighted those difficulties because they're not inspiring, terribly interesting. They happen not to be from most points of view, but they have to be grasped. Otherwise, what happens afterwards doesn't hang together. Now, part three is called the production of absolute surplus value. This is to be understood in contradistinction to the title of part four, which is the production of relative surplus value, and then part five, which is the production of both absolute and relative surplus value. So there is a development which uh, is very clearly indicated in the titles of the divisions of the book. And, and in Marx's case, as much as in any other book that I know of, one is repaid by looking at the outline of the work as it is reflected in the, the titles of the chapters and subchapters. He was very, very orderly in how he proceeded, and he, uh, he, he gives great help in the table of contents alone, for example. Now, first chapter in this part, is, uh, chapter 7, is called The Labor Process and the Process of Producing Surplus Value. <clears throat> and to begin with, a section on the labor process simply the pr labor process or the production of use values, so that the distinction that's made is the labor process as production of use value, and then the labor process as it leads up to the production of surplus value. Now, at the outset, there are some non-technical observations of Marx's which are interesting, in which he speaks of man's self-development through labor, the subduing of nature is also the subduing or self-control of man. And if this remark is sufficiently well understood, one gets some notion of what Marx had in mind by speaking of the importance of the process of production for the formation of human life. Whether he's right or wrong is a separate question, but what he meant, at any rate, is of some importance. And this is what he meant. He, he says, in the course of the process of production, we not only impose our will on the externality, but we have to construct ourselves in such a way that we conform to the, the notion we have of the end of the productive activity to begin with. We have to be such men as can fit into that process of production. Now, that would be very different for instance, under the conditions of factory, uh, factory industry, uh, from what it would be under the conditions, let's say, of pastoral nomadism. Uh, different kinds of men brought about under the different circumstances, and I think everybody has agreed that there is something to this. Aristotle spoke of it, the different kinds, the characters of men under the different conditions, and so on and so forth, and everybody has seen this more or less, I think, in Xenophon, there are observations like this and uh, elsewhere. Now, this is dealt with generally in the early parts, pages 197 to 198. I won't read them, but I recommend the, the passage uh, to you that goes from the bottom of the one page to the top of the next. Now, that leads up to his remark that Dr. Strauss called attention to a few weeks ago, contrasting the worst architect and the best of bees that the, uh, the architect knows at the beginning what he's going to do, and the bee has no conception, but works by instinct. And it's interesting to see how Marx conceives the coming about of that state of things. This is the top of page 198. 
uh, in speaking of the process of production, he says, we are not now dealing with those primitive instinctive forms of labor that remind us of the mere animal. An immeasurable interval of time separates the state of things in which a man brings his labor power to market for sale as a commodity from that state in which human labor was still in its first instinctive stage. We presuppose labor in a form that stamps it as exclusively human. A spider conducts operations that resemble those of a weaver, and a bee puts to shame many an architect in the construction of her cells. But what distinguishes the worst architect from the best of bees is this, that the architect raises his structure in imagination before he erects it in reality. But you see, even that isn't supposed to be at all times and under all conditions true of man. Apparently that had to come to be same as everything else. That has its historical dimension. He says it's, uh, we're separated from that by an immeasurable interval of time. He doesn't try to say how long it was ago that man was in that state in which human labor was still in its first instinctive stage. But even this, apparently, that reminds me, that at any rate, reminds me of Rousseau, where in whose writings one gets the impression that even the very passions themselves somehow had to be brought into being, and that man didn't have the same structure of, uh, of soul, didn't have, the, didn't have a soul in the same sense that he has now in a very early time. And that the, even that is historical. That he didn't know resentment, for example, to take a very simple example, and you know, not to say anything about avariciousness and that, that kind of thing, and bad self-love, a good kind of self-love he might have known, very low level, very mild kind of thing, which when connected with an utter lack of memory, didn't even prepare the ground for a, a decent human resentment of one person by another. So it all had to come into being. And uh, apparently Marx has something of the same kind of thing. Mr. Brown, please. Can uh, fit in with uh, Dr. Strauss's stress on the simultaneity of thing production and myth production in German ideology as indicating that Marx conceived of, uh, of uh, some kind of human essence as separate from uh, animal essence? Well, I think I know the answer, but your question is essentially directed to Dr. Strauss, so... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would put it this way, he would have to understand that the human essence is the essence of the human. In other words, there was a stage in which all... In, I mean, uh, let me make a distinction about the distinction between understanding and industry. We are not concerned with the digestive system. Yeah. The digestive system as such. So, for example, the instinctive self preservation. Every dog, every cat has this very plan. Yeah? And it has means appropriation in all cases yeah? of bones, whatever they need. Uh, good. And uh, their bones are absolutely under the pressure of some of the self preservation. Now, from a certain moment on, Projecting, conscious projecting existence. In this moment, production becomes exclusively human. And in the time of your question now, which includes your question from the time ago, in that moment in which man is capable to project his imagination, say, uh, a cave even, which he wants to build. In that moment, there is no reason why he should not be equally able to figure out something atrocious and primitive or whatever, but still do something which no other animal can do about the world, about where people go after their death. And so that the latter should be a replica of the former, you know, that he, I mean, they say that if he is a nomad, he will have this notion of what that, that means. And if he is a farmer, he will have that notion of what that means. It's, of course, a mere assertion. That is, would be my answer to the question. If there may be a stage when man was subhuman, Marx says so here, and he needs to be so started, but of course, in Marx's time, Darwin uh, had already uh, made this a very popular view, at least among the more uh, up to date men, among whom are certain uh, So that men were subhuman. 
as a return model, model content can be human in the sense of doing things which are exclusively human. And in that moment, there is no reason why this production from that moment on was not co-evil with his imaginations about the whole. And that issue is never met. Now. Never met. I mean, the, 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 what one can and the proofs which are given for the primacy of the and the authoritative character of the substructure are not proofs. But they are they are, just, they are not real proofs. And uh, they, this difficulty is of course conceived by uh, the Marxist uh, trivialization. And by saying, of course, there is also an effect of the superstructure, of the infrastructure. But we are not concerned with this name and mission. We are not concerned with what right do you call that uh, the infrastructure and the other superstructure. You know, yes. I don't know whether. Uh, to the Mr. Brown's question answered. Uh, now, it does raise a terrific question as to how Marx, uh, how Marx could possibly uh, continue to live with these various constructions of man's, uh, the historical in man and what isn't historical and what guides the historical and so on. It's a very hard thing to understand, and I believe yeah, much of it depends on assertions, uh, on, on their assertions. The necessity of the progress of the argument is not self-evident, let me put it that way, the, the real necessity. In the case of Hegel, there was a terrific effort to make the, the argument necessary under the, under the light of the necessity of that to which the argument addressed itself. So the necessity was not only present in the exterior, but also in the, in the reasoning. But I think Marx simply was not able to rise to that height. And uh, the necessity is not so visible, and I believe that's... Uh, maybe a part of what Dr. Strauss means by saying it's merely assertoric. And uh, at least I don't see the, the proof uh, either on, uh, on most of these points. The, the labor theory of value I pointed out to you earlier, in a way, rests on a very brief assertion. This whole structure we're talking about, that could be thought of like a pyramid standing on a, on a point. And uh, a little push would be enough to make it wobble, to say the least. But uh, never mind. Now, now, Marx goes on to speak of the process of labor as being essentially man plus nature. And this has a very important bearing, which doesn't emerge right away. Uh, I mean, literally, in any sense, right away. Only later on, you look back and you see how carefully he prepared his argument. The idea that there is nothing in the productive process except man and nature could be said to exclude, if you think about it, the artifacts. Now, the artifacts, in other words, don't have a separate or an independent status. And that's what he means to work up to. The artifacts are, in other words, nothing but another form of labor. There is not, in other words, as the conventional economists say, land, labor, and capital. They describe the factors of production in these terms and assign to them all equal status in the process of production. Marx is preparing at this point for the subtraction of C, of constant capital, from the equation for the generation of the value of the commodities. It begins this far back, at least, you can find the begin, back the precise beginning, when he says that the, the real factors of production are uh, man and nature and not capital at all, with the understanding that capital is simply a, an expression of human labor. Now, it's in this connection that he makes the the remark on the top of page 205 about the exchange of matter between men and nature that Dr. Strauss already referred to. It begins on 204. The labor process resolved as above into its simple elementary factors is human action with a view to the production of use values. Appropriation of natural substances to human requirements. It is the necessary condition for effecting exchange of matter between man and nature. It is the everlasting nature-imposed condition of human existence and therefore is independent of every social phase of that existence, or rather is common to every such phase. And then a little bit later on, man and his labor on one side, nature and its materials on the other sufficed. And that's what he means would be, generally speaking, true of all social conditions. And meaning by that, of course, to imply 
that uh, capitalistic mode of production introduced what could be called as an irrelevancy. It couldn't be helped. There was no way to avoid it historically. It had to be. But for the same reason that it had to be, it had to be superseded, or will have to be superseded. And that is the injection of the idea that artifacts have a self-subsistent character, and that capital, in other words, is in the real process of production itself contributory and hence deserving of a reward, as ordinary economics would assert it. And he says no. And in a way, his whole argument in this part, and a lot of the whole book, is to show why that isn't true. Uh, to show that the real process of production can only be understood if you suppose all value to emanate from uh, labor. And artifacts, I repeat, for the tenth time, are only a kind of expression of human labor. And if you take them to be anything else, you're simply thrown off. That's all misled. Then, on pages 201 and 211, there are uh, some remarks about this uh, importance of labor in creating value, which I would call to your attention. They're just in the middle of page 201, at the, the last, two sen uh, last sen uh, sentence but one in the first complete paragraph on the page. The paragraph begins in the labor process, therefore, and the sentence that I uh, call your attention to is, that which in the laborer appeared as movement now appears in the product as a fixed quality without motion. It's one of a number of passages, a more or less comprehensive list of which I'll supply on request, in which the, uh, the point is made of labor being reducible to matter in motion with a transfer of the motion to the object, and that is the underlying character of the process of production. The other passage is on page 211, the beginning of the uh, first complete paragraph on the page. While the laborer is at work, his labor constantly undergoes a transformation. From being motion, it becomes an object without motion. From being the laborer working, it becomes the thing produced. So that motion and the labor working, as you can see, are uh, the, the two parallel terms in the analogy. And I think this can be drawn out at more length than it would pay us to try to do. So we could say this uh, general teaching, therefore, labor is the concretization or immobilization of motion in a product. And now, in the next section of this chapter, Marx goes on to speak about the production of surplus value. What is it that actually happens in the course of the productive process? And for the purpose of explaining the generation of surplus value, i.e. profit, he speaks on page 207 of the fundamental duality of the process of production under conditions of capitalism, at least under conditions of capitalism. Beginning of the first paragraph, our capitalist has two objects in view. In the first place, he wants to produce a use value that has a value in exchange, that is to say, an article destined to be sold, a commodity. And secondly, he desires to produce a commodity whose value shall be greater than the sum of the values of the commodities used in its production, that is, of the means of production and the labor power that he purchased with his good money in the open market. Now, at the bottom of the next paragraph, just as commodities are at the same time use values and values, so the process of producing them must be a labor process and at the same time a process of creating value. I, I am at what you might regard as painful length in pointing these things out because the language that Marx uses occasionally sounds like double talk, like a mere repetition of the same words in another order, and it becomes confusing. But he is perfectly clear all the time, as far as I'm able to understand it, and there is no mixing up. It, you have to keep straight the difference between uh, use value and value, and value and its relation to exchange value all the time, and you must equally keep in mind the difference between labor power and labor, and the value of labor power as already defined, as distinguished from the value of the object of labor, that which labor turns out in the course of a working day. If those little details, I, I grant they're very petty and so on, but if they're not kept clear, there's no way to understand how he develops his argument. Now, so here he begins the, the discussion of the labor process as being essentially dual, 
in its character, and that is carried through this entire part with a large number of uh, accretions, but there's a, a line that runs right through down the middle of his whole discussion, and everything falls on one side or the other, all the way down, beginning with this uh, distinction between uh, the production of use values and the production of values. The duality is very carefully preserved, and it culminates in the distinction between constant and variable capital. What begins here ends there, a uh, hundred or so pages later on. It's very uh, carefully developed by Marx. Then he has this example on page 208, which I won't read to you, but I recommend to you. <clears throat> the example of the spinning of the yarn and uh, the raw material and the transfer of some value and the uh, production of other, but we'll go into that in detail in the longer illustration that will soon come up. Now, so then the distinction begins with the direction of the labor uh, process between the production of use value and the production of value. The production of use value is connected with one characteristic of the working, the labor process. The production of value is connected with another characteristic of the labor process. The labor process has these two qualities or two characteristics. One, the working of this man, this given man, you're looking at some worker. It has to be thought of as being A, the work of a spinner, or the work of a shoemaker, or the work of a carpenter. He, he's this kind of worker, and it's different from all other kinds. That's number one. But in the second place, you have to look at him and re realize what he's doing is putting out energy, motion, and transforming matter. And from that point of view, it doesn't make any difference whether he's a shoemaker or a, a spinner or a hat maker. That's the aspect that any man's work has of being like every other man's work. It's the homogeneous or undifferentiated labor. Uh, that's simple enough, I believe. It's clear. Every man's work has that character, this duality. It's specific, and it's also undifferentiated. Now, from this, a lot follows, and one has to keep one's eye on the ball. Now, this specific labor, this character of the, the spinner as spinner, that uh, Marx relates to the quality of the working of this man. The undifferentiated labor, homogeneous human labor, that is relatable to the quantity of the work, not the quality of the work, but the quantity of the time spent and of the amount of motion which is possible to enclose in that time. Now, this labor considered as qualitative, as qualitatively different, that is done for the sake of the end and aim. That is oriented towards the production of utilities, use values. The labor regarded as homogeneous, or undifferentiated, and viewable as being measured by quantity and time and motion and so on, that is what is for the sake of profit, not for the sake of, uh, of utility. That is what leads to the generation of commodities as commodities. Now, at this point, Marx breaks the argument and starts a new chapter called Constant Capital and Variable Capital. And he does that for a certain reason which will soon emerge. When we consider the argument now as if it were unaffected by the chapter heading, we could put it this way. This duality of the labor process, starting with use value side and a value or exchange value side, that leads down to this question with respect to the solution of the primary problem. I repeat, that uh, establishment of the duality leads down to the following speculation with respect to the primary problem. The primary problem being, where does the delta M originate in the sequence M, C, M prime, with M prime equaling M plus delta M? Remember, that's our object. Where does the delta M come from? And that chain of reasoning down to the present, beginning with the duality of the labor process, leads to this consideration on the part of Marx. In one of its aspects, the labor process leads to a mere transfer of value uh, from things already in existence. And But in another aspect of its working, 
the labor process leads to the coming to be of a, an increment of value. And so you see right away that's going to have something to do with the solution of this problem. I repeat, the labor process has this dual character. In one of its aspects, it simply transfers or preserves value, carries it over from previous time. We'll be more specific later on. But in another one of its aspects, it causes the coming to be of increments of value. Now we have to make this development. It is in its character of specific labor as oriented towards use value that it does nothing but carry forward the incorporations of value already present. But it's in its character as homogeneous or undifferentiated labor that labor has the value adding potentiality. The duality uh, asserted by Marx at the beginning now begins to bear visible fruit. You see? Now, in what way does he carry this distinction forward another stage? He says, if we look at this C, this, uh, now I have to explain something to you which is purely petty. Money is capital. That's Marx's assertion. It's represented by the letter M down to this point. But from this point on, capital has an initial in its own right, and that unhappily is the same one that used to stand for the commodity in the re repetitive sequence. So from now on, when we say C, big C, we mean capital. It's no longer commodity. We have to drop that out. He does the same thing with respect to uh, necessary labor. Up to a certain point, necessary labor means how much labor is socially necessary to produce a given commodity under the present circumstances of production. From a certain point on, necessary labor means that amount of labor which must be uh, given over to the production of the working man's necessities. Marx says he's doing this, and he says that it's childish to object to it, and it would be, but you have to remember that he, he did it. Now, uh, so from, at this point, we're now going to use the letter C as he does henceforth to mean capital, which is the same thing as the M in the previous formulation. He is now about to tell us that this capital has to be understood as having two components. That capital consists, as Mr. Nelson adequately said, and I won't repeat it, of a constant portion and a variable portion. So the total of capital equals the a C plus V. Now, we could reformulate the original problem as follows. How does C become transformed into C prime? That is to say, where, what's the character of the increment in value? Mark says, the capital consists of an expenditure by the entrepreneur, the capitalist, on some means of production. And then it also consists of another part with which that man pays the wages of labor. That's all he, that's the only, the only two possibilities, all he can do. Now, if we bear in mind the things that have already been said about where the value originates, what is the source of value, i.e. in labor, it turns out it's perfectly clear the increment must have something to do with the V, the variable capital part, because we've already shown how surplus value can come into being, we've already shown that there is a difference between the value of the labor power and the value of the output of the working man during the whole day. Do you remember? If the working man can work for 12 hours <coughs> on the basis of, or supported by an intake of material which it takes only six hours to produce, and he has to be paid for 12 hours, only the value of six hours worth of output, then, then the problem is in principle over the solved. The man who buys his commodity, labor power, gets the whole output very well. So now then, apparently, all we have to do is pay attention to things we've already learned. V is the amount of money that a capitalist spends on labor power. That's by definition. That's not analysis. That's an assertion. All right, so now it must be from that, that portion that the 
excess of uh, C prime over C arises. That is Marx's uh, allegation. I mean, I, I, I foreshortened this considerably. His uh, account is much more de full and detailed and so on and so forth, but this is the, the mere summary. Now, then the duality of the labor process finds an expression in the distinction that Marx makes between the two kinds of capital. Constant, called so because it leads to no increment in value, and variable for the reason that it does lead to an increment in value. All right? But then we could say, that solves the question. Why is C prime greater than C? C prime is equal to C plus the increment, which is, from now on, what we'll call S, plus surplus value. Or in its expanded form, C prime equals C plus B, which we have to begin with, plus S. You'll find that expression strewn liberally throughout the pages of the portion of that's kind of tone. All right, so now, is this much clear so far? It's just factual, I mean, a statement of what Marx said. All right, that's where the surplus value comes from, from the expenditure of some part, from the transformation of this money into capital. Meaning by that, the purchase of labor power and its application to the means of production. The means of production being totally inert and they don't contribute a thing, except the opportunity for the labor power to be employed. By the employment of the labor power, on the inert mass, the living uh, augmentation is generated. Mr. McLean? I don't quite see your identification of use value with constant capital and value with variable capital. You may try, try to look at that. Well, that identification was more or less along the way, but let me put it this way. He says, why is a spinner able to make the yarn? How, how can he make the yarn? Well, it, you have to uh, combine a spinner with a certain kind of machinery, with spindles. If you combine the, the spinner with cobbling machinery, you could make the yarn. So there is something specific there about this man's working in combination with that kind of machinery. I'm saying when you, when you buy a, uh, a man's work, you have to buy the kind of work that that man can generate. What he does in consequence of being that kind of man, i.e. a spinner, is to make use values. You see? That's, that's all on this side. Now, two other points. When he tries to get the, the benefit of the assertion that the constant capital really contributes nothing to the output, qualitatively it con contributes a great deal, but quantitatively it doesn't contribute anything. When he tries to get the benefit of that, he does it by setting little c equal to zero. And then he, he says, let us now consider henceforth not the whole value of the, of the product. The whole value of the product is equal to C plus B plus S, the whole value. But he said, that's not interesting. Let's consider hereafter only the increase in the value. Let's talk, in other words, about B plus S. And he said the arithmetical reason for doing that is that the C would be the same quantity on both sides. So what you would be doing would be subtracting C plus B from C plus B plus S uh, C plus B. And you'll get that, uh, that difference. And he said, now in fact, why don't we just write that off because it's going to appear on both sides. Uh, somebody might get the idea, why don't we also uh, draw a line through the V, which also appears on both sides. But then Marx would uh, reply to that, <clears throat> you can't do that, because if you do that, you can't figure out the rate of exploitation of the working class, which is given by two ratios, one of which I'll deal with now. It's called the rate of surplus value. It's a simple comparison of the amount of surplus value 
with the amount of the variable capital that led to it uh, coming into being. And Marx's examples all tend to run in the neighborhood of 100% somehow or other. I mean, it's a very impressive rate of profit. Uh, naturally, his point is, <coughs> if you were to take the amount of surplus value and compare it only with, and compare it with the sum of C plus B, it's perfectly obvious that percentage would go down a great deal. That's what the capitalist, the, uh, uh, the sycophants of the bourgeoisie, uh, suggest always that we do in their, their trashy books on economics, that, uh, that we should take the rate of the surplus value and compare it with the whole investment. But he says, no, that, that doesn't uh, make any sense because this doesn't add anything. And then moreover, which is really the point of it, if you apply the surplus value to the whole investment, then you are not giving its due weight to the fact that capital doesn't deserve a return. He, he never puts it in so many words, but it's perfectly clear that that's what it comes to. There is no reason for rewarding capital. The constant part, I mean to say, doesn't do anything. It simply passes out of the inert state into the, into the product, unchanged. And to pay attention to that would be to, in the first place, to misunderstand the labor process, but in the second place, to draw altogether unwarranted conclusions with respect to the justice of the distributive order, which obviously he has some has in mind. Now, this, in turn, uh, leads to other things which are more interesting. Before we come to the most interesting other things, let me uh, call to your attention footnote one at the bottom of page 239. Now we get into the into the other chapter called the rate of surplus value, chapter nine. Footnote one, he says, what Lucretius says is self-evident. Nothing can be created from nothing. Out of nothing, any chance, not out of nothing, nothing can be created. Creation of value is transformation of labor power into labor. Labor power itself is energy transferred to a human organism by means of nourishing matter, which is I think about as close to the to the reduction of the labor process to uh, even the, what he takes to be a traditional uh, materialist basis as uh, he tries to do in any passage that I know about, uh, anyhow. I believe he wrote his doctoral dissertation on uh, Democritus and uh, Lucretius. Epicurus, right, yes. Um, but uh, he knew that old literature very, very well, I'm sure. And this, uh, his own formulation simply reminded him of that, or vice versa. Now, in any case, as he goes on to consider the consequences of his analysis to this point, he makes the distinction between necessary labor and surplus labor. And as to that, I won't dwell on it. Necessary labor is so much of the labor day, of the working day, as must go into the production of the necessities. Surplus labor is the remaining part of the working day. And Marx's conclusion is that the ratio of the surplus value to the variable capital is equal to the ratio of the surplus labor to the necessary labor. All right, so then you have the two the alternative ways of putting it. Now, this leads up to something that Marx does a great deal with later on. Uh, an equating of the, the times, the times and the sums, the times involved and the sums of money which are involved, which we'll come to after a while. And now in, he makes in passing this observation on page 241, that's about the eighth line down from the top of the page. The essential difference between the various economic forms of society between, for instance, a society based on slave labor and one based on wage labor, lies only in the mode in which this surplus labor is in each case is extracted from the actual producer, the laborer. That is, simply makes a bit more concrete for you what he means when he says that the process of production is decisive with respect to the, the social form. Then if, if you take this ratio of S over V, or surplus labor over necessary labor, you get the rate of exploitation of the, the working class by the bourgeoisie or whatever other oppressive 
gang it happens, happens to be. Now, on page 244 in the note, Marx makes a reference to what has come to be called the transformation problem, which I've referred to here a number of times. And I, and I direct your attention to the note so that nobody should possibly think that Marx was trying to fudge on this question. He knew that there was a difficulty, and he didn't try to avoid it at all. And he says here, the calculations given in the text, that's a misprint, obviously, are intended merely as illustrations. We have, in fact, assumed that prices equal values. We shall, however, see in volume three that even in the case of average prices, the assumption cannot be made in this very simple manner. <clears throat> so what he meant was he, he will show how the thing can be worked out properly in volume three, but he, as you know, he didn't live uh, uh, sufficiently long to finish that, and so volume three consists of materials put together by Engels for Marx, and then there's a whole long question, not only as to whether Marx could have done it, but as to whether any human being could do it, because there's a question as to whether it's intrinsically possible. And then we come back to the question, as I left it with you at the beginning of the hour, Sweezy, competent man, asserts that everything turns on the organic composition of capital in the gold-producing industry. And that's not uh, exciting. <clears throat> now, now he gives a very long illustration, beginning uh, in, in section two of this chapter, which it would be very good for us to consider. <clears throat> he knows how difficult this is, and therefore he was very careful to spell it all out, and he even gives little exercises to the reader. and says, try this to see whether you know how to do my method. And it's a good thing to do that if you have the fortitude. Now, I'll only give you a very quick intimation of how he means to proceed. Okay. And uh, I think everybody who can follow it through will gain from it. What he does is that we take this simple example of a, a spinning process. And I would suggest that we look at it this way. Let's suppose that time increases in the downward direction. This is like, a, a, in an effect, if any of you know anything about this kind of representation, it's like an inverted diagram. And I put one of the axes, well, well there's two axes, but I won't label them as such. Now, up in here, there is cotton, let's say, which occupies part of this hopper like thing. Suppose that this is the cross section of a, of a funnel. And, and there is a kind of partition in here, and there is spindle on the other side. Right, so those are the two things in the top of this funnel, and he has values for them. The cotton is worth 20 shillings. There are 20 pounds of cotton. This is raw cotton. And the spindle is worth four shillings. And the working day is 12 hours. So from here to here is 12. And if, if we were, now uh, that's, that's six hours down to there. Right. Now, in addition to this, there is a, another little extension on this tubular funnel-like arrangement. And that's labor. <clears throat> Now, what happens is that these, this partition has to be regarded as having holes in it or something like that so that the two can mix down inside there. But the whole dimension of this uh, tool across here now can be thought of as being equal to the value of the product. What happens? In one, let's, let's say I've got now roughly uh, equal the partitions here. Each one of these corresponds to one hour. By the end of the first hour, a certain part of that cotton has fallen down in there, and a certain part of that spindle also has, so to speak, fallen down in there, and a certain amount of labor has come together. 
output. And now all you have to do is to know the wage per hour and the number of hours over which this 20 shillings worth of cotton and 4 shillings worth of spindle will be consumed. And you can figure out what happens. Now, on account of the spindle and the cotton together, there's obviously a, a transfer of 2 shillings of value. See, because the 24 will be spread out over the 12 hours. So in each one of the 12 hours, it will be 1 12th of the 24 shillings total. That's going to be 2 shillings on account of the spindle and the cotton in the first hour. Now, what about the, the labor element? Marx asserts, to, to take the, for the example, 3 shillings will be the wages of labor for a day. of three shillings per hour, or one-fourth of a shilling. Right. Now, I, the English probably have some. Yes, yes, three pence. But I'm going to call it one-fourth, partly because it's more simple, but partly because the fraction is easier for arithmetic. So uh, there should now be, on account of uh, labor, an addition of one-fourth of a shilling so that this ought to be equal, but I'm, I'm only saying ought to be equal, to a total value of two and a quarter. Now it turns out that's not the case at all. Because when you, can, when you add up all the 20 pounds of yarn that will be made from the 20 pounds of cotton, see we're assuming no waste, 20 pounds of gin cotton goes into 20 pounds of the twisted cotton, that's all the transformation. But when you find out the price of it, it's 30 shillings at the end. Now that means that the 20 pounds get transformed into 30 shillings worth of yarn. And over 12 hours, that becomes quite clear. That must be uh, two and a half, not two and a quarter shillings per hour. So it's two and a half shillings times 12 hours would give us the 30 shillings equal to the whole value at the end. Now, what's the matter? We don't have any, uh, uh, do we have any other source of value here? Because so far, we've only been able to extract two shillings on account of the materials and another quarter of a shilling on account of the labor. And now, there wouldn't be any profit in that, and the, and the value wouldn't come out to be 30, it would come out to be 27. Now, but this Marx has the following explanation. He says the necessary labor is six hours during the day, down to here, necessary. What about the labor for the rest of the day? That's all surplus. Now you can look at it either way. You can think of all the necessary labor being blended up here, and then all the surplus labor down here, that's going to be unpaid for altogether. So from here on, you'll have nothing but two shillings is, excuse me. But nevertheless, the value is going to be two and a quarter. Because every hour of labor has that, that value equal to one twelfth of three shillings worth. So you can look at it either way. You'll have 12 hours of labor performed. And these uh, increments of labor are going to be applied all the time. Either you can think of them as being paid for in one part of the day and unpaid for in the other part of the day. Or, and this is what I would suggest to you, you make the division down vertically, like this. The hour of labor that the man gets, the capitalist gets, he really pays for as if it were a half an hour. That follows directly from the fact that he gets a whole day's worth of labor, but pays for it only as if it were a half a day. That's all he has to pay him money for it. So the value is increased by another quarter of a shilling on account of surplus labor. And then we could think of each hour of labor rather than the whole day. 
each hour being divided between necessary, which is paid for, and surplus, which isn't paid for, and the both together is the increment in value. That's where the increment in value comes from. Now, if you want to know where is the surplus value, the surplus value is all of this, which adds up to three shillings, which is Marx's calculation. That's how it started out, that there's three shillings of profit. That he had to pay 24 shillings, he had 20 shillings for the cotton, four shillings for the spindle, Yeah. 
asked for the mass of surplus value, or what we could say is the aggregate profit or absolute profit. S over V is either the ratio of the surplus value to the variable capital, or to put it more compactly, the rate of surplus value. And V, capital V, is the amount of the variable capital once more. So that it simply uh, said, you could say, if the rate of surplus value were 100%, and the amount of variable capital were $1,000, then obviously the whole amount of the profit, the mass of the profit, would be equal to $1,000, using the rate in its form as an absolute number for the purpose of the arithmetic operation. Now, however, if one uh, looks at the, the formula in its original form, it is obviously the barest of tautologies. That is to say, S over V times V, of course, equals S. If you do what children in the olden time were taught to do in the third grade, anyhow. And so then you're, you're left with this simple, more or less repetitive statement. Now, the fact that it has this uh, arithmetically trivial character shouldn't mislead anybody as to the substantive importance of it. It has a great deal to do with what follows. And the more uh, useful expression of the content of that first formula is given in the second way of putting it. Now, once more, a prime over a, to take the middle term first, equals the ratio of surplus labor to necessary labor. All right, and that we saw from previous work is, is equal to the rate of a surplus value. Let's represent this by a single symbol. Call it rho, or rate. Now, P and N taken together refer to the labor power being employed. N is the number of labor powers being employed. That is to say, the number of units of labor time, of undifferentiated labor, being put to work by the entrepreneur. And P is the value of one labor power. So that if the number of labor powers, well, let's say 500, and the value per labor power were $2, that would be $1,000. That obviously is the same thing as V, variable capital. Right. So in other words, V in the first formulation could be replaced by N times P. Is that all right so far? Now moreover, A prime over A, we have seen from previous work, is equal to S over V. So that A prime over A replaces S over V in the previous formulation. Right? And then we have those two terms being equivalent to each other. So that the second one, P times A prime over A times N, if you reorder the terms and put the P and the N next to each other, N times P equals the value of the labor power or is equal to the variable capital. Now, why does Marx do this? Let's rearrange the expression on the second line once more. If we were to put all of the numerated terms together, that is to say, regard P as P over 1 and N as N over 1, and reorder them, then we would have A prime times P times N over A. And then we could say the mass of surplus value varies directly with this product, A prime P, and inversely with A. Or, even more uh, simply, S varies directly with any one of these, all the others remaining constant. It varies directly with any one term of the three terms in the numerator and inversely with the one term in the denominator. Or, alternatively, 
if we now replace a prime over a over a by some symbol rho, we come to a, an almost final statement of this. The surplus value, the mass of surplus value, is a function of rate of surplus value or the ratio of surplus uh, to necessary labor and of the value of a labor power and of the number of labor powers or finally rho b the rate of surplus value and the variable capital so we're back in effect where we started from now if there should by some chance turn out to be something in the process of production under capitalism that inevitably causes one of these to go one direction and the other to go the other direction all the time. You can't help it, suppose. That would lead to what some people would call a problem, what, what Marx would call a contradiction or an antagonism. And then the resolution of that antagonism have some importance for the prospects and the future of capitalism. How to work out such a tendency, as is implicit in the fact that that on which surplus value depends directly is split down the middle and tends to go two ways at once because of one single kind of deed done by capitalists inevitably. That would lead to some uh, interesting consequences. If capitalists are always having their eye on S, on the mass of surplus value, then they must do those things which tend to increase it. But S is a function of rho and V. Therefore, to increase S, you must operate on rho and V. But the same thing, the one thing that the capitalists must do in order to operate on rho and V leads rho in one direction and v in another direction, suppose. Then how would they solve their problem? And maybe the ultimate solution of that problem would lead to some transformation in the underlying conditions of capitalism and possibly even to its ultimate extension. Now, in order to work out this difficulty, Marx has written the next part of the book. Uh, the next part of the book would be the evolution of the factory system and machinery. That has not only the very uh, tremendous social consequences that Marx was talking about, but it also has some technical economic consequences uh, indicated in this formulation. Is this all right? Now, if one has this reasonably well in mind, the three laws that Marx asserts about the rate and mass of surplus value follow as, uh, uh, quote, verbalizations of these symbolically expressed facts. See, now, the first law, the mass of the surplus value produced is equal to the amount of the variable capital advanced multiplied by the rate of surplus value. That's hardly, a, that's nothing different. That's only this. That's on the top of page 332. Then he shows how uh, in the, let's see, the last paragraph, which is begun on page 332, at the beginning of the paragraph, he says, in the production of a definite mass of surplus value, therefore, the decrease of one factor may be compensated by the increase of the other. That I have put in the form, the surplus value varies inversely with some things and uh, directly with other things. Right, that means... Some have to be increased and others decreased in order to make the quantity grow. So on that, it simply is an expression of what's uh, already present. Now on, on page 334, there is a second law that the top line and following. The absolute limit of the average working day, this being by nature always less than 24 hours, sets an absolute limit to the compensation of a reduction of variable capital by a higher rate of surplus value or of the decrease of the number of laborers exploited by a higher degree of exploitation of labor power. In other words, we can go a certain distance in the reduction of n times p by the increase of rho, like over here. If rho v is what you have in mind, rho is a prime over a. If v decreases, you can make it up with an increase in rho. 
but you can't do that indefinitely because rho has a value which is limited by the absolute length of the natural day. And so beyond a certain portion of that working day, you can't, of that natural day, you can't go in putting men to work. See, that means that decreases in V cannot be made up indefinitely by increases in rho. A prime over A, right? Incidentally, how could you, how could you make a decrease in V? How could you compensate for a decrease in V by an increase in rho? If rho is A prime over A, it varies directly with A prime and inversely with A once more. So to make rho increase means to make the numerator A prime increase. Now, can you keep doing in a or, or A decrease? Yeah. Now, what are the limits to doing that? Well, A is limited by... Uh, the 24 hours figures in the... In the yeah, the 24 the hours, that's the absolute limit to how much you can make that ratio go up, see, by increasing the numerator. Yeah, that's or, right. or, or decreasing the... Um, say, for 20, 12 hours, right by... Um, six by 6 hours or something like that. Yes, so this ratio, A prime over A, is affected by, or in fact is a sort of index of the productivity of labor, i.e., by reducing the portion of the day which is necessary, see, you correspondingly increase the proportion which is surplus. And how far can you go in reducing the portion of the day which is necessary? And why, how do you do it? The answer, generally speaking, Machinery. I simplify it a bit. And more machinery. What does that mean with respect to the formulations we've already had about the sum of capital being the sum of constant and variable? With less than the amount of variable. Exactly. So, so this then, in other words, de decreases. Let's say B approaches zero. I put B is the part of the investment that leads to surplus value, that leads to profit. So exactly as the entrepreneurs, capitalists, try to increase the productivity of labor by more investment in machinery, they must necessarily reduce their investment in that living or self-magnifying part of their wealth. And that's what leads to this contradiction. And so then they go faster and faster and faster, trying to make up for the decrease in one by the increase in the other, but that's limited. You can't do it indefinitely. And then that, that in turn leads to the expansion of the markets internationally, colonialism, imperialism, crises, immigration, pauperization, everything else, and uh, the collapse eventually. That from the purely technical side. All right, so this formula is by no means a little uh, uh, afterthought on Marx's side, but it has very much to do with the course of the argument, and that's why I spend this much time on it. Now, the third law is at the bottom of page 334, and is also on 335 expressed two ways. With a given rate of surplus value and a given value of labor power, therefore, the masses of surplus value produced vary directly as the amounts of variable capitals advanced. Right, that we've already elaborated, and that finds a different expression on page 335. The masses of value and of surplus value produced by different capitals vary directly as the amounts of the variable constituents of these capitals, i.e. as their constituents transformed into living labor power. That means the, the variable capital once more. So when you take all these together, you, you get the basis for the, the inner contradictions in capitalist technology. The question is more complicated than what I have led you to believe, but we simply don't have time to go into it because coming after this is an absolutely elephantine subject with enormous difficulties and complications, and we can't spend the time. At this point, if Mr. Steintrager would be so good as to read his paper, but what uh, would this proviso, if Dr. Strauss has anything no. that, to this point, uh, please. Yeah, well, that was very good, Mr. Steintrager. You had a very, very difficult task that was a very long text and uh, it was very well presented.
uh, let me ask you a few things. When he speaks of cooperation and manufacture, what does he mean by those terms? Cooperation in manufacture? No, and co what, what, what does he mean by cooperation and what does he mean by manufacture? Initially, it's simply just people working together in the same building, although it turns out to be something more that is their labor becomes interdependent on yeah, it's, a, it's an early stage of uh, common productive activity. He it says it's simply a quantitative increase over the, over the old uh, handicraft. To some extent, yes. It's a, it, having five men plow five acres instead of one man plowing one acre at a time or something like that, something like this. Who's that example? Bert. Yeah, the, uh, the, the, the well-known sophist and sycophant of Bert. Uh, and what about manufacturing? Manufacturing is when this cooperation initially is simply increased production due to cooperation to gathering together people in the same building. I think then it takes on its characteristic as the radicalization of the provision of labor, at least the beginning of that breaking down of each task into parts so that productivity is increased by greater skill. Yeah, well, the reason that I ask the question is that the word is a bit misleading because now, for example, what we ordinarily speak of as manufacture is what he later on calls modern industry, and there's no, no distinction. But I think that he was simply using the term more literally. The, the first part of that word manufacture is from a root meaning hand. And that's what he was thinking. I don't know what the German word is that he was translating as manufacture. Did he? was the same word. Well, then the, the point there is a bit uh, strengthened even. It, he's talking about a succession of productive forms which lead up through the increasing use of machinery and the radicalization of the division of labor according to some scheme in the course of which the skills of men degenerate and the human activities are increasingly appropriated by Mechanisms. At least in one sense, the skills were first increased. Okay? That is, the skill uh, on this detail, in the most general sense, the skills decrease. But don't the skills initially increase? Well, I don't think so. He, uh, <clears throat> he describes this process as starting with a certain human material instead to begin with. But this is how the, the process of production increases, my understanding, is that this particular worker learns how to perform this function with his hands better. And in that sense, the skill increases. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah, that, they, that the division of labor has exactly the consequences that Smith and others spoke about. And, and incidentally, you might know or be interested in knowing that Marx's description of the effects of division of labor could be almost a copy almost in some places verbatim uh, from uh, the Wealth of Nations. Where he it, says to me, I mentioned this little historical book, that Smith himself naturalized that from someone else. Well, uh, sure. Uh, apparently, this was uh, an intolerable literary situation that existed in, in, uh, in Germany, at least at that time. And uh, pettiness was rampant, in addition to some other very admirable qualities. And apparently they, they constantly accused each other of all these things in a low spirit of controversy. Now, for example, Marx in a note calls Malthus a great plagiarist, a crook in effect, who simply took everything, the whole theory of population is just lifted from somebody else. He doesn't say from whom, but I guess he took it for granted. Everybody must know that the theory of population was well developed before Malthus. Well, as a matter of fact, it, plenty of people had speculated on on uh, problems of population. But people nowadays tend to say very much the same kind of thing about Marx without the animus. If you speak to any economist, they'll tell you the labor theory of value that long antedates Marx, the principles of uh, division of labor that he could have got from any number of people and so on and so forth. That has nothing whatever to do with the value of the final formulation. And it would be wrong to call Marx a plagiarist because the elements of his work to a large extent existed elsewhere, but that's not terribly interesting. The fact of the matter is that Marx does admit that there must be an increase in productivity through division of labor, and that's another one of these contradictions, so to speak. It has its good, and it comes at a price, and then history, so to speak, is the resolution of that and many other complications. At one point, Mr. Steintrager, if I heard you correctly, 
you will reverse the order of surplus and necessary labor in the, in the declar in the statement of the variables in the ratio. But you might look it up just to, uh, it's uh, surplus to necessary rather than vice versa. But that's now he does not Marx does not speak about the abolition of the division of labor in this coming society. He speaks about the abolition of the whole division of labor. He doesn't stress that, it's true, but it's there. Now, what he means apparently is that there will still be different inclinations, different talents and aptitudes, and he says uh, elsewhere at greater length that people will continue to be different. And it's only this corrupt kind of communism, this early communism, uh, which looks to some doctrinary egalitarianism of everything on all hands and so on and so forth. He says, no, that, that won't be. But you're correct in saying that he is not very clear as to what kind of division of labor there will ensue. That's why yeah, except for the fact that he has a, a very interesting illustrative footnote about a French artisan who went into the American West around that time and who was a type setter or typographer of some kind. And he couldn't find work as a typographer, and then he, he, he worked at various other things. He, he uh, mined gold, and he was a plumber, and lots of other things. And then he said, in a, recounting his experiences later on, that for the first time he really felt like a man, that he realized he could do all kinds of things, not only this one little job. And it made him feel confident, which is absolutely sound. I'm sure that if, if one realizes that he can do certain things which he never tried to do and never achieved before, of course there is a sense of satisfaction that comes from it. As to whether this purely private fact can ever become the basis for the solution of the problem of society and technology, that's another question. Because the mere demand of efficiency might impose certain things on men, which Marx would call contradictions, and which he might therefore say necessarily have a resolution, therefore, but which other people would say are not contradictions in this systemic sense, but they are certain irreducible problems about human beings and there is no resolution of them. I mean, you can shift it around and cause one side rather than the other to be emphasized in this air of conflicting claims. But the conflict of the claims must remain as long as human beings are not omniscient, omnipotent, immortal, uh, and everything else. <laughs> if I understood you correctly, you suggest that efficiency might lead to making it necessary for the individual labor to continue to happen. I wonder whether Marx would have an answer to that, though, by the increased production, and with the increased distribution of wealth, this would, I mean, efficiency would become a consideration. Yeah, but I would ask you for a moment to consider what would be the, the effective basis of that in a vast standard of living, if not effective working on the part of men. If you have a man who says, I would like to be a, a lathe operator, and uh, that means very, very careful machinist work, which takes a long time to develop, incidentally, one should mention. And would uh, they throw this typographer out instantly if he came to such a plan and said, I've been a typographer and a plumber and, uh, and several other things now, and now I would like to turn my hand at, at the machine work. And they'd say, that's interesting. But uh, this requires, how do you know you can do it, for instance, that kind of thing. And he'd say, well, well let me try anyhow. And then he would spoil innumerable items without any doubt. Uh, in the course of his, his learning. So then Marx would say, all right, but still, then you don't have to put him to work in the plant right away. Send him to school for a while. Wherever he wants to go to school, let him. And so then you can imagine there would be a very large number of very curious human beings, I mean curious in the sense of wanting to know, who would spend all their lives in school. <laughs> Some individuals like this were known in the in the armed services, for instance. They, they didn't do it voluntarily, but they found themselves always in school. One school, another, and another. One could make an occupation of that. It's a kind of intellectual virtue. No, but uh, no, there were some real difficulties, not to mention what everybody knows, that if a man would say not, I want to be a hunter in the morning and a fisher in the afternoon and a critical critic at night, but uh, I would like to be a mathematician in the morning, a brain surgeon in the afternoon, and a repairer of electronic equipment in the evening. And then somebody would say, this is a kind of uh, exalted paranoid. Uh, or somebody who at best would become a, a handyman. 
a very elevated handyman. Now, I mentioned this at the, uh, at the beginning because the whole thing leads up to that. That's what, at the end of, of this book, uh, this uh, part, you have the, the spreading out of the, the rounded man once more. And uh, uh, Marx seems to suppose that if a man is able to do many things, I leave out now all the practical difficulties, to do many things, a versatile man, that would, in effect, be a kind of guarantee of his human excellence, which is, I think, indefensible. If any of you have ever known a very competent, versatile handyman, you'll know that he can be an abominable human being and be able to do all sorts of things. Uh, there, are, there are lots of people such as the kind that Marx describes as his ideal, more or less, not brain surgeons and mathematicians and everything else, but uh, you can find quite a few men who work on farms who are amazingly versatile. They, they fix their own machinery. They must. It's too costly to hire someone to do it. They plow and they do uh, woodwork and all kinds of things. Very versatile. And uh, thereby, some of them are just uh, uh, terrible people in every other respect. And so what, what would that prove, uh, you know, about this high level of humanity? But uh, I don't want to dwell on that. The only thing is, we've seen that uh, we're breaking down the categories by types of employment. Yes. And I think uh, you both to fit into the idea of the well-rounded man being, there being some guarantee of his excellence, and to make it feasible, you might think of the categories in a different sense. One technical capacity, one capacity with respect to the humanities, one with respect to living outdoors or something that builds the body. In other words, each job chosen to, to develop a, a whole area of human potentiality, but not the attempt to master every trade, which is somewhat different. And yeah, but you see, Marx compels us to think about it in these more technical terms, because he says the whole character of life is given to it by the mode of production. And now that doesn't mean that what you do with your spare time, if any, or how you, uh, how you develop hobbies or what books you read. He said that only follows maybe more or less <coughs> incidentally. But what men do, their activities, their productive activities. But the mode of production is changing in a precise sense. Namely, one sense is the mass industry, which will give them a great deal more free time. Thus, so that hobbies come to take a significant portion of human day, of human activity. And therefore, the mode of production will be less, while it still is determinant, it, it's less specifically determinant of the particular things they do. Rather, it's determinant in the sense that it gives them more time to do things. And in this way, again, yeah. yeah, but I think that that slights a large part of his own doctrine, Mr. Benjamin, because I think that he means that what you do as a productive individual has very much to do with what kind of a human being you are at large, you see. And so, therefore, it isn't only a question of what you do as a, as a hobbyist or something, but that's only strictly derivative. And you always have to come back to how men spend their lives either at lathes or digging or something like that. Let me try just one other point on this. In working under the capitalist system where you work for another person, there's a clear delineation between a hobby and a job. The job is what you do and get paid for the hobby. In the system as Marx envisions it, where you always work for yourself or always work for society, no matter what you're doing, you can look at it either way, this delineation no longer exists, and your hobbies, so-called, are as much productive activity as is your job per se. Yeah. So that, again, uh, I still envision a somewhat greater freedom. Oh, very good. So, in other words, uh, working productively under those conditions will mean working as much for yourself as working for other human beings. And the distinction between benefiting yourself and benefiting others will disappear. Yes. Yeah, which is a moral order, but, and for which there is, I mean, there isn't any evidence whatsoever, you see, that such a thing is in any way a possibility. But maybe this is what he means, that everybody's work will become his hobby, and all people will love their work so that you won't be able to keep them away from it. I mean, I generally define work as doing the things I don't want to do, and non-work as doing what I want to do, whether or not, uh, whatever the specific activity is. And while this is an oversimplification, in these terms, there would be no work, but there would be production. Yes, yeah, so all play and no work. That's, uh, maybe that's the yeah, symbol. Yeah, I mean, it's synthesis, of course. It might have work, no play, but satisfactory expression of the work. Both. 
And but the question is which means the of the means, of course, is it called trivialistic? Yeah, and of course, particularly interesting, I, I don't want to, to keep up a running skirmish with Marx, because then we'll never learn what he tried to say, but especially since he dwells so much on the equation of the real with the sensuous and the actual, and, the, and he's, he's at such pains to eat scorn on the, the merely speculative and uh, merely noetic and what's only in the thoughts and so on. And then you might expect some sensuous, i.e. empirical evidence for his major assertions. And that being absent, somehow or other has a detracting effect on the power of the formulations. But uh, anyhow, now, what, uh, Mr. Steinfeger, did you, would you say in, that in this part of the book there is some... Uh, implicit notion of the good for man in this part that you summarize so well. Well, it, there certainly is in the sense that it has something to do with production, but that seems almost trivial to answer that. But no, but what about that material at the end, well, towards the end of the part? Oh, when he talked about the yeah, agriculture of the family? Yeah, and he yeah. speaks more uh, freely there about the, the future state of mankind. He never does it at great lengths, but there is more there than in many other places. It was why I suggested a number of questions at the end. For example, yeah. cooperation at the most basic level. He seems in one place to definitely say this is some kind of a critical of man, because social traditional labor is a part of cooperation co and that is one of its uh, predators, traditional labor is not entirely. I mean, he also says that cooperation is what helps the individual. And he says that man is a social animal. To That's what helps the individual and become a species and to move towards the species character of the individual. I, I, again, I don't know what word is being translated there because. Uh, I, I wouldn't be surprised, but uh, I, I don't know. <laughs> Species essence in the other book, but I suppose it's the same thing. I don't know really whether I could piece together something, except that it somehow seems to be some kind of very free uh, interaction among human beings in all degrees. There, well, there is distinctly some sort of an intimation about a good life for men. Uh, now, that's not such a novel idea. People have been talking about a good life for men for a very long time. But under other circumstances, it used to be thought necessary to support those notions of a good life for man with something other than what looks like the preferences. That is to say, a good life for man is supposed to arise out of what a man is, but then on a simple thing like that, a good life for, for men and a good life for pigeons or something should be understood very differently because what you're starting with is very different in the two cases. So something about what conventionally would have been called, say, the nature of man would have been thought to be necessary as a part of the argument to build up towards the good for man or the good life for man. That's not very substantial in Marx, is it? I mean, there isn't much of that support. I'm also concerned that his emphasis on science and technology seems not really any substantial basis for why this is the full developer of all man's capabilities. Especially since he himself apparently recognizes it, uh, the massive talents of Shakespeare. And yet he puts all this cool development in the science there. Yeah, but that has to do once more with the production problem and how science becomes the, the means for solving the, the problem of wants for human beings. But science, like every other thing that has been touched by capitalism, has been perverted by it and put to a bad end rather than to the good Well, all right, we'll, we'll come to all of this. One other question. Did you, do you get the impression that, that a communist society under its full uh, development would make use of modern technology? Would make use, would make of, use of modern, modern, modern technology? Versus modern modern and the no, whatever, either way. But say as he understood it and as it has come to be developed. I would imagine so. I mean, I don't see how, uh, how they could afford it. He talks about, well, that long section is just about quoted for a when he talks about the capitalist use of machinery doing one thing with a real machine doing the other, free labor, conquered nature. Yeah, but now, uh, 
the, the means of production are very important in Marx, let's understate it. The means of production are said by Marx to be decisive. Now, it isn't simply the means of production, however. The means of production lead to some social conditions, and therewith some status for man. And what about the possibility that even under the, the, uh, the communist organization, or this organization, which I mean not without disrespect, but a loosening of the organization, that, that the influence of the means of production would, according to his own understanding, still have some effects. And how could you help it? If, uh, if you have to chain a man to a machine, that's going to be true whether it's in the Soviet Union or in the United States, pretty much. Isn't that true? Uh, do, do you notice any progress that anybody is able to make in the Soviet Union with respect to releasing the men from the machines? or anything like that? It is, wasn't he, in some sense, more true, more correct than he ought to have been? Because if the, if the evolution of science, and therefore technology, really is independent of the difference between communism and capitalism, then what he says about the effects of the mode of production on the lives of men comes to have a graver implication for that later condition of society. Well, the dominant uh, economic effect for capitalism is capital or machinery capital. But the dominant effect for the present movement, which abolishes the present state of things, namely for communism, is mass industry, which destroys the conditions of scarcity. And here the dominant problem that man is not bound to the machine because he need only work at the machine an hour or two a day at most in order to produce everything that is needed so that the economic determination upon him, again, is the thing which gives him the freedom. It's a different set of economic determinants. And not exactly, though, because it, it doesn't do to talk about a machine system such that a man has to work only an hour or two a day. As to whether that is technically feasible, we still don't know. It might be that just as there is, in the minds of the physicists, an absolute heavy body, a body which is of the absolute maximum weight, Maybe there is such a thing as the absolute minimum working day. That is to say, given by conditions of, of depreciation, the mere wearing away of matter. And maybe that I say, I, I say maybe, because he doesn't take the question up. And until the question is somehow or other resolved, this formulation about the reduction of the working day to 20 minutes or an hour or two hours is altogether speculative. We don't know anything about it. In other words, under the best conditions, it might take more than that merely to replace machinery, to say nothing about progress, you know, which means more output and some of those. But I don't want to quibble, except we're now talking about things nobody can know. And we should be instructed a bit by Marx's own difficulties in forecasting, so, you know, so we don't make the same mistake. But I would suggest to you, incidentally, there are some really atrocious blunders with respect to the mere facts in this part of the book. For example, if, you, if, if Marx is right, and for the time being, let's say, we can't figure out where he's wrong, but if he's right, the increase in the standard of living, generally speaking, throughout the Western world, can't be a fact. It's impossible. It happened, but it's impossible, one would be bound to say. Now, on the old principle that if a theory departs too far from observable things, it ought to be uh, re-examined, uh, and I would say this is a candidate. Rabbi Weisman. Well, on your earlier point, uh, uh, does Marx maintain that uh, man is degraded not merely because he is uh, using a machine, but because he has become a commodity vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, technology under capitalism? But uh, in the post-capitalistic stage, where the relation to technology will change because he is no longer uh, a commodity used by someone else in the productive process. That surely is part of what Marx meant. But that web of social relations, that was in a way dictated by the underlying means of production, modes of production. In the past has been, and, he, and as far as we can tell, always will be. Well, but doesn't he maintain that this was part of the nature of capitalistic uh, history, and then in post-capitalistic times, a man will be the master of technology? Yeah, 
that's exactly the point, though. You see, that I would like to know what's meant by man being the master of technology when it's still going to be true that a man is going to have to stand up or sit down in front of a machine, and he's going to have to stand up or sit down in front of that machine for some extended period of time, and probably you'll have to keep coming back to that machine. Otherwise, it would be utter chaos. And who can imagine a productive system in which every morning everybody would re-examine the question of whether he's going back to the same place of work as he went yesterday? What, what sense does that make? Not to say, speaking of whether he'll go back after lunch. Well, but does repetition lead to enslavement? Yeah, no. Isn't it uh, as being used as a commodity? That no, no, I don't care under what conditions. It, no matter who owns it or whom he's working for, if he could have the, the machine in his own backyard, but if he goes to that same machine and does the same thing day after day for a normal working day, whatever, eight hours, that has a stultifying effect on him, which is uh, irrespective of any social conditions. It can't help but make him a narrow man. That's part of what Smith said, Marx, everybody else. Yeah. The variety is what, what's important, and, you, and I question whether that's anything but someone's dream under these, under these or any other technological conditions. In the old time, tremendous training was necessary because it was all skill. Now, tremendous repetition is necessary because it's all machine, non-skill. But that's got nothing to do with the difference between capitalism and communism. It has to do with science. And science pervades them all. It's a, it's a super economic, you could say. And it's, so there's a real question whether how far you can go in reducing the, the understanding of social things in the modern world to uh, economic relations. Well, so there are lots of questions, but Dr. Strauss, what was it? Yeah, I have a few points in this chapter, which, which I would like to point out. Now, two are the deal with the question of, <clears throat> with the with so purely historical question, to what extent did Marx understand the earlier doctrines? And I must say, in this respect, I'm not speaking now of the economic doctrines, of which I know much to little, but about the social thought in general. And in this respect, Marx uh, is very impressive, in my opinion. And uh, also, with all what is uh, I give you two examples which show that on page 400 to 402, he speaks of the difference between the ancients and the modern. Marx was a very well-read man, of course. I mean, uh, he must have read the whole classical literature also from the point of view what he can learn from that regarding economic facts. Yeah. I mean, in other words, originally he read it just for enjoyment, and later on he did it as hard labor. And now here what he says about the, the difference, what the division of labor means in Plato, that this has to do with the, with the use value, of course, and not with commodities. That goes without saying. Yeah? He's probably right in that. But he doesn't meet the issue of Plato, the real issue, namely that one man, one job is a condition of a good job. Yeah? You know, and versus his painter and uh, fisher, fisherman and so on. Now, and here's a point which I enjoyed very much. When he speaks of Xenophon, and he refers to a passage in Xenophon's Education of Cyrus, Book 8. And he says, in Xenophon, who with characteristic bourgeois instinct approaches more nearly to division of labor within the workshop, i.e. the division of labor Shoemaker Kappa, yeah, but subdivisions of Shoemaker. Now, I think Marx is here, has here, I, don't, I would be, not be surprised if you wouldn't find any observation regarding Xenophon in the so-called bourgeois literature, who, which comes so close to an understanding of Xenophon. The expression which Marx uses, characteristic bourgeois instinct, is wrong, not to say absurd. But that Xenophon came closest of all ancient writers to the modern ideas, I think that one can prove. I mean, I knew this passage, but I thought of entirely different things in Xenophon. And if I stated this as follows. The originator of modern thought properly understood is Machiavelli. And the key passage in Machiavelli is that all men 
have a natural desire to acquire. And so the diff that is a natural desire, hence not blameworthy. Acquire means, of course, more and more. And the only difference therefore between human beings can be whether they are good or bad at acquiring. And to be a virtuous man means to be a good acquisitor, i.e. a tyrant, a big who is much bigger than any bourgeois could be. But here that, in this respect, that has been anticipated by Zenovon, but the interesting point which Marx did not see, and which indeed he couldn't see, given his knowledge, is that Xenophon is playing with these things. You know, like a somewhat naughty man who pl plays with extreme possibilities. Uh, to mention one example which has to do with economics in particular, the general notion is a gentleman has to be a gentleman farmer, not a merchant. A Xenophon plays with the interesting possibility of being a dealer, a merchant in estates. You, you know that story. You buy rotten estates. Yeah, buy rotten for, for cheap money. And then you improve it because you are a good farmer. And then you sell it dear. And you go on and on, you know. So you combine and have a synthesis of a farmer and a merchant. Still, that is one word. Now the other has, which has to do with the same question is on page, the note, page 426 where he says, and that is also interesting, uh, at the end of the note, in the preface to certain Dudley North discourse upon trade, 1691, it is stated that Descartes' method had begun to free political economy from the old fables and superstitious notions of gold trade and so on. On the whole, however, the early English economists sided with Bacon and Hobbes as their philosophers, while at a later period, the philosopher Catech Sochain of political economy in England, France, and Italy was Locke. That is very sound, and I think in the ordinary books on this subject, you will not find remarks which come as far as in a sound historical perspective is concerned, come in the very distance of that. And then he mentions Descartes is perfectly sound too. I had never, I didn't know that passage. It's very true, and is of course borne out by Locke who traces the real change which has taken place, characteristically not to Bacon, but to Descartes. And so Locke was an Englishman and Descartes was a Frenchman. And uh, there are other kind of remarks of this kind, and I believe, I, is, uh, Mr. Klopsy knows that infinitely better than I do, the sketch of the history of economic theories which uh, is embodied in, Dury, in uh, Engels' anti during you know, that part was written by Marx, the history of economic theories, must be very valuable, sir. Yeah. Uh, uh, I'm sure it's appear to what you ordinarily find on that. Now, we come to, uh, now to a substantive question, which has been up all the time. It's a question of human nature, because the previous discussion all turned around this question. Is there some permanent, unchangeable element uh, which would not be affected in any way by any traditions? Uh, by any transitions from uh, any historical change. Now, there are a few references to human nature which I thought are in very interesting. Mm -hmm. For example, page 435, which is uh, line 2, 3, which is not a quotation, where he speaks there arises an unnatural estrangement between mother and child. In, under certain capitalistic conditions. So there is a natural relation between mother and child. That is nothing very novel, but it's nevertheless important. Yeah, if, if the, in other words, not everything is natural, but it has immense, immense consequences. Yeah, I mean, the present-day social scientist would not use that, I believe, except in a state of relapse into <laughs> metaphysical thinking. Now, in, on page 436, see, where he refers to Engels, but doesn't quote, see, uh, where he speaks of the state of mind clearly distinguishable, yeah, the intellectual desolation and so on, uh, artificially produced by capitalists, a state of mind clearly distinguishable from that natural ignorance which keeps the mind fallow without destroying its capacity for development. It's natural fertility. Yeah, natural fertility has, has a teleological implication. Able to 
are disposed to, towards something in the future. Page 440, paragraph 2, in those industries first elaborate for lengthening the working day beyond all bounds set by human nature, and which, which means more than you can't work 24 hours a day and need some minimum of sleep, which is also, by the way, not entirely uninteresting, this need for sleep, but Marx means there much more about that. There occurs even a reference to natural right, although in a quotation only, but that's very interesting. Page 536, line 3. That is uh, from a factory report, I suppose. Factory, yeah. Since children and young persons, therefore, in all such cases, may justifiably claim from the legislature as a natural right that an exemption should be secured to them. By the way, this refutes a somewhat simplistic notion according to which in the bourgeois era, natural right meant only natural right of property. You must have heard that in times. But that was a statement made, I don't know when, but I suppose around 1840, 50 or so. The, what does he say in this connection? Uh, Mr. Steinberg has referred to that in his discussion, in Marx's own comment. However terrible and disgusting the dissolution of the capitalist system of the old family ties may appear, however Marx feels as any decent human being would feel natural, and he does not regard this as in any way class-bound. Be obviously not class-bound because the decent capitalists and the decent proletarians felt exactly the same about it. Nevertheless, modern industry, by assigning as it does an important part in the process of production outside the domestic sphere to women, to young persons, and to children of all sexes, creates a new economical foundation for a higher form of sea family and of sea relations between the sexes. These are other constants, the family. Three sexes, of course. I mean, he, when he speaks concretely, Marx is not fantastic at all. But still, we would like to know: Does do you does Marx mean there should be a new form of polygamy? Because when you speak of family, you don't mean promiscuity. That's obvious. Well, no, surely not. Because polygamy, as is the general view, depresses the women uh, too much. You so that monogamy. You're probably with easy divorce, that's not a matter, but still family and a certain responsibility for the children, which I suppose would act as a restraint regarding a very easy, very easy emotional divorce. Yeah, it's for the development of the human faculties. Uh, there is also a passage in this neighborhood, 529 following, and uh, quite a few remarks in, in, the, in this very uh, section 9. Uh, which we uh, cannot read. And indeed here, what Marx says here, this concrete form is very sensible. A development of all families means simply here a development of no stunting of bodily growth accompanied by the development of the mental faculties and vice versa. That is uh, perfectly sensible, but if that has nothing to do with the question of uh, equality, because uh, obviously not. I mean, uh, you know, with that ultimate equality which Marx somehow had in mind. And regarding this question, yeah, I repeat only the fundamental issue. I would contend it is impossible to have an orientation in human matters without a reference to human nature as somehow supplying the standard. That is the old story, accepted until the age of the 18th century, generally speaking. But yet, since the 17th century, in conflict with that, the notion of a conquest of nature, and which was then inevitably a conquest of nature, of course for the benefit of man, related to the nature of man and to man's natural wants. But it took on this character now that not only do we have to conquer non-human nature in order to satisfy man's natural wants, no, we have to conquer the nature of man itself. And from that moment on, well, it took some time until it became a matter of public knowledge, the whole thing becomes in unintelligible. 
conquest of nature, including human nature, for what? And to that extent, present-day social science is an honest expression of our dilemma. Any, any odd value you choose will do. As for the question of equality, there is one passage which, I've, uh, which repeats something we uh, have read in the early writings, but I had forgotten that passage, so I couldn't find it. Here we have it on page 363, near the top. is bound to be a direction of human beings at the same time. And the direction of human beings is undistinguishable from an authority. You cannot always, uh, that's only the political equivalent to the argument which Mr. Proxy made for Dunning's economics, you cannot always have your subject of that particular enterprise decide what should be done, because there is, after all, someone who is better trained yeah, and has better knowledge, who simply uh, is given the authority. And the authority can, of course, not merely be directive, because how can, what can you do if someone is lazy or drunk or um, derps the peace among the workmen and so on? There are other references to set through that. Yeah, and of course that is of some importance also for the judgment of the capitalist. However vicious and profit-seeking the capitalist may be, he may very well be, happen to be, the directing authority in the enterprise. And that is an absolutely necessary function. Marx usually presents it as if the capitalist were merely a profiteer, and all the directing authorities is done by poorly paid white collar workers or whatever he may have thought of. Now let me see, there is probably one more passage. You know, that is on page 391 indeed, where he uses even the argument at this point against capitalist doctrine. The capitalists emphasize the necessity of an hierarchic order or of planning within the factory and oppose that hierarchic order and that planning in society at large. Now, the concept, what would follow immediately from this argument, disregarding all other compli uh, complications, would be this. You need planning, i.e. a directing authority, in society at large. The vulgar word for that is government. Because you cannot do it with mere directions without some sanctions. You know, uh, sanctions, uh, you, you know what that means. And uh, therefore, that uh, point, I think, has to be considered for the whole notion of uh, Marx communism. The usual argument, uh, of course, would be this, if you want to make such points. The argument is taken from present-day communist states, which I have very much government, as you know, is that it's only transitional. It's only transitional, and therefore they would regard such arguments as irrelevant, immaterial, and whatever. But the question is, what is that final state to be achieved in 200 years, or maybe earlier, maybe later, probably later? Uh, what, what is that? You know, is this really, uh, is this not mere than a promise unsupported by anything? Or, or, or otherwise, Marx must show us what experiences we have in, in, in any sphere of human activity, they support this thesis. And this promise is indeed nowhere supported, that one must say. Is it just a hole in the heart of the world? Yes, this is the one. Well, yeah, it was a foregone conclusion from the beginning that we wouldn't be able to give a, no. uh, an account of this part of the reading in the time allotted, because it's vast. It's, uh, as you know, it's well over 200 pages and, and very rich in details and in analysis of all kinds. But let me only try to give a very short indication of what sort of development occurs in this, uh, in this part of the reading. Now, Marx had begun with some statements about profit about relative and absolute surplus value. And you could say 
that he is trying to show by referring to the history of the mode of production, how the directors of the mode of the means of production under capitalism are compelled by an inner necessity to intensify and radicalize capitalism itself in pursuit of profit. He has shown what are the, the arithmetic and other grounds for the quantity of profit, and he has shown how a certain course of investment is indicated for capitalists. They must do certain things in order to benefit themselves. What they must do is suggested to them, or in fact imposed on them, by that technology which they themselves set in motion by harnessing science to their own purposes, to the purposes of production. I say their own purposes because it's taken for granted that uh, the men work for themselves, the entrepreneurs work for themselves, they don't work for the good of society. At one point, I won't look up the passage right now, Marx says that uh, in effect a doctrine of Smith, the invisible hand, that men are led as by an invisible hand to promote an end which was no part of their uh, intention. Their intention having been the private good, but the, the unintended end being the common good. He said that's uh, absurd. Not at all. When they pursue their private good, that's what they get. They get their private good. And the private good is easily distinguishable from the common good. What's good for one man, it could be very bad for all the others around him. And that's obvious, too, incidentally. And Marx doesn't let that point slip by. It's obvious so far as it goes. Now, then the point is, what more specifically can the world look forward to while the mode of production is, is dictated by capitalistic purposes? And the key to that, I think, would be described as contradictions. Contradictions. That at almost every stage, the, the profit seeker is confronted by an impossible dichotomy of actions, developments, whatever. He tries to improve his profit situation. That leads him to invest more in machinery. That at the same time has the effect of worsening his profit situation, to give a very simple, uh, simplified example of it. What about the factory system, uh, the factory legislation? It, it, it's at the same time good and bad. Uh, of course the entrepreneurs don't want it, but it's imposed on them. Now once it starts to be imposed on them, what must their attitude be? A, they don't like it, so they'd like to push it off. But B, competition, the very character of, product, of capitalist production compels them to want it. And not only to want it, but to want it generally and in its most extended form. Very simple reason. We find the same thing to be true among businessmen now confronted with unions. They don't want unions in their own plants. But once they've got them, they jolly well want to make sure everybody else gets them too. That's the point. So now if the factory attacks are passed, and they apply to you, and you're in the textile business, and you're a big manufacturer, and it's easy to enforce the law with respect to you because you're plainly visible. Well, the first thing you have to do is to see, and to, to begin with, the enforcement is made very good or very bad. Either so you get away with it too, or else that everybody else is compelled as much as you to obey the law. And now that spreads from one section of industry to another. So it's not from benevolence that the factory legislation becomes extensive. It, uh, it, it grows by an inner law. Must. That's part of what he says. Now, so what happens after that? Uh, then uh, the, uh, the conditions of industry begin to become uh, more and more difficult. So the very thing that the, the capitalists must promote, it in the end, turns out to be uh, uh, fraught with contradictions. Uh, I give you very simple and very sm a small number of examples. Now, one can't help but be reminded of things in Hegel. That's no surprise. But in the uh, introduction to the philosophy of history, Hegel speaks about how the progress of man is in a way brought on by the vices and the passions that move man. And so while they seem to be aiming at some immediate object uh, dictated by low interests, in effect, 
they're bringing about the the progress of mankind towards a, a, a high and maybe even permanent condition. I think that what Marx says has very much in common with this. Uh, the low impulses of men are shown to work themselves out, driving others down and down and down, society always descending into graver and graver complications and difficulties, which are, through the mysterious nature of things, the ground for the ultimate resolution of all the difficulties, but literally all the difficulties. Now, why that should be true is not explained, I believe. In other words, why this is not a mere construction based on, on uh, terrific speculations hopes and similar things, why there is the necessity for the good to emerge out of the contradictory, that is not clear on the basis of mere materialism. If that were to be based on some, some notion of the ideas of a life of the immaterial, a real life within the sphere of the rational, play rational, maybe something could be said for this, but that's exactly what was found to be so terribly objectionable on the part of the idealists. I mean, uh, objectionable by the Marxists on the part, as it was held on the part of the idealists. So now, why materialism should have this meliorative uh, inner working, that is not plain. It comes out as a very impressive construction, there is no doubt, in Marx, but we find ourselves always plagued by the doubt as to the reality of the remote, the more remote. And we see how, as in the case of some earlier constructions with respect to astronomy, the more the time that elapsed after the construction of the system and therewith the making of the forecasts, the greater the divergence between the observed things and the uh, pretended foreknowledge. Which is please. please. I must do it because uh, I believe that's the point where I can make clear something what? which I stated at the beginning and where some of you might have thought it was so perfect and yes, this point it has a little bit more clear. Now, let us look back at the two men. You mentioned Hegel, but permit me to go back for one moment to Kant. In Kant, at this construction, vices bring up, not morality, bring about by their antagonism, their gender. So, the rational society, the society demanded by morality, namely this is in Kant's formula, a nation of devils, a nation of devils will uh, bring about that society by a mere mechanism of self-seeking. I can't make it perfectly clear. Institutional progress is not modern progress. In other words, the need uh, to, uh, of the moral effort of the individual remains in that final stage as much as an old but still, the, the interesting point is already in Kant. There's a mere play of the passions without any higher motivation will bring about the, the establishment of a of the Russian society. Now, that is only, however, the historical form of Adam Smith. What well, Adam Smith means simultaneously. Yeah is here now said of the historical stretch. The private interests, without giving a damn for the public interest, bring about the public interest. Within a given within a society. In the Kantian construction, the uh, significant invisible hand is a key to the historical. Now, Hegel, it comes in surely closer to Marx still than either Adam Smith or can be. But because for Hegel, the progress is, uh, at the same time, is not merely institutional. I mean, the nation of, it's not the nation of them, it's merely. Other uh, things enter. But still, Hegel's reasoning, he Hegel's doctrine is in one respect more rational than that of Smith and uh, Kant, because it says what is working 
in these patterns is reason with a capital R. That is, that is a cunning of reason. And secondly, in the pen of him, we must also say, he understood the final state to be a state and not a villain away state. And therefore, he had no doubt that the final state of man will have as many criminals, poor citizens, and self seekers, the despicable self seekers, as of absolute more, maybe, than say you had in the Greek polis. In other words, you still need gallows to use a simple symbol of that tough side of the state. Whereas the fantastic thing in Marx is that you have without reason effective as a hidden ground of the whole movement, you get at a certain moment a moral regeneration of man which would make any uh, forms of compulsion uh, wholly superfluous. And that's it. Forgive me for Please. interrupting. No, surely. It, it, in fact, it was scarcely an interruption. It, it, uh, it, uh, I think we could stop at this point because I think there has been uh, as much as we can do within any reasonable length of time to give the general development within this part. So you could say then that as little as it appears to do this, this very technical part points toward the question of the real ground of the doctrine of history in Marxism with the understanding that the doctrine of history rests, according to Marx, on a strictly material basis and how that's intelligible. That is the question that uh, we've just tried to speak about. Now, that brings us down to, to Mr. Bartholomew next time on parts five and six. Mr. Bartholomew, are you all primed and ready to go off? Good. I will be. You will be, yes. <laughs> in this part, in part five, that calls out most cryingly for uh, some clarification is exactly that uh, chapter 17, which you wisely decided would be impossible to, to handle. I mean, you have, it wouldn't do any good. And so therefore, we'll have to spend a bit of time uh, working that out here. Could you distinguish, uh, Mr. Bartholomew, between the effects of productiveness of labor and intensity of labor, or, or just plain distinguish the two things for the class? Well, in effect, productiveness of labor uh, does not lead to any increase in the uh, total value of the, the, the product of work, whereas you could say, you mean in the nature what they mean? Or? Yes, but to begin with what they mean, and then we'll... Say. Well, productiveness is, is simply increasing uh, in... Uh, the same lowering, let's say, the length of time needed to pr produce a certain uh, uh, product. Yeah. In intensity in these terms is the uh, the uh... well. That it's very easy to get the, the two things confused. Uh, I didn't mean to try to stick you at all. But I was hoping that this well, would be. A, I didn't. I, 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 I see that, and that's why I'm a, a, a bit apologizing. But uh, I didn't mean to do that. I thought that we could find our way into the discussion of this thing, starting with a definition. Well, uh, well, I dare say that you're not the only one who had a bit of difficulty with that, and especially since Marx himself says a few different things on different places. On page 570, 575, and 580, he makes different remarks about the effects of a change in productiveness of labor, and we're going to have to come to that. Uh, let me indicate the problem in this way. Uh, almost immediately following the numeral 2 on page 570, in the second sentence of that paragraph, Marx says, a variation in the productiveness of labor its increase or diminution causes a variation in the opposite direction in the value of labor power. Now, 
on page 575, at the beginning of the second paragraph from the bottom of the page, well, the only paragraph, complete paragraph on that page that says, we know that, with transitory exceptions, a change in the productiveness of labor does not cause any change in the value of labor power, nor consequently in the magnitude and so on and so forth. Now, on page 580, under the numeral two, increased productiveness and greater intensity of labor both have a like effect. They both augment the mass of articles produced in a given time. Both, therefore, shorten that portion of the working day which the laborer needs to produce his means of subsistence or their equivalent, which would, of course, have an effect on the value of labor power. Right? So there are two to one. Two, two observations there against one. Uh, did anybody straighten this out? Mr. Wardman? I think in one case, referring to the absolute uh, 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 labor power, the other two, I think it's just referring to the uh, two in uh, relative terms. Because productivity and increase the absolute labor power is impossible. Well, he speaks about absolute and relative surplus value, but not absolute and relative labor power. Well, he, he takes his day and says that an increase in productivity can increase the, uh, the value. Yeah. So, and so it can. An, an increase in productivity can, incre can increase the total value. Can. can or cannot? Cannot. Cannot. Yeah. Uh -huh. So it can only increase increase the uh, the uh, the uh, labor um, in relation to surplus value, but it can it can it can increase the labor power without increasing the surplus value. Yeah, that's not entirely clear. I think I'm, I'm trying to imagine this from the point of view of somebody who doesn't understand it yet, and I think he might. You probably do understand it, but I think that wouldn't have cleared it up altogether to somebody. That's why I was trying to approach it from the point of view of a definition of the difference between productiveness and intensity, because Marx is perfectly clear with respect to that. That's almost simple. And then he makes another distinction, which we would have to keep in mind while discussing the effects of these two things, namely where the change in productiveness or intensity occurs. He doesn't use the term wage goods industries, but we could. It's a term which came into use later on. A wage goods industry is one which produces something commonly bought by working men and which enters into their means of into their standard of living. Other industries produce things which don't, uh, obviously not. So that in other words, the industries that produce uh, ordinary foods, which are likely to be consumed by working men, so on. Uh, clothing, and not the tuxedos necessarily, or, or silk hats, but uh, uh, you know, working clothing, that kind of thing. What goes into the Bureau of Labor Statistics cost of living index, or used to, the means of consumption of an ordinary urban working family, well, let's call those work, uh, wage goods industries. Now, a change in productiveness or intensity of labor there would have one kind of an effect. But a change elsewhere, Marx says, wouldn't have any effect wouldn't have that kind of effect. That's the first distinction. But that is meaningless without some reference to the difference between productiveness and intensity. Now, let's see if we can't work our way up to this thing a bit more systematically. At a certain point, it makes sense to define those, those two, and then uh, I'll, I'll do that, and that, that will be very shortly. But before we lose sight altogether of Mr. Bartholomew's very useful paper, may I ask, Mr. Bartholomew, if you could make any sense of the distinction that Marx makes between the price of labor and the wage of labor. Again, it's a question of a definition, and I'm not out to uh, embarrass you, but... Uh, between the price, the price of labor and the wage of labor. Did you happen to notice that as you went? No, I, I didn't. I thought he was... I thought in many instances he was interchangeable. No, he, he's rather careful to avoid doing that. Uh, he makes this distinction. The price of labor is the hourly wage, what we would call the hourly wage, and what he calls the wage of labor is the daily or the weekly wage. And then if he develops a law which is perfectly obvious and, and hardly deserves all the attention, but uh, nevertheless it's there. The difference between the wage per hour 
and the wage per day, because if the day is the unit, if, for example, you say, I'll pay you $25 a day, and the man starts to work for you at the rate of eight hours a day, and then you increase the day to 12 hours, but the compensation remains the same per day, the price per hour naturally is considerably affected, and he wants to consider that because he talks all the time about changes in the length of the working day. At one point, he speaks about competition among the capitalists, and uh, he says he won't talk about the effects of competition in this place, but he knows that it exists, and he mentions some of the effects of it. What effect does competition have on the working man, uh, according to Marx, one of, one of the big effects? What is the biggest effect is uh, as it takes place between working men? Yes. No, no, uh, no. But let's say between the uh, capitalists now. Between the working men, you rightly point well, his, out. His, his, the price of his labor power is, is depressed, in effect. I mean, uh, the competition between capitalists leads to an effect to, uh, uh, let's say, a, a, a constant depressing of the price of, uh, of the commodity. Yes. Which, in, which in, 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 in turn means that the, uh, the price of labor descends to. Yeah, it isn't quite so simple, but generally speaking, one could say Marx asserts that the competition among the capitalists leads to the passing on to the consumer yeah, of some part of the advantage that comes from increasing productivity or increased intensity of work done by the, by the working man. Now, suppose once more that this were a wage goods industry in which this takes place, then who would the consumers be? What do you mean wage? Uh, but the same thing I meant before, that it's a, an industry which produces an item on which the wages are working in our spend. Well, in this sense, it would be the workers. Yeah, it would benefit the working men. He doesn't bring that out particularly for, I don't know, I mean, for what reason, but we wouldn't have to go into that. But it, it would certainly mitigate the effect of his argument. Um, what, it, what it would mean, in other words, would be that there would be an increase in real wages, and wages would be enhanced in a roundabout. Uh, method. Now, yeah, you rightly said that he speaks of peace wages as being the, the culmination of capitalist exploitation. Cheating, he uses that word here in, in volume one. Uh, I thought that it, I didn't remember that it was here. I know that it's in volume three, but that he speaks about this thing as cheating. Do you, have you ever heard the name of uh, Stakhanov? <laughs> and therefore, Stakhanov fights. Yeah. Yes. What does that have to do, if anything, with the question of peace rates, as we call it? I would say it's, it's uh, connected with the extent to which it, peace rates force upon the work of the need of intensifying his labor, prolonging his working day. And yet, this conversely has the effect of cheapening his, uh, his labor with the uh, productivity. Well, but, but even more simply than that, you know, let me approach the question another way. Does, does anybody happen to know which is the prevailing principle of the wage payments in the Soviet Union as between time, time rates and peace rates? Well, they're very heavy on peace rates. Uh, I can understand that. Uh, and we're, we're heavy on time. We're much heavier on time rates, yes. And not only time rates, but hourly rates. You see, I mean, during the steel strike, for instance, not so long ago, you all remember, I'm sure, that the, all the issues, with all the monetary issues, were expressed uh, with respect to the uh, number of cents per hour. And not only that, but the length of the working day is strictly regulated, you see, so that there is no possibility either of increasing the length of the working day or of uh, causing this, therefore, compression of the rate per hour because they're all fixed. And not only that, but the overtime rate is fixed also by strict conventions. So much of what uh, Marx asserted with respect to the, the practices, well, it's not terribly interesting. It's got no theoretical interest whatever uh, and therefore can easily be passed by. You know, it's altogether empirical. It's nothing a priori about it. Is something done this way or isn't it done that way? You can't sit any place to find out. You must ask somebody or go look. And then when you found out, that settles altogether the question of whether it's likely to happen or not likely to happen that way. It did happen this way, see? And it happened exactly the opposite from what he said. 
Well, I mean, I'm asked to the, whole, the earlier question that I meant to raise uh, only in passing I mean, several chapters back about the, the depopulation of the world, not to mention the immiseration of the whole world population uh, as it shrinks. I mean, it, is, it has no connection whatever with anything that has really happened. But uh, I, I'm, I am at constant pains to point out what seems and what can easily be neglected as of the least interest namely the simple facts, uh, but it's important to have that in mind. Now, so in other words, t uh, peace rates probably are characteristic of that stage of industrial production where the need for rapid development is most urgent for one reason or another, either because of the low rate of productivity generally or for some other reason. And the Soviet Union, of course, understands that very well, and they try in every way to get the maximum benefit of uh, incentives. As Dachanov and similar people are simply urged to kill themselves quickly in the cause of uh, uh, an, an excess of the labor intensification, a kind of speed up which in this country would bring down the house with the screams of exploitation. Except, of course, one can say, surely it's done there voluntarily and uh, for the sake of the homeland and so on and so forth. I wouldn't want to go into that, uh, how far that's true, but. Uh, as for the mere externals, there isn't any question about where the labor intensification is most uh, successfully applied. Well, now, so that let's begin. Uh, I beg your pardon, Dr. Stasford, was there something? No, no, Mr. Rankin. I was only going to offer that answer to the ratio of time work to time spent at the job. Ratio of time work to time spent at the as for example, if there was somebody who made frequent trips outside to smoke or something like this. Uh, that would be one, uh, yeah. But they have different sources, changes in productiveness and changes in intensity. And that, that's important for, for other people even too, because uh, there's something to do with the application of more capital. See, the productiveness has to do with the increase in the helps given to labor and intensity doesn't. But we'll come to this. And now, as for the difference between absolute and relative surplus value, that we should have in mind at the outset. Absolute surplus value has to do with the prolongation of the working day, and relative surplus value has to do with the reduction of the necessary part of the working day. And I think that uh, this simple visual formulation gets the entire day is represented by the whole length of that bar. And the upper part is surplus and the lower part is necessary. Then we could say that in the first six hours of the working day, the working man replaces by his contribution to the value of the product the means of subsistence which keep him going through that day. Then the rest is the unpaid labor of the surplus. And it's clear that this surplus can be increased in one of two ways or both. Either by removing the line up or down. <coughs> up would decrease it, down would decrease it. Up would decrease the amount of necessary labor and reduce the amount of surplus. Down, vice versa. Right? So relative means it gets its name from this fact, the relation between the mass of the surplus value and the mass of the necessary labor, the surplus labor and necessary labor in the course of the day. Right? Now, obviously, the other possibility would be simply to lengthen the whole thing and assuming that the line which separates the necessary from the surplus remains at the same level, then the surplus can be made to grow. Right, that would be absolute, the principle of the absolute uh, surplus. Now, here he brings, it to, he brings the two things together, and this is, in a way, a uh, kind of climax to what has gone before. And now, there are a number of remarks in this chapter 16 in which Marx speaks about the whole natural framework of the productive process, and uh, some of the, these remarks 
are very interesting and would be useful for us to consider if we had more time. I can only draw your attention to a, a few of them. Uh, for example, on page 561 uh, to 563, he speaks about the growth of man's productiveness and at the same time how man had stood at the very bottom of the page. It is only after men have raised themselves above the rank of animals. On the right hand side, 561 is the fourth line from the bottom, fourth and fifth. It is only after men have raised themselves above the rank of animals, and so on. So in other words, the process of evolution is really an artificial thing. Then, oh, on 562, at the end of that same paragraph, it says, the productiveness of labor that serves as its foundation and starting point is a gift not of nature, but of a history embracing thousands of centuries. That means hundreds of thousands of years, you know, so that it's hard to know exactly what beginning point he had for this thing, but surely it was what we ordinarily call in very remote prehistory. And now, and then on page 563, he continues in the same vein, about the sixth line from the bottom of the uh, text. Yeah, this mode is based on the dominion of man over nature. Where nature is too lavish, she keeps him in hand like a child in leading strings. She does not impose upon him any necessity to develop himself. Now, I wouldn't want to push this too far, but it certainly raises the interesting question, what Marx expected would be the case in a condition of man in which nature didn't push at all, or, you know, in which there was virtually no, no pressure or no problem. I think Nietzsche was the one who really understood this thing and showed how, that it, how in a way, this was the, the source of a, a terrific objection to that condition of the last man, if I'm not mistaken, or the, the, the end of human development. Uh, and another man long before said, sweet are the uses of adversity. I'm not sure he meant precisely the same thing, but uh, he might have meant something similar, that the solution of all problems for man would be the basis for the most colossal problem of all. And Marx, somehow or other, apparently uh, knew something about the reasons that might underlie that, but it didn't work itself out. And now, yeah, and then, oh well, on the next page he goes on to say, favorable natural conditions alone gave us only the possibility, never the reality of surplus labor. That's the paragraph that begins. Nor consequently of surplus value on a surplus product. I point that passage out to you because one could say Marx's general tendency is to try to show how these things which are taken by the political economists to be natural phenomena are not natural at all. They're historic. That is to say, they required to be brought to completion or fruition by some acts of men under the influence of necessity, solving their problems of production and devising or being compelled to devise various modes of production under the influence of growing technology, the prior history of the satisfaction of wants, the development of new wants, and so on and so forth. So Marx's constant struggle is to show that the political economists were wrong in this fundamental respect, that they took the present condition to arise more or less directly out of nature. And Marx didn't do it, was at pains to show that this didn't grow out of nature directly. It grew out of nature, if at all, only in such an indirect way that the manner of its growing out had to be regarded as still an operative energetic force, i.e. history, and that what grew out of nature, if it grew out at all, in its present manifestation, will be replaced by something else that can equally be said to have grown out of nature with the radical mediation of history. So, please. Well, the basic question that put Marx, let's try to see not only are not interested in doing what Kuchet does, but let's try to see whether one cannot make a case for Marx. Could he not say this? Without necessity, without need, without misery in other words, man would always have remained a kind of banana-picking monkey. Yeah? And a very constant monkey. 
So it was less men had to be forced to work, the whole stuff. But this work changes man too. And at the end of this process, we find a being formed by history who has needs, needs, who has needs which needs then explain sufficiently why he would work. It does it make sense? Acquired, acquired needs, not natural needs. Acquired, it's a natural need that for who? But the acquired needs, for example, for, say, for music, yeah? These acquired needs cannot be satisfied except by a mild kind of work. And so you have then here a society in the realm of freedom, you know, as the essential level of necessity, you have uh, beings who simply by, by uh, desiring to express themselves, or to, uh, how is the word of Marx, to, to, ex, to uh, express their lives, labels also, to utter their life, which in the primitive condition was simply a desire to run around and align the sun or to perhaps have some broad or tiny type, is now a desire which, which simply uh, uh, accompanied with a reasonably developed tree tells them they have to work four or five hours a day so that they can listen to music and pain in the afternoon. Could this not be? Yeah. Uh, that, in other words, a non teleologically developed uh, needs, non teleological is just the outcome of the historical process, and they alone make intelligible the way of life and the ends of man that state. Could he not say that? I believe he probably would say something like this, but without making provision for one large difficulty. It be both pre-capitalist and capitalist economists recognize one way or another that leisure is a, a good. Now, with a simple transformation, one could say, Idleness is a good. As far as I know, he has no provision for a relapse into that state of the banana picking, almost. I mean, I understand that really that's pushing much too far, but there is no left and no provision against the subsiding to a very low level out of mere laziness, say, because of the lack of pressure. You know, this must be compelled to show on the basis of man as he is now. Yeah. That is the first Yeah, precisely. I mean, he couldn't know anything at all about what's likely to happen so, on the basis of yeah. something he can't see anyhow. Surely the existence of certain conditions, frame, uh, this, the existence of these social conditions is enough to sustain, uh, enough to arouse in the man these needs. Now that these conditions are in existence, in other words, they can't just pass away. Well, it's very hard to know, Mr. Faulkner, what could or couldn't happen, because such a thing as what Marx contemplates has never really been known among men. And one has absolutely no ground for asserting that energy is more likely to uh, be called forth than lassitude is likely to be encouraged. I don't know. It might be that these men would be under the, under the, the freedom from all competitive and other drive, it might be that they would become a very bland and easily satisfied collection of men. I don't believe it for a minute, because as a matter of fact, I don't believe that it would ever come to that. But apart from this, on the basis merely of the prognosis, you know, I, I see nothing whatever anywhere, either in empirical or, or uh, a priori things, to settle that question. I don't mean to say there's a stronger presumption one way or the other, but I think that there is no presumption. Yeah, but, but still, there is kind of a point. The event is not limited to Marx, is it? At all. And therefore, I would like to put it on. It does not, the anti Marxist economic theory require a doctrine of the nature of man. Yes. How does it get it? Yeah, well, it, I think uh, from earlier uh, discussions, one would have to say it's simply scraped up together. It's sort of put together, but uh, not but acquisitive. It's, it's the decay, the decay.
main elements of much earlier formulations. Uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, you know, the, yeah, the, the, the Dimagree phrase, I believe, mean, especially by the Germans, and you know, the historical school in Germany, mm -hmm. that you cannot impute to um, man what you observe every day on a stone exchange. Yeah? Uh, and uh, that is a famous story, you know, the relativization of the economic man. Yes. Uh, 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 the economists must face that, don't they? I, I believe that if it were a question of trying to find a better statement among the political economists, Marx's stock objection to them would be very strong, namely that they take to be universal the particular experience yeah. that they observe. So I don't mean to imply that Marx's uh, shortcomings are met yeah, yeah. in the opposite school, but uh, they have a, a shortcoming which is characteristic, but it's different from Marxist. Yeah. And uh, may I bring up and uh, uh, come back to another question which seems to me extremely interesting uh, be uh, because it has a bearing much beyond uh, the subject of this seminar. Is a question and uh, which is that I don't know which expression you use about the embarrassment you are uh, in which you are constantly. And shall you go into these things which are no facts, so to say, yeah. which Marx assumes as facts, and of which we know they are not facts. But do we not have the same problem in every, or almost every political theorist or social theorist? Think of Aristotle. Aristotle asserts certain facts explicitly or by indication, of which we know there are no facts. Yeah. Yeah. But on Aristotle, uh, would regard it as important to have a decent degree of freedom in a large society. I mean, a society much larger than a point. Yeah, we know that, that, that isn't true. So, what do we do in this case? Is, uh, what you, uh, if I may criticize you, uh, did really run away from these unpleasantnesses and not face it? After all, Marx is whatever we may say uh, against him, right? Uh, that's a systematic thinker. And if uh, everything hangs together, now if, say, a number of things, yeah, which hang together, so, and some of these, let me say, we know now are simply wrong. Yeah, you know, good, but still we have to understand the connection. It's not true. And if, uh, that is by no means a purely historical thing, because of the utmost practical importance. Because the successors to Marx, who saw that Marx's prognosis regarding capitalism were wrong, it did not therefore scrap the whole thing. They rewrote it. And that this process of rewriting is going on all the time. And they claim that this rewriting maintains what was really important for Marx, whereas these things where as he wrote them, not so important. In other words, whether the trick of capitalism is the exploitation of the European proletariat, or the American proletariat, for that matter, or rather imperialistic policies in Asia and Africa, is ultimately unimportant. Marx had an inkling of that, you know, when he spoke of, uh, of, the, bourgeois, of the workers' aristocracy in Britain. Yeah. Yeah, it's a remarkable effect. Do you see what I mean? I think we have to do in the case of Marx what we would also do in the case of uh, the famous schools in Gander. Yes. Uh, uh, as an uh, argument. Yeah. yeah. Well, I am uh, far from saying or at least meaning that I wanted to escape from the problem. Well, in fact, I was only uh, trying to point out that one could spend too much time arguing yes. only about the details, but. Uh, I'm trying to draw attention to this thing which I believe is true about Marx. That one could say that his whole structure stands or falls on the soundness of his understanding of history. If there was something really radically wrong with his understanding of history, not enough would be left to make it worthwhile. Yeah, but it's still, but here I'm sort of, yeah, but that is not so easy, because it would then come down to an, an aggression which is, can justly be described from Marx's point of view as accidental. Whether Marx 
originally, as you know, he seems to have thought in about 15 or 20 years after 1848, the whole thing will blow up. And then he learned to his chagrin that capitalism was much more tough than he thought. You know, and even when he died, things looked very bad in 1883. You know, the German Social Democratic Party was growing, but he didn't know what a bureaucratic party that would be. And uh, how they were you know. I thought he had some But at any and then we remember 18, how Lenin and Trotsky in, in, in uh, Petrograd or Leningrad keep, kept their fingers crossed when will the German military rise. There were some roles, but the Germans took ease, the German Social Democrats took so wonderfully easily care of that rising. So there was nothing. Then I remember some crypto Marxists who said in 44, well, after the Second World War, the rest of Europe is completely communist because communists are the only ones who really fight in the resistance, which the latter point is partly true, by the way. But or let us even say 90% true. And absolutely nothing happened in the West. Yeah. So, and then now, of course, they have written it off. At least for the duration, and they think it will come on Earth via Mao and uh, certain things they expect from Africa. Yeah, that's clear. But what I'm trying to say is this: whether the thing happens in 20 years or in 300 years, what a Marxist could say is really a purely quantitative question. I not that. Yeah, but quantitative changes, I believe, are known by Marx to have some sort of a qualitative bearing after a while. Yeah, yeah, but still, but uh, I must say, let us not precisely, uh, I, uh, um, uh, I happen to be opposed to communism in every way, but precisely for this reason, I cannot take the view which a businessman can take if it comes after my lifetime. I don't care. No. Uh, I care very much whether it comes after my lifetime. And therefore, the real issue is whether it is altogether feasible. With, I mean, that they may win military at another century feasible, but whether it can be at the same time the true liberation of man, that alone is of course a question. But this, Dr. Strauss, is what I mean to be saying. Yeah. I mean, that it might happen, I too am perfectly yeah. aware. But I think it no, I mean, happens because yeah. uh, two billion people rise up against one billion, and by the same way that Alexander the Great did it, that's not at all a tribute to Marx's prejudice. Yeah. Uh, no, the question, <laughs> yeah, but the question then is this. What then, I mean, we must, in, in, uh, along the lines which you suggested, we must somehow be able to draw a line in a principled manner. Yeah. Between the really basic teachings sure. and the, the teachings which could be replaced from Marx's point of view by And then, we, then of course, from the procedure. Yeah, yeah. well, yeah. that's part of the difficulty in Marx, exactly because he was such a good generator of a system. Foundation is a real foundation, and what comes from the foundation really comes from it. And he reasons very strictly from the labor theory of value yeah. up to the rest. And that's what makes it very hard to find this line of distinction between what's what really counts and what doesn't count so much. Yeah. But it's all right. The tradition has give you a strictly orthodox Stalinist answer. The capital is in by Marx's state. Huh. And we discuss the issue of communism on the basis of the capital is Talmudism. Literally what the Stalin said. Yeah, then in that case it's up to Stalin to say why we have to study it at all anymore. Because one could say it's all data. It's discovered, they would say, the decisive points to the extent to which it was possible to do so in 1848-40. And that he would say, we have to rewrite it. But the basic principle, with a lot more freedom at the end, yeah, in the general terms of uh, communism, uh, to be prepared by a dictatorship of the dead, that remains. And that uh, is at least this solution they claim has been uh, proved possible because it has become actual. Yeah, yeah. And uh, then, of course, I would have to wonder on the last question is the uh, dictatorship of the Communist Party identical with the dictatorship of the proletariat? It's an issue between Trotsky and Lenin on the one hand and Stalin on the other, and so on. Sure. 
Yeah, that, that would surely yeah. be one of the questions. Yeah. But I believe that it, the, the other question, which is perhaps even more important, is whether it is not true that the ultimate success of, of the Marxist system, assume it for the time being, isn't exactly for the reason that Marx denied could ever be decisive. I believe if, uh, if it ever comes to pass that this dominates the world, it will be because there was a man and he thought certain things and his thoughts had a certain effect. And I believe that they were probably three-fifths wrong, but it makes no difference. No. And what really matters is many people were convinced and had received into their minds an opinion, which, could, which was a wrong opinion, and that was what was decisive, mm -hmm. and no nonsense about history and the material uh, yeah, yeah, forming. Sure. Yeah. But that, I think, is really what, uh, yeah. what, uh, why it's so important to see that his prognoses are not facts, they're wrong. No, no, that's very really true. But the question which we cannot take up here, of course, is to what extent, say, the aliens and the later ones, modifications are only on such a level that they are perhaps not yet computable. It could but be. It, uh, yeah, that, that's, that's mere footwork. Yeah, that's yeah. dancing around and, yeah. and helping out. Yeah, but, uh, but yeah, sure. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, well, this is all, always very attractive. One can hardly keep from it, but it's, yeah, yeah. yeah there are some mistakes. I think what's also fundamental to Marx's economic thinking is the fact that the state should become the chief organizer of economic affairs. And this will ultimately lead to a state of plenty. Because his economics certainly does not apply to his state of scarcity. Because the very idea of equating surplus value with export confrontation indicates that he is always visualizing in terms of a state of plenty, which is the thing that the state ultimately would be able to do in good term. Yeah, but what he ultimately means is the state will vanish entirely. Yeah. But during the time that the state exists, there is a certain amount of exploitation, although it might be worth the state. Although it might be, it might be worker state. Worker state, yes. I mean, this seems to be a sort of contradiction because that by implication means that the workers are exploiting themselves. Well, he would say it's not exploitation under those yeah, conditions. Yeah, he mentioned that. And he, he even speaks of it and he says, I find that this is more careless for himself. It's not exploitation. In, as a matter of fact, in, if, if, where is it in the, uh, the critique of the Gotha program, I think it is, that he, he shows some mistakes on the part of what was it, the Lasallian? Yeah. Sort of, and he says, they argue that under certain conditions, you know, the workers stay and so on, that the workers would get the full product, the full output of labor. And he said, that's absurd. They can't get the full output of labor. Some part has to be taken away for investment, some part for education, public services, and that. And he said, well, of course, so then uh, right away we have a modification of this, uh, this uh, foolish notion. But it's not exploitation. That would be uh, for no, sound he reasons. Equates the first layer to exploitation. If you accept that definition, then you have yeah. the element of exploitation even on a worker system. Well, on a worker, si worker system wouldn't have surplus value. Because uh, at least it wouldn't deserve to be called that. Surplus value is the characteristic of capitalist production or yeah. private ownership of the means of production. Yeah. The definition of surplus value, according to Marx, is that you don't pay the work the full value of this product. That this applies even in the work of state. Not the full value of this product, that's out of the question, anyhow, but the full value of his labor power. Yeah, he's the labor power. Yeah, he's doing something. The full value of labor power is defined to be. The value of the product tells me. No. No, you see, because now, for example, the cotton and the spindles that goes in there, that's not labor or labor power. Yeah, that's the product is not raw material. Well, you mustn't leave out, in other words, all the capital which is merely reproduced in the product. And Marx talks. The contradiction. He makes no provision for the definition of capital. He only talks about the raw material. But he knows that question. He knows that question very well. And it's in there, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and not only here, but also uh, elsewhere, Mr. Shetty. Now, he knew that very well. But uh, uh, let me see if I can be of any help with respect to some of these difficulties in chapter uh, 17, where he speaks of many things that depend on the difference between productiveness and intensiveness of labor. <clears throat> uh, suppose that it's true that in a day of eight hours, the working man can produce uh, 80 units. Of some output. And suppose
suppose now that there is uh, an invention, and it doesn't have to be incidentally a new form of capital. It could be that instead of some silly way of organizing the process of production, like for example, they they take in all the raw material at the bottom of a very tall building, and then the successive stages of production up from the ground floor up to about 15 stories high, and this out in the middle of a broad prairie. And they're making your automobiles like that, let's say, which means that they have to overcome gravity, gravity carry everything up to the top. Then the, the finished automobile is made up at the top story, and then they have to lower it down in order to get it down. And then somebody thinks this is the wrong way to do this. Now why don't we instead get the raw material up to the top and work the machine down? See, so it gets heavier and heavier as you go. Fine. So as a result of this, they now make 160 per day. All right? Now suppose that to begin with, a man got $20 a day for working. Yes. Now Marx's point is that $20 would at first have been spread over 80 units, but afterwards it's spread over 160 units, that's all. See? So now if this bar diagram again represents the whole length of the working day, Let's just keep in here the difference between the necessary and the surplus labor, just <coughs> This, which used, used to be spread over 80 units, is now spread over 160. But nothing has happened to the relation between the necessary and the surplus labor time. Suppose that it was, the day was divided exactly halfway between the two. That would mean it used to be 40 and 40 in the two halves, and now it's simply 80 and 80, with each unit now getting one half as much of the increment of value that it used to get, that's all. all right. So the essential point about the increase in productiveness is it leads to a decrease in the allocation of labor to each unit of the output. Less increment of labor, uh, value, because less attribution of labor, absorption of labor to each unit. Okay? Now, what about intensiveness? And let's begin in an order which Marx doesn't use. Suppose it were true that in each minute of laboring time, a man put forward X units measured in physical terms of labor. And let's, let, I don't really remember, but let's make believe it's ergs. Does anybody know for sure that ergs is a proper measure of this thing? I don't know. Well, so measure of physical work. Work, very good. All right. Let's suppose in one minute there's an output of some number of ergs. And let's suppose now that something happens, there's a, a campaign or stockonomism or something like this, and now everybody simply works more, harder, as a greater intensity of labor. Now that would mean that what would happen to the output for the whole day? Starting with 80, you should get 160, right? But what's the significant difference between this condition and the other? where productiveness increased, the amount of labor was cut in half in each unit of the output. Here, with intensity increasing, the amount of labor incorporated in each unit of the output is identical. And therefore, double the number of units means double the amount of labor, and therefore twice the value in the course of a day. Is that clear? Increased intensiveness means in a given amount of time, the working men put forward more labor. They work harder. Uh, you could think of the working day as having a density of labor, of energy output, suppose represented by the shading there. And now if the intensity were to be increased, the day would become more dense with, with labor output. So in other words, the notion of the <coughs> variation of intensity of labor denies the assumption that the amount of labor output is directly proportionate to the passage of time. 
On the contrary, the possibility of an increased intensiveness of labor asserts that the expenditure of labor is irrespective, or may be irrespective, of the passage of time. Increased intensiveness means precisely jamming more labor into the same length of time, and decreased intensiveness would, have mean, would of course mean opening up the, the day and decreasing the density of the instance with expenditure of human energy. Is that right? That's why productiveness and intensiveness have those two different effects. If you want, please. Uh, it's also interesting, too, that the, the other difference between them is that the one is external to the worker, the other one is internal to him. I mean, the one you could say stems from the capitalist, the yeah. other stems from the worker himself. That would be one you could say something like this. He, uh, it, well, for, that's in a way altogether misleading, though, because it could be that uh, increased intensiveness <coughs> is the result of a man going over to a certain box on the wall and turning a screw. And that immediately causes the transmission belt carrying the work to go twice as fast as it went before. That's called the speed up. And uh, that's a way of increasing the intensiveness of labor. So it doesn't come necessarily from internally, but you know. In fact, that's the least interesting source of it from his point of view. And now, I, I could give you this very formulaic expression of the difference between increased productiveness and increased intensiveness. Increased productiveness has two different kinds of effects, per unit and per day, and likewise increased intensiveness per unit and per day. Increased productiveness has these effects per unit, less time, less labor, less value per unit, but per day, the same value. All right, so same value per day, more output, less value per unit. All right? Less time per unit, less labor per unit, and also less value per unit, but now increased intensiveness per unit, less time also, like increased productiveness. But equal labor, not less labor, equal labor, and, and therefore equal value per unit, and therefore per day more value. All right, now I've used simply less and more, but you, if you were to use some factor like two or half or something like that, you could make it even simpler. Right? Does everybody uh, have that? I mean, it's worth having in front of you because it makes that chapter very easy to read, and otherwise it's very hard to read. There are all kinds of difficulties. Well, I beg your pardon. The, the intensity, as you described it, comes out to the same thing as lengthening the working day. It has some of the same effects, but so also does <coughs> increased productiveness. They both have some of the same uh, effects as increasing the length of the working day, as, for example, to increase the product. Where would increasing the working day differ from intensiveness in, uh, in what it does per unit? If, if you if you make the uh, make the man do eight hours working six, or just keep him around ten hours till he does eight hours, is it economically the same thing? The difference between the the, the portions of the working day surplus. But that, that would go that goes into the product and is reproduced anyhow through depreciation. So that doesn't matter. I mean, no matter whether you work it or except for the fact that there is some gain in lengthening the working day. That's what Mark said earlier. Because if you let it lie idle, then there's obsolescence for reasons of non-use rather than use. Please. Uh, you said that increased intensiveness has the effect on per day basis of more value. Yes. Yeah, you see, because increased intensiveness means over the same 12-hour period, more, more work is done, more labor is done. With increased productiveness, the same amount of labor is done. It's just cut over, spread out over more, more units of the other thing. But we'll come to that question, I believe, in a minute when we go into his arguments with respect to the three or four different cases, you know, two constant and one variable, rotating the variable one in turn, and then at the last it comes to the variation of more than one. Mr. Brown, did you have a question? I just want to underline the increased intensity does not give more value for energy. No, it 
is equal, no, the, the, my formulation was this. If we increased intensiveness is per unit less time, equal labor and equal value per unit. But for the day, obviously, more units with equal labor each, it's more labor for the day and therefore more value. And now, I mean, we might take up a few of the examples that he uh, gives in chapter 17. He says on page 569, we have seen that the relative magnitude of surplus value and of price of labor power are determined by three circumstances. One, the length of the working day or the extensive magnitude of labor. Two, the normal intensity of labor, its intensive magnitude. And three, the productiveness of labor, whereby the same quantum of labor yields in a given time a greater or less quantum of product and so on. And now what he's going to do is to take these three, I, I would suppose that the German word was moment, these three moments or factors of production, of the productive process. It doesn't mean factors of production in the usual uh, sense of economic theory. And to see how the, the wage can be expected to vary. The price of labor power and, in, and the surplus value can be expected to vary given these changing combinations. The reason for this, for doing this, is that he is now making the transition from the theory of profit to the theory of wages. Of course, that's absolutely a misleading way to put it. He doesn't accept the distinction between profit and wages as it was constructed by political economy. So whereas in an ordinary book in economics of roughly his period, you'd have a, you'd have a section on distribution, which would have a part on wages and a part on profits and a part on interest and so on and so forth. In Marx, you have a book on production, this volume one, and that book on production shows to begin with the theory of value and then how the theory of value leads up through the theory of surplus value to the general theory of the distribution of the added value product socially made. But if you wanted to try to squeeze this into the same framework as the normal books on economics of roughly his time, you would start out with the theory of value, say theory of production of value, and then go from production to distribution. Now, he wants to show how uh, the political economists have not correctly understood the production and distribution, either separately or in their articulation. And for the ordinary formulation, he's now substituting this, which is a very deeply thought out thing and very impressive. But as I say, we're now on our way to part six, where he deals with wages. That's why we're now doing the kind of thing we are. That's why chapter 17 has the title that it has. The price of labor power, obviously, is the preparation for wages. That's next. Right, so now. Uh, length of the working day and intensity of labor, constant, those two, that's the bottom of 569. Productiveness of labor, variable. Now, on these assumptions, he deduces three, I believe, circumstances, and we'll, maybe we'll try to work our way through uh, some of these. <clears throat> a working day of a given length always creates the same amount of value, no matter how the productiveness of labor and with it, the mass of the product and the price of each single commodity produced may vary. All right. If the value created by a working day of productiveness of labor, that's the first rule. What happens when all you do is change productiveness? The whole mass of value produced throughout the day is the same. And the, uh, why can he say that, incidentally? How can he get away with saying that? What's the premise for that? Money is a No. To something, it's, well, that's, that happens to be also true, but uh, uh, that's built directly into the, that follows right out of his two assumptions at the Roman numeral one. Those, that remark that he made would not be, uh, would not be true. A working day of given length always creates the same amount of value and so on and so forth. If he were not assuming a working day of a certain length, naturally. And also, if he were not assuming that that working day of that length always yields the same amount of labor, i.e., the rate of labor output per unit of time is a constant. That is to say, uh, the intensity. 
intensiveness of labor is a constant. So one way to get misled here very easily is to take his general statements as if they were universal. He doesn't mean them that way. You have to take them the way he means them. He says, I'm assuming under Roman numeral one, the things stated in the heading, if those two are held constant and the other one is allowed to vary, then all these things which I assert without constantly repeating, I'm assuming so and so, uh, then they all follow. See, but not otherwise, that must be kept in mind. Now, two, surplus value and the value of labor power vary in opposite directions. A variation in the productiveness of labor, its increase or diminution, causes a variation in the opposite direction in the value of labor power and in the same direction in surplus value. And now this has to be understood a bit in the light of its background. Ricardo and many others had made remarks, observations before about what they called wages and profits. And uh, Ricardo's formulation was very clear. If uh, wages go up, profits have to go down because the two of them come out of a single fund and what uh, it augments one has to uh, diminish the other, assuming always, of course, that productivity is as stated at the given time. Now, Marx's reformulation of this avoids the reference to profits and wages in so many words, because he is interested in this more underlying, more fundamental relation, the relation of the value of the labor power and the surplus value that emanates therefrom. If he had started to talk about profits and wages, that is, they fall into the, the conventional way of describing these things, he would have given up the fruit of all his argument to this point. I only point this out to you because it might be maybe a long time since that you've read Ricardo, and you might not have uh, remembered that it was really part of the same uh, development. Now, if you look at chapter 18 in this book, you'll notice the the effort to restate the conclusions, to correct the conclusions of classical political economy, uh, comes to a, a point in the manner of expressing the relative bulk of the surplus. And he takes issue with the conventional way of putting it, i.e. the computation which is implicit in the traditional notion of profit. I point this out to you prospectively. The reason for the, for the peculiarity of the expression here is the same as the reason for the insistence that the surplus should be stated in a certain way and not in some other way in chapter 18. Because you might very well say, well, who cares whether the amount of the surplus is stated by reference to this denominator or that denominator? And Marx says it makes a great deal of difference for certain reasons, and that's why he has to restate the theory of distribution. All right, so, so, so then that's what he's about here, but now let's look to see a bit more of the details of this, this formulation and why it's true. Surplus value and the value of labor power vary in opposite directions. Now, we could show that very simply by the use of this same diagram that we have here. It amounts to no more than this. If, uh, if this line of the distinction between necessary and surplus labor now could be moved down the other one, and it, it shrinks, therefore n shrinks as, therefore has to increase. That's all that this thing amounts to. That's the, the point of this remark. A variation in the productiveness of labor its increase or diminution causes a variation in the opposite direction in the value of labor power. Why does the value of labor power find a place in this formulation? Value of labor power is simply another way of saying the size of that N. N, the amount of the necessary labor time, or the amount of necessary labor, is an indicator of the value of labor, labor power because this N means that which is necessary to recover the cost of generating a certain amount of energy output for labor power. All right, so what he has done is to express the same thing there in, uh, in two different fo forms. Now, at the bottom of the page, he goes on and says, further, the value of labor power cannot fall, and consequently, surplus value cannot rise 
without a rise in the productiveness of labor. That's the beginning of the last paragraph on the page. I only remind you that, that he understands that this is not a general statement. It's only true given the assumptions of Roman numeral one, uh, page 569. All right, you see, you have to be careful constantly. If you don't read them as he wrote them, you'll think he was wrong where he wasn't. I mean, I'm not averse to finding something wrong in Marx, but uh, I'd rather have it uh, that it's not something right which one finds uh, to be wrong. There are quite a few things which are right. And now, 571 top, there is a useful addition to the argument. It follows from this that an increase in the productiveness of labor causes a fall in the value of labor power and a consequent rise in surplus value, while on the other hand, a decrease in such productiveness causes a rise in the value of labor power and a fall in surplus value. The whole thing comes together there. All right, that's a restatement. Now, Ricardo knew this, apparently, or quite a bit of it, and Marx goes on to say, Ricardo overlooked one circumstance when he formulated this law and so on and so forth, and Marx then goes on to show what he overlooked. It begins after the second semicolon, about the fifth line in that paragraph that has Ricardo overlooked. It by no means follows that they vary in the same proportion. That is to say, the value of labor power and the quantity of the surplus. They do increase or diminish by the same quantity. That's clear. In this thing that we have here, that shaded area is the quantity of the decrease in the necessary and obviously the increase in the surplus. But what Marx is driving at is the proportion that that absolute change will bear to the surplus and to the necessary will be an identical proportion only under one very special case, namely where S and N were equal to begin with. But if S and N are unequal to begin with, as for example this, and now we want to take that as the increment and decrement, respectively, then Marx has this obvious conclusion. This is a very large proportion of that, whereas it's only a very small proportion of this. So you could say that S increased by 25%. And uh, maybe uh, N decreased by 5% or something like that. All right, so that's the point of that observation. <clears throat> now number three, bottom of 571. Increase or diminution in surplus value is always consequent on and never the cause of the corresponding diminution or increase in the value of labor power. That's, the, that's still following from the conclusions from his supposition that it's productiveness only which is varying here and uh, not either the length of the working day or intensiveness of labor. Uh, he goes on to explain more precisely what he means and how he arrives at that in the next paragraph, but we can't stop because I see that there are some other things. Now, but on the top of page 573, yes, here is where he raises the question of the difference between changes in the process of production in wage goods industries, as I have called them, I mean, that is as they're generally called now, but not by Marx, and changes in the other industries. The value of labor power is determined by the value of a given quantity of necessaries. It is the value and not the mass of these necessaries that varies with the productiveness of labor, and so on. So now then, he goes on to consider the effects of changes in the production of necessaries as distinguished from just uh, any old commodities, and I won't uh, go into that. Now, if you turn over on page 574, you'll see in the middle of the paragraph at the top part of the page that uh, here Marx goes on to uh, consider Ricardo's position, and he objects against Ricardo. He therefore confounds together the laws of the rate of surplus value and the laws of the rate of profit. Marx wants that distinction to be kept clear, and the 
full explication or fuller explication of that distinction will become uh, manifest in the comparison of formulas one and two in chapter 18. It's a question of what you compare the surplus with, whether the whole increase of value or only with the necessary part. Now, in this class, Roman numeral two, the working day constant, productiveness of labor constant, intensity of labor variable. Now, that opens up the possibility that within the day there will be more work done, even though the length of the day remains unchanged. And he says so in the first line, so that gives the clue. Increased intensity of labor means increased expenditure of labor in a given time. Now, uh, I think that might be sufficiently clear so that we don't have to spend much effort on it. I would only point out to you that it's in this, uh, page 575, second well, first whole paragraph, only whole paragraph on the page. He says, now, we know that with transitory acceptance, a change in the productiveness of labor does not cause any change in the value of labor power, nor consequently in the magnitude of surplus value, unless the products of the industries affected are articles habitually consumed by the laborers. That's the wage goods industries uh, point, and that if you follow that out, then you'll come to the conclusions, which I think uh, we've already alluded to or pointed towards. In other words, an increase in, in uh, the productiveness of labor in the workings. No, I was going to take the example of something in the wage goods industry. Uh, an increase in the productiveness of labor in the industries that, uh, that make work clothes would lead to a reduction in the price of work clothes. And that would presume, you know, because to say half as much labor came to be in, included in a, uh, in a pair of uh, denim work trousers as before, something like that. Well, then instead of having to pay $8 for them, the man would only have to pay $4, supposed, a simple example. Well, that would be uh, of importance for the value of labor power. But if it were an improvement in the production of... Uh, uh, Austin Healy uh, racing cars or something like that, then presumably that wouldn't have a significant effect on the value of the labor power, at least of many working men. Now, so that's there. Now, the third one that he considers is productiveness and intensity of labor constant length of the working day variable, and I think it, it's not worth our while to follow our way through these things, but you should be able to do that now by yourselves. On the top of 578, there is another one of these remarks which point towards a physical understanding of the economic process. It's the sentence, of course, begins at the bottom of the previous page. The value of a day's labor power is, as will be remembered, estimated from its normal average duration or from the normal, normal duration of life among the laborers and from corresponding normal transformations of organized bodily matter into motion in conformity with the nature of man. That's, uh, that would raise some difficulties, but I can't stop. Well, there are just dozens of things. At the end of this chapter on page 581, he has an interesting observation about how to promote the uh, decrease in the labor done on the average by all men. It's a very simple device. Let everybody pitch in. The trouble uh, has been that, that quite a few people have been living without labor for a very long time, as far as anybody can remember. Now, Marx would uh, suppose that something could be done to improve the opportunities of the hitherto laboring poor to develop themselves and so on. If those parasites who have been living off their labor would begin to do a little something for themselves. You can imagine, like, for example, Marx and Engels, such uh, parasites who would have been very helpful, I'm sure, if they had been put to work in a factory somewhere, or digging uh, something or other. And uh, I can think of maybe a few more illustrations uh, not so very far away. All of us, like, for example, all of us, <laughs> that kind of thing. Well, uh, yeah, now, how he could 
could have written Das Kapital after seven or eight or nine hours work every day, it's a very old question. And whether it wasn't, whether if it wasn't quite defensible that he should not have, have pitched in and done uh, his fair share of the hard carrying, uh, I, I think uh, Mike is a question that could well be raised. Uh, not to mention even some other people who, uh, whose views at least weren't in conflict with their manifest practice and necessities. Now in chapter 18, various formulae for the rate of surplus value. I think by now you understand this sufficiently well so that it's not necessary for us to go over it in detail. But the difference between one and two, formula one and formula two, is the denominator, obviously. That against which Marx wants to express the size of the, the thing in the numerator. Every ratio is the size of the numerator expressed by reference to the size of the denominator as the basic entity of magnitude. And uh, Marx thinks it's quite important which one you use as the, the measuring unit. The very word ratio, I think, suggests the full importance of getting the thing quite straight. Uh, in, if I'm not mistaken, in the Romance languages, the, what we call a proportion or a ratio is, used, is expressed literally by the word reason. Uh, raison? Yeah. So that the ratio or ratio really uh, expresses the reason, so to speak. I, I, I believe that that must have something to do with the, yes. the foundation. Now, well, even more complicated, but surely in his formulation it becomes quite clear that thing against which you compare the numerator makes all the difference for understanding the whole relation. And uh, that, he says on page 584, Instead of the real fact, we have the false semblance of an association in which laborer and capitalist divide the product in proportion to the different elements which they respectively contribute towards its formation. And he's, that's what he doesn't want to appear. It isn't true that they contribute and that this is some sort of an association in which everybody takes something that he put in. And that's the, mis the misleading character of the expression of profit and the ratio of the rate of profit as distinguished from the rate of surplus value as he would like to have it expressed. Now, I think we'll simply have to uh, make some sort of a, a compromise with respect to part six on wages. I think it's not terribly difficult. The only technicalities that arise, which are in any way complicated, are on pages 594 to 598 or nine. Uh, well, generally speaking, in other words, the chapter on time wages, because after that, it becomes less technical. So I, why don't we settle for something like this, that we'll say a few things about chapters 20 and 21 next time, but not so much as to throw the schedule off. And then uh, we'll have the paper on part seven, and that's, uh, who is that? God is the shape. And then we'll spend the rest of the time on part seven. And then the, the, the next time after that on the Monday will be our last session. That will be part eight. And uh, let me see now. That's, I guess. And then perhaps we'll have a little time left so that we can make some summary statement. Yes. I think there is one question which is general interest in chapter six or five. And that is, you refer to that, uh, Marx develops a doctrine of his own. And then this doctrine is a radical restatement of what the classical economists had taught. As the classical economists had kept the appearances, or closer to the appearances, and Marx goes to the hidden reality of the thing, that's the claim. Yeah, he says so. Yeah. Now, this is, I think, raises an interesting question in much beyond Marx, because all social, scientific social science raises this claim that it is not received by the appearances as common sense that brings out the hidden reality. In fairness to Marx, I must say that starting that way, Marx sees it under necessity to explain 
the empiricists, there is a typical as scientific social scientist, simply dismisses them without trying to understand how the appearance arises. I, I would like to develop this next time for a short time. Good. had some things from last time, and then uh, we would uh, clean up the chapter 19 on time wages, and then this was short on part 7, and then we'd deal with subject matter. Yeah, there are only two points which are some general details that I just want to forward entirely without the scope of my knowledge. There is an amount a bit early on page 440, note 3. And that has very much to do with the question which we discussed in connection with the German ideology. You remember? What comes first in time yeah, is not necessarily the cause of what comes later in time. Uh, Marx says the English who have a tendency to look upon the earliest form of appearance of a thing as a cause of its existence, and so on. That has something to do with it. And Marx sees this, of course, as a defect. Oh, obviously. And uh, that is of some relevance, I believe, for the question of historical materials. That food supply and, and this kind of thing come prior to intellectual development in time does not yet establish the fact that the thought, the misproduction, as I call it, is caused by The other point is this more interesting question uh, to which I referred at the end of the last class, and that is around 592, and in this neighborhood. The exchange between capital and labor at first presents itself to the mind in the same guise as the buying and selling of all other commodities. The buyer gives a certain sum of money, the seller an article of a nature different from money. The jury's consciousness recognizes this at most a material difference, meaning not a formal difference, expressed in the juridically equivalent formulae. I give so that you give, as ordinary buy. I give so that you do, it's buying of services, labor. I do so that you give, I do so that you do. You see, so in other words, this is the appearance. All labor is paid. Just as every apple or every pencil is paid. Now, the point which he makes, page 594, the part at the top, in the respect to the phenomenal form, value and price of labor, or wages, as contrasted with the essential relation manifests itself namely the value and price of labor power. The same difference holds uh, that holds in respect to all phenomena and their hidden substratum. The former appear directly and spontaneously as current modes of thought, as common sense. The latter must first be discovered by science. Classical political economy merely touches the true relation of things, i.e. the non-phenomena without, however, consciously formulating it. Here we have three spheres. The first is opinion, yeah? common sense. The second is science in its bourgeois form, as you know. And the third is Marx. Now, this is the great problem we have in the social sciences today, as you know, the famous difficulty, how to reconcile the common sense understanding of political facts with a scientific understanding. If you take the extreme form, common sense understanding is folklore. You, you have read band players, of course, yeah? I mean, people fight for, for pure food. Well, that's only the sham. It's only the sham. Only a fool will believe these people. Like, well, like, unless the propagandist in question happens to be a fool himself, then you can believe him. But if he's a serious man, he doesn't mean, of course, pure food. He gives a damn for that. Yeah, all right. So we, we must forget about the surface, about the opinion, about common sense, and give a scientific interpretation. 
Marx in a way admits that. But Marx does something uh, in, which is absolutely necessary to do if you have such an opinion. They need to explain the appearance and not leave it at very general remarks that it is fully swindled as this kind of thing. He really tries to show by returning from the discovered substance, uh, essence of the thing, to the surface and explains how the common sense opinion could arise. The question, of course, is this. The perspective of the capitalist, to what extent does Marx's point here, which is of some interest, really show the fundamental inadequacy of common sense understanding? <laughs> to what extent does it show it? The common sense understanding which Marx gives to us is that of the capitalist and laborer as exchangers. Is this really common sense? By which I mean this, given certain conditions that will appear that way. But is this not a common sense very uncritically understood? Common sense is not necessarily visible at the first glance as common sense. What I mean is this. One premise is made here, which everyone takes for granted on this basis, which is, of course, not a commonsensical proposition in itself. Labor is a commodity like any other. Even this juristical formula still recognizes somehow the difference by saying, I give that you give. That's exchange of commodities. Why? I give that you do, that you do something. It's not simple commodity. Do you see that? Now, this tacit premise of the whole argument, that labor is a commodity like any other, is, of course, a very dubious premise to which common sense not necessarily assents. The first man who said that labor is a commodity like any other, as far as I know, is Hobbes. It's Leviathan, chapter 24. But that is a very novel way of looking at it. If labor is a commodity, labor can be owned. Can labor be owned? A laborer can perhaps be owned, maybe if he's a slave. Marx refers to that in this connection very interestingly in page 593, third paragraph. We find this individual difference but are not deceived by it in the system of slavery, where frankly and openly, without any circumlocution, labor power itself is sold. But strictly speaking, it is not the labor power is sold, the slave is sold. And the labor power, of course, for the sake of his labor power, but he is sold as slave. In other words, certain commonsensical things, really elementary things, uh, uh, let me begin the sentence again. The fundamental relations among human beings do not come equally clearly to sight in all times. It's this kind of abomination, if we may call it that way, becomes clearly to sight under the condition of slavery. And that is, of course, Marx's contention. Free wage labor is disguised slavery. And that, of course, that would have to be investigated. For Marx himself treats, of course, the slavery as a clue to free labor. So he starts from a situation which was not historically present to him, but of which everyone knew, partly through reports from the southern states in this country, which reveals such a situation of labor power sold as such. Or more precisely, the labor himself sold in a direct way, and where common sense itself recognizes the situation immediately. Marx understands capitalist society to some extent in the light of a pre-capitalist society, that it, it, to some extent, and that is one form. I do not know whether I made clear my point. It is a bit involved, and I would be grateful if you would help me in making it clearer. Is it possible? 
Well, there were a few things that occurred to me as you were speaking. Uh, what Marx doesn't really refer to this other understanding as that of common sense, though. That's no, no. I mean, it's, it's no. not the common sense. It's, it's common sense that are perverted by science, though, some sort of self conscious Yeah, no. Um, let's try to. Marx cannot say this thing of common sense because of his self historicistic attitude. There is a different common sense in every different way, naturally. But I was trying to restate what he's doing in terms free from that blemish, you know, at least in my opinion. But that one must say, apart from all factual and other errors he commits, in this respect I think we can learn something from him. To the extent to which the scientific understanding deviates from common sense, modifies common sense, transcends common sense, it is our duty to understand the common sense view. Otherwise, we do not know whether our scientific substitute for the common sense understanding is truly a substitute for it. Yeah? It may be only an, a, an abstraction, and for that matter, a poor abstraction of from common sense. That is all I want to say. Well, at one point, I thought that the, the same thing was going to happen again, that I was in in danger of, on a number of other occasions, namely that Dr. Strauss was going to pick that passage on the page that I already had thought of as being the object of some discussion. It was on page 594 and deals with the very same question, but it happens to be the first paragraph in time wages rather than the last paragraph in uh, value of labor power and wages, where... 594? No, 594. Yes, where Marx says, wage, wages themselves again take many forms, a fact not recognizable in the ordinary economical treatises, which exclusively interested in the material side of the question, neglect every difference of form. And so, as strangely enough, it appears as if Marx is now calling attention to the need for considering something which is not of the material dimension in order to get a proper understanding. And in fact, he even later on speaks of a transformation, the transformation of form, which is, of course, kind of absurdity, I suppose, to speak of the trans, since the word transform already has that in it, the change of the form. Uh, and this implies that the form has a form and that the transformation of form, so there must be something wrong, and maybe it's just that the translation isn't very sensible. But, but it is it, you, One can see what he means, the transformation of the thing, not the transformation of the form. But a, a particular emphasis on this need for going down deeper into the, the roots of things, which apparently don't become visible by merely considering their material characteristics, at least so he himself says. Yeah. Now, what, what he objects to, of course, is science of a certain kind, economic science, as it has been developed by the, the, uh, the bourgeois economists. And of course, his objection to them all the time is they don't see common sense at all, they don't, they don't, or really sub-common sense. They don't understand what's happening, partly because they're, they're dishonest men, uh, sycophants, he calls them repeatedly, and apologists. And so their, their dishonest service of an interest leads them to say certain things which are false, and Marx always assumes that it's more dishonesty than stupidity, but sometimes you get the impression it's more stupidity than dishonesty. Well, that's a, a nice question in any given case as to which preponderates, but he often he thinks it's, it's dishonesty and uh, says so. While well, he contrasts the, uh, the well-known sycophant and sophist Edmund Burke with that clear-minded and honest man, Bernard Mandeville, uh, you know, that comes up later on. Well, I mean, I, I have no reason to think that Bernard Mandeville was not a clear-minded and honest man, but the reflection on an individual who can publicly prefer the one of these to the other is just, uh, shocking anyhow. Well, right, so what, what Marx is apparently objecting to is science which distorts the understanding of the real phenomena, and then what he's going to do is to provide the economics that gets to the bottom, absolutely. And now one of the things that is difficult about it is brought out very, very clearly by what uh, Dr. Strauss said. Marx indicates that the real character of free labor is shown by reverting to the conditions of slavery. That's when you really see what, what happens. Now there's a very important difference between a, a free man and a slave. 
that the, the difference is indicated by his legal condition, his legal status. Marx is compelled by his understanding of things, his mode of understanding of things, always to depreciate the merely legal or the merely institutional, because that's merely historical. That comes into being and passes away, and that for Marx is decisive, that it comes into being and passes away, merely historical. If you could find some human condition which had more of permanence, but really in, in some genuine sense permanent, then you would know that one had, you had transcended those things which come into being and perish, and then you would have reality. In the first place, as if there were such a thing among men, and in the second place, as if political life were not given its reality by law and convention, which is a very deep question, but which we can't go into now. But it is, in other words, whereas there might be some element of truth in what, uh, what Marx says about some uh, conventional economists, that they fit their understanding to the situation. And that has been sometimes objected to intellectuals generally. It's not only a problem of the economists, you know. That it's not a question of dishonesty either. It's a question of lack of mental power. That one can't get beyond the, the immediate and the visible and therefore mistakes it for the permanent and the true. That's not only a question of bourgeois economics. It's a much wider question. But suppose even that this were true, there, is, uh, there still remains the larger problem, whether all political life isn't given its character by the formality. The formality comes from form. The form, the form of the political society is manifested in formality. That formality, which looks like something perfectly transitory and accidental, and which in a certain sense is, but in another sense isn't, which you could say is the, the real the misunderstanding of the ground of political life flows from the, the doctrines of men like Rousseau. The, the real foundation of a true and generous and unhypocritical human life is in a way of falling away from formality and a self-expression of the individual in all this idiosyncrasy. Well, idiosyncrasy is the opposite of formality, which means the fitting of the individuals to a more general constraint. Without that, political life, strictly speaking, is impossible. And on that basis, one can see why Marxism is a radicalization of Rousseau and leads to the withering away of the state, i.e. of, of uh, all formality and merely the, the homogeneous mass of humankind. Distinctions break down, formality, evanescent is transcended, and then man finally comes into his own. That, I suppose you could say, is the real basis of Marx's misunderstanding through science. His science has also its defect, uh, which is uh, akin to the defect that he finds in the science of the bourgeois economists. They can't get a proper understanding of the reality element in the transitory and in the permanent. But that's a very wide question. And I think maybe we ought not to try to go uh, go further into it. But on the other hand, on, uh, today, maybe more than any other time, it makes some sense to give a little thought to these very broad questions with the representatives of the principal Marxist society in an, an uncommonly aggressive mood and bringing forcefully to everybody's attention the possibility of uh, a certain future for all mankind. That, uh, that has to be thought about a bit. But now, I think... With Mr. Schick's indulgence, I'll take a few minutes to get rid of it, but really just a very few. And then we'll come to the paper for part seven. Now, I wanted to call to your attention that early passage in chapter 20 on time wages. And uh, then to point out to you that down further on the same page, Marx refers to the distinction between nominal and real wages, which is taken from ordinary economic discourse of the time and is still made use of. And then he develops the distinction between the, the money value of a given quantity of labor as a price and the money value of a given quantity of labor as a wage. We spoke about that last time. Price means hourly and wage means uh, daily or weekly. And then the rest of his discussion has to do with the effect on the price per unit of labor of changes in the working 
day, the length of the working day, uh, through the ratio of the price and the wage. That's uh, meaning by what I've just uh, described it to be. Generally speaking, let me remind you, he is developing in this part of capital, which uh, is part six, the Marxian counterpart of the theory of distribution, which was present in Ricardo very manifestly, and in the other classical economists. And he is trying to show what it is that affects the distribution of the increment to value between labor and the capitalists. And he tries to show that Ricardo's analysis did not go far enough, that Ricardo understood the effects of differences in productiveness, but didn't, didn't take up the effects of differences in the intensiveness and in the, of labor and also in the length of the working day. That Ricardo assumed those things to be uh, constant, and uh, Marx shows how their constancy is only one out of a very large number of cases. And there are other things, in other words, that affect that distribution between the two classes. Uh, and I, I should point out to you, incidentally, that the thread of the argument that links parts six and seven is this very interest, the same thing, the division, the distribution of the increment to value as between the classes, the capitalist and the laboring class, how that distribution is affected, and also what social consequences, you might say, or maybe more exactly what economic consequences the manner of that distribution has. And finally, the ground, and maybe even the moral ground, as well as the strictly technical ground, for having such a distribution. So let me make that a bit clearer. A conventional defense of allocating some part of the increment to value to the employing class is the employing class saves in virtue of their having rather large income, more than what they need to keep alive, they are able to save. Therefore, they perform a social function. And this is a kind of justification for the private ownership of the means of production. I mean, I put this very broadly now. And Marx is trying to get once more to the root of this function and to see what really happens when there is capital formation, which is a term he doesn't use, but it's the equivalent of like, accumulation as it turns out to be in the later part. And of course, his, his conclusion is that the capitalists do not perform a, an indispensable function, but that they can easily be dispensed with. And he tries to show both on moral and technical grounds, if I may make that distinction, that once more, the whole burden of the economic process rests on the back of the working class. And every progress comes eventually out of their skins and uh, nowhere else. That's the general line that this, these last several parts have. Finally, he's going to take up the question of how it all began, which is really an ancillary question. It's not uninteresting. It's a subordinate question. He's compelled to answer the question, did the process of accumulation begin in some acts of labor by the capitalist class, obviously not the present individuals, but was it a long time ago true that some people worked very hard and were very parsimonious, and they were, in other words, the rational and industrious? And the, and the rationality and industriousness of a, an early generation of capitalists is responsible for the present distribution of wealth. Or is it not rather true that there was plundering to begin with, and you can't even find that petty justification for the present system? as would arise out of some legality, say, or decency in the primary act of accumulation. You can imagine what his answer will be, but that was the, uh, that's the, the point at which the argument in Book One of Capital comes to a, a halt. Well, I didn't mean it even to take up this much time, because otherwise we'll have a terrific problem. But Book Eight happens to be very short, incidentally. So I think what, I can already see what's going to be happening. I think what we'll do is to do all the chapters in I beg your pardon, part eight, all the chapters in part seven this time, except for the general law of accumulation, which is the last and the longest chapter in part seven. Let's hold over that chapter for next time, together with part eight, which is very short, and then we can hear Mr. Schick now on the whole of part seven, and I'll try to discuss all the chapters except that last one.
leaving at 04 next year. Well, especially toward the end there, Mr. Sheik, you raised quite a few interesting questions. Well, we'll come to those, I think, after we dispose of simpler ones. But, uh, there are a few things that occur to me, unless Dr. Shash, you'd rather take off first. Uh, uh, well, and now, as you rightly say, Marx did encourage the overthrow of the uh, current order. Uh, but uh, I believe you take the impression that Marx's view of the superiority of the succeeding condition depended on a superior opportunity for acquisition or accumulation under those conditions. Was that the drift of it? I didn't quite understand how the principle, the economic principle, changed from capitalism to communism because acquisition still seemed to be the goal. Accumulation still seemed to be the principle. Well, I don't think one couldn't say that about Marx. At one point, and I think it would take me too long to try to find that passage again, but the point of it was the real advantage of the post-capitalistic order will be this self-development of the individual and this, this free work and expression of his idiosyncrasy and all his powers and so on and so forth. Accumulation is, strictly speaking, out of the question. Well, this is not really the expression of his economic Well, either way, I think, because the... The common ownership of the means of production simply rules out accumulation in the ordinary sense. Yeah, accumulation in capitalist sense, but uh, isn't wealth still uh, desirable? Yeah, sure. That, that there would have to be a sufficient space in adequate private consumption for all this development of the self is true. But it isn't clear, either from Marx or from other sources, exactly what level of consumption has to be guaranteed for those purposes. Now, when he says from each according to his ability and to each according to his needs, he's, he's saying that some people will require only that a little. And for them, that's all that they should have. And uh, as should be added, they will regulate this by themselves, this indescribable uh, uh, morality or conscience that will be present in all people that will prevail. But somehow or other, that will operate. And then some people will have little, and other people will have much. And I think he probably didn't mean that some people are by nature acquisitive or avaricious, and therefore they will have houses with swimming pools and uh, chauffeur-driven cars and so on and so forth, and then other people are naturally uh, ascetic, and uh, they, they'll live in garrets. And this is purely out of choice, you know, that kind of thing. But I believe what he meant was Everybody will have very modest ambitions along these lines, but what they need for their uh, painting and sculpture and, uh, you know, spare time activities, little things like this, which could be mountain climbing too, and, you know, it, it dissolves into a sort of dream. Why well, did we discuss this amount of accumulation of fields tremendous over reading and content after the attack? But uh, only that it just seemed to me that we have to be the form of revolution idea of uh, natural rights and property and uh, thereby uh, you can really ask up that Mr. Shaker on this understanding why because the very last sentence in the book uh starts to use uh the whole uh book yeah if uh actually you don't mind. Yeah. Um now you're poaching on Mr. Phillips's yeah. uh, Property. Uh, the capitalist mode of production accumulation, therefore, capitalist private property after the fundamental condition, the annihilation of self private property. Yes. And this, in other words, expropriation is something that seems to be more than one of uh, expropriation. Yes. In some sense, property is still to be desirable. Uh, May I suggest that we look at page 639? Yes. <laughs> to which I have the book open. <laughs> yeah, on the right hand side where he speaks in effect of Marx's principle. Yeah, yeah. But that is the yes, and that got transformed. That's the trouble. It was overridden. It, but whereas before, really well, he says, at first the rights of property seem to us to be based on a man's own labor. And so on, at least some such uh, thing was necessary. Yeah, 
the, the state breaks down, I mean, these artificial distinctions break down, all you have is, in a certain sense, the most natural things of all, the individual and all the individuals, the one and the many, but not the other species, but he, he's a bit unhappy about that idea, and sometimes objects to it, but other times makes use of it, because the notion of the species apparently leads to some idea of the permanence rather than the evolution of the, the species, and he would rather not have that idea again and put all But that's very clear. The individuals have an absolute totality of all the individuals with the dissolution of the things in the middle. Those, if one could properly articulate those two, those two poles, I think one would really have it in Marx. That, that would give one a very good framework for understanding uh, the whole thing. But I, I cut you off three or four times. Well, I didn't even try that much, just to go through Yeah, sure. Uh, mm -hmm. It's got to be a lot of time, but it would be good at the time, which is good at times. And in this sense, uh, Marx is pushing the world as a moral battle for us. So, line by line, Caleb, uh, okay. the further higher position, say, for example, the first of the evening. One reason I should think why Marx would uh, use the science for us is that's the best society. Because he kept his notes so close to the ground to be concise, which is kind of suggested um, as such is not uh, one of the philosophical of it or the glory to be well, something along that line I think we would all agree with that uh, that there is some sort of a sugar. But that that Marx has supposed that mankind would be better off out of poverty than in it, that's clear. But so would everyone else say so. And if that's what one means by saying he had something in common with the bourgeois economists, then one would have sure one would have to grant that. He didn't like the poverty of millions of people, you know, brown down, all that sort of thing. And he thought that a more uh, sensible system of distribution, based on a more sensible mode of production, that goes without saying it has to come first, would abolish the problem of poverty. Sure. Now, there have been various formulas for the abolition of poverty, one of them having been a classical economic one. Yeah. But that has to be understood. Smith said that there would be 500 poor for every rich one. But the poorest would be much better off than even the well to do under some radically different economic The absolute master of the lives and liberties of 10,000 naked savages, yes. That the, the poorest European test would, would uh, enjoy more of the necessaries and conveniences of life, uh, by and large. I mean, it's not quite so simple, but something like that. Yeah. Now, so that would be the abolition of poverty within some limits. The abolition of poverty, absolutely. But no possibility for abolishing poverty if poverty means just that you have less than someone else. If poverty is tantamount to inequality, then that's out of the question. That can't be valid. Marx would say that's, that's not necessarily true. And in fact, he would say the contrary. The real abolition of poverty we now see, in any sense whatsoever, depends upon the amelioration of the distributive order of arising out of the mode of production. And that is a real, a very important difference. And when you said that he was a, a revolutionary, uh, I took you to mean exactly that, that there was such a difference between his understanding and that of the, the predecessor view, that nothing except a, a cataclysm would like, yes. bring it about. He was revolutionary in some far as he did uh, Chapter 23 is, you know, very well, chapter 23 is called Simple Reproduction. 
and chapter 24, the conversion of surplus value into capital. And what's the difference between those, the two subject matters? Do you happen to recall very broadly? something about progressive accumulation being an increase at an increasing rate or something like that, and this was more or less the point that I thought we ought to get straightened out on. Simple reproduction could be described in, well, in non-Marxian economic terminology as uh, no net capital formation. And the conversion of surplus value into capital is positive net capital formation, but not at an increasing rate necessarily. It might turn out, it could be, that if you if they keep doing it all the time, that there would be compounding because the surplus value on the basis of the previous increment of capital would be larger than before, and therefore, you know, it's the same principle of compound interest, plainly. It, yeah, his discussion breaks down into these two parts, with capital formation and without capital formation. If no capital formation, uh, no net capital formation, I'll, I'll discuss this in a minute, then the whole thing, surplus value, is simply the consumption of the, uh, of the capitalists. See, so they live very well, that kind of thing. Now, he would like to know, how does the situation change from that sort of position, if it ever existed? Now, I mean, it's not historical necessarily, but what's the meaning of going from simple reproduction to uh, net capital formation. That's why this thing about abstinence comes up in the next chapter. See, that's why all those questions get dealt with. What is it that brings it about that the capitalists don't apply the whole surplus value to their present enjoyment? See, i.e. consumption. Well, uh, that's what we uh, should pay a little bit of attention to more systematically, but uh, Dr. Strauss, did you have a hand? I remember I had one point I would like to uh, evidence uh, in connection with the one we discussed before in the previous video. I think it is absolutely necessary, Mr. Shri, to keep in mind that Machiavelli doesn't have an absolutely indefensible slip of the tongue because for Machiavelli, the realm of necessity is eternal, and for Machiavelli, for Marx, it's not eternal. So I apologize to you. And then a Marx whole notion of communist society presupposes a moral regeneration of mankind, and this implies the disappearance of the profit motive in any manner, shape, and form. Marx is the heir to the German philosophy, as he already stated, to the Kant-Hegelian resurgence of the higher and nobler against the slow and solid, not to say sordid, affiliation of the class of the lives. And this very sense. Now this way. the other point which you made, and that, which you made very forceful, is this. And, and, and I believe we have not stated this either too simply and clearly enough. The simple coincidence of analysis and indictment in Marx. Every step of the analysis is a, a nail driven into the moral coffin from the sense of capitalism. And, and now a few points, for example, it's a surplus analysis. Chapter 2 begins. Yeah? Flaw is a plain word for what you call surplus. Then another point, first is flaw. Still you can say, well, there are, <laughs> there are solitary frauds, perhaps. No. It is a capitalist process is a degradation of the many by the degraded few. Okay. Number three, the degraded and the frauded are the majority, and therefore in the long run the stronger. Yeah. And fourth, there is no turn. No, and I think of course one would have to pursue, and I thought in this section today, as a crucial point, it seems to me, as far as indictment is concerned, is this. 
Marx still argues until chapter 8 from the premise, maybe at the beginning, the capitalist is honest man. Meaning that the capital is congealed labor, i.e. his own labor. And was it it's wrong there, is it? Taking the premise that everyone has a right to the product of his own labor, and if he really types his belt and uh, abstains, that is uh, okay. Now, Marx makes here this point, I think in chapters, in part seven, which struck all capital now, even if it is original, honest as a labor, is acquired by exploitation because the simple reproduction, that I think is a moral meaning of that, the simple production is a transformation of this honest belt into dishonest belt, you know? And then, of course, he comes in finally with an eighth part in which he says there was never a trace of honesty in capital because the accumulation was, was robbery. Yeah. Okay, is it not wrong? Yeah. So Marx is, of course, as the opposite pole of any value for the social sciences that has to be said because, uh, to repeat, every step of the analysis is an indictment. And the relative power he wants must have had is due to the fact that he starts from principles, and that I believe is the point where you were seduced into some error, that he starts from certain moral principles which were universally admitted, or quasi universally admitted. For example, labor is the origin of our value, and every laborer has the right to the product of his labor. And he says, all right, let us argue from that. And then I show you that uh, you have no leg to stand. It's Human happiness. But 
God doesn't exist from the atheistic point of view. You have to discern the reality hidden by God. This reality in its ultimate form, in its most developed form, is captured. And therefore one can say that is really uh, the, the whole philosophy of man is becomes concentrated. The whole philosophy becomes concentrated in an answer of But you have to have studied before Feuerbach. Uh, but that Marx takes on Marx rather than Lenin. You know, and it follows. Yeah, well, uh, this, this point sometimes has occurred to me in the form of that formula that philosophy culminates in philosophy of history and philosophy of history culminates in economics. Yeah, yeah, it's the same thing. Yeah, but the, the, the problem of the mode of production is reflected in religion, as he yeah, says. Sure. Yeah. And so everything that one finds believed among men, and particularly, particularly believed on that subject, is simply a reflection of man's miseries. Yeah. And so it, it, yeah. Yeah, sure it follows. Yeah, the economic aspect of Marx is by no means simply a sideshow that he found he had to go into in order to conduct his journalistic affairs properly, but that has a more solid foundation. Well, and now, so very briefly then, in chapter 23 on simple reproduction, he uh, sets the stage, well, he sets the stage in the preamble to part seven generally, where he says that he will take as his problem the, the conversion of a sum of money into means of production and labor power. This takes place in the market and so on and so forth. In other words, he's reminding you of the series Money, Commodities, Money, which was dealt with earlier. And this is, a, in fact, the elaboration, the fuller, the elaboration of that process dealt with in uh, the earlier part. Now, it's a simple reproduction. He begins the discussion top of page 620. Uh, no society can go on producing. In other words, no society can reproduce unless it constantly reconverts a part of its products into means of production. So the last time, if I remember correctly, the question came up whether Marx understood anything about taking something away from the output of labor, you know, in order to keep the machinery of society going, and if anybody has had any doubts, then his reading of part seven should set them at rest for all time, because this is the, the discussion of that question. Now, the, he carries the argument forward. If production be capitalistic in form, so too will be reproduction. Page 620, middle. And that means that the process of production and reproduction will have this much in common. They will be affected, not to say they will have as their essence uh, the circumstance that some part of labor is paid for and another part of labor is not paid for. So the phenomenon of, of surplus value, that is going to turn out to be the guiding fact in the discussion of reproduction. Now he gives the basic definition of simple reproduction at the top of page 621. If this revenue, which is the surplus value, if this revenue served the capitalist only as a fund to provide for his consumption and be spent as periodically as it is gained, then other things being equal, simple reproduction will take place. All right, so that means, in other words, if the surplus value goes to the enjoyment of capitalists as individuals, then there will be nothing but the keeping up of the level of the capital at its original state. Now, at this point, I might remind you of some elementary uh, discoveries of more recent economics. Some of you, because it be, it's uh, pertinent to the present chapter and to the one that follows, you probably are aware that in the so-called national income accounting, there is a category called the gross national product. The gross national product is defined as a certain sum of expenditures on consumption and investment and expenditures by government. Right? And you'll start, you, everybody has heard also of a, a category called the net national product as well. Incidentally, gross and net, uh, well, I mean, it's like a, 
like a vaudeville team, you could say, where you, wherever is gross, net can't be far behind. I mean, the two things only have any meaning, the one in the light of the other. Now, the meaning of uh, that turns on a certain qualification of the investment element. So in order to make this clearer, let's replace investment in the gross formula by growth investment and investment in the net formula by net investment. Is there anybody who hasn't at one time or other been herded through this material? I mean, everybody has, well, almost everybody <laughs> has been driven through this material for one reason or another. Now, does anybody have to recall the difference between gross and net, net investment? Net means depreciation. Yeah, depreciation. That's, that's the quantity that makes the difference. Now, the only reason for taking your time with this is depreciation is very important in the Marxian formulation. Depreciation is, in other words, the wearing away of the spindle. You know, in the textile example, it's part of what goes into the product, but it's not any part of the value added, which is correct. I mean, I say it's correct. The correctness of it is, is vouchsafed by the fact that it's also asserted by non-Marxian economics. <laughs> now, this, this depreciation, then, can be taken out in the, from the form that we have it here. We could concentrate on the second column and say gross investment. Suppose it should be true that the whole amount of the investment in a given year should be exactly equal to the amount of the depreciation that year, by which I mean the following. Suppose that one could determine that the wearing away of machinery, the grinding down of the, the brakes on the railroads and the wearing away of the rails and the, you know, all that sort of thing, that comes to a value, suppose, of 40 billions of dollars in the course of a year. And suppose it should turn out to be true that when you add up all the acts of investment by all the producers, that, 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 that they add up again to a total of 40 billion. Excuse me, when you say growth Equipment, which could be machine moving parts or not moving parts, domestic construction, housing construction, and then something else called the net foreign balance, which is the algebraic sum of the imports and the exports on the current account. Now, then this is called domestic investment, and that's called foreign investment, and gross investment is the sum of the two. I beg your pardon, that plus inventory is very important. And now when you take all of those together, and you consider what has been allocated to that in a year as against what has been subtracted from it by the, in the course of the process of production through friction, obsolescence, everything. Then you get gross investment minus the depreciation equaling the net investment. Now, my, my point is this. Suppose when you add up all that which has been done by the way of investment in the course of the year, it turns out to be 40. And then if uh, you find out that the amount of the depreciation is exactly the same, then you could say what has happened that year was that people fed themselves, clothed themselves, and so on and so forth. And then in addition, they allocated some part of their productive activity to maintaining the capital structure so that it didn't shrink. And that's all they did. They just kept it up to the level that it did. That's what I would mean by saying gross investment equal to depreciation. Obviously, then, the difference between the gross investment minus depreciation under those conditions would be equal to zero. That's the condition which Marx is describing when he talks about symmetry production. What has happened to 
it up to the surplus of the society, the whole society. I'm not talking about surplus value, forget about that way of conceiving things. What has happened to the whole surplus of the community, the amount that they generated above what they actually needed in order to, uh, to keep going? Was there any surplus? Well, there was a surplus so far as depreciation had to be taken care of. There was a capital item, but there was no net capital item. You see? So above consumption, above consumption, there was a certain amount. How much was it? The amount equal to depreciation. That amount went back into the machine for nothing more to build up. Now, from this, you could say these people lived high on the hog. They must have enjoyed themselves. Now, if they had, had tightened their belts a bit, you know, then they could have been net investment. But net investment equal to zero is the condition in which gross investment and depreciation are identical in amount. Now, I point that out because some of you might know this very well and not have thought of connecting it with Marx's condition of simple reproduction. Simple reproduction means that. Zero net investment. Now the depreciation, what about that in Marx's system? Where does the depreciation go? Yeah, it goes into the value of the product. It's not part of the value added, it's part of the value transferred. In say in non Marxian terms, how is that uh, provided for? How does the capitalist come to get a sum at the end of the year with which to replace the worn away capital? What comes from the sale of the product, doesn't it? The, the, the product has a value which is composed of two elements. The value transferred from existing labor congealed and the value added by living labor. Right? So the value is the sum of already existing value plus value added. That, it finds its way into the price. That's a complicated question. Let's make believe it's settled. And Mark says he won't go into it here. And it's all right. There's no point going into it. So that if the object is worth $100, and the reason for that is that $80 worth of value has been transferred from previous labor, crystallized uh, things, and $20 worth has been added, Marx would say, along with the conventional economists, somewhere out of that $80 must come up with a fund you know, out of which the four shillings for the spindles and so on will be accumulated, and which will then, at the end of a certain length of time, when the spindles are to totally worthless and their whole value has been transferred to the yarn, will they'll be able to be replaced. So that's exactly what's said in this a somewhat different form. These are, so to speak, universal facts, at least as far as anybody has been able to uh, understand them, whether Marxists or not Marxists. The, the process of production leads to a degeneration in the means of production, and there has to be some regeneration out of the act of exchange. Otherwise, the resources of the community will subside to an unworkable level. And this is what Marx is saying in non-Marxian terminology, but which could be much more familiar to you, which I, I know some of you have uh, had. Anyhow, now in Marx's language, this distinction between gross investment and net investment or the quantity of depreciation finds a reflection in the distinction between variable capital and constant capital. But it's not exactly the same thing. The constant capital is the the amount spent on those things which merely go into the product and which have to be recaptured in order simply to keep the level of the machinery and other goods, non-human uh, non goods, at their original status. And then above that, there is the surplus value, which is provided out of the variable capital which comes about as a result of the investment of the variable capital because of the phenomenon of the unpaid labor. So out of that cream that rises to the top of the
application of the variable capital comes the possibility for net investment. That net investment is what Marx takes up in the next chapter. Now, what is the other point that he speaks of in the chapter on simple reproduction, which I have to mention to you, is, has already been in a way uh, simply disposed of by a remark of Dr. Johnson before, that no matter how legitimate the primary accumulation might have been, carrying on the process of production under capitalistic forms uh, obliterates that original legitimacy, if any, because after a period of time, and Marx shows you how you can calculate that period of time, after a period of time, all the original capital has been replaced by a, an aggregate of surplus value which has been piled up after the present time. So uh, maybe within the first three years of the beginning of the capitalistic system, one could say that there was still a, the fruit of the accumulator's own labor in it, maybe. But after some period like 10 or 15 years or some such, but, which means, in other words, that it's absolutely irrelevant and have no interest whatsoever. So the whole fund of capital as it now exists is the result of the exploitation of the real sources of surplus value, i.e. the proletariat. Then from this, Marx goes on to draw another conclusion, which which is aimed at what orthodox economists, and it's a good thing to have this in mind all the time. Almost all his conclusions provide the basis for a further criticism of some point in classical economics. <clears throat> who is it who really gives the working men their subsistence? And now if you look at Ricardo or Smith and other classical economists, it, it appears as if this is advanced to them, to the workers, by the capitalists, out of some fund or wealth or something that really belongs to the employer. Marx said, no, if you think of the source of capital, it is, say variable capital, which is equal to the wages paid, that's simply the surplus value from a previous generation, not a previous human generation, but a previous economic generation. He, he, he speaks of the necessity for this process continuing repetitively, stage by stage by stage. And at any given point, the mass in existence is simply the process of the, or the result of the previous few stages. What is it at any given time? What is being advanced to the working man? Answer, the surplus value of their own recent activity and of their elders in the race of working men. So that to try to provide a, a mild ground for capitalism on the proposition that the capitalists advance something to the working men, I leave, leave out altogether the time question, which Marx dealt with also, whether it's an advance or whether it's not an a posteriori you know, payment out of work already done, but leave that alone. So there isn't any advancing. Uh, it's not that, work, that working men are being given something which belongs rightly to somebody else for them to live on for the time being. But on the contrary, what they're being advanced has only been stolen from them to begin with. And now it's being given back to them under the guise of some pseudo-humanitarianism. Though it's a very strong uh, statement, that, as you can tell by listening to it. And it's part of Marx's very... Uh, strong argument. Now, that, of course, has something to do with the abstinence thing, which turns up in the next paper. Well, I'm sorry, there's a really important question that comes with it. How is what Marx calls the zero-sum game of production accounted for by present-day non-Marxists? Or is this different? Well, in, or in, in other words, by what right is it now understood that yeah. that, 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 that profit exists? Well, Frank Knight wrote a famous book called Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit, in which the general thesis is that the organization of the process of production involves a foreseeing, an arrangement with an eye to certain things that can't be properly known. They can only be estimated or guessed at. And therefore, the people who do it have to be compensated on the kind of actuarial principle. 
that there must be enough in it socially. I mean, not for this individual, maybe, because you look at any individual, you could easily lose everything. But for the whole class of operators of that activity, there must be a compensation to make it worth their while. Otherwise, they would all become employees. But that's, in a way, nonsense, because of whom would they become the employees if this thing were socially unprofitable, let us say, unprofitable in the aggregate? So that was one of the ideas. Then there was also abstinence. But generally speaking, people don't make much of that anymore. Knight's thesis is quite, well, you know, because that sounds as if it's a uh, uh, value judgment, among other things, that it's good to abstain, and, and who would ever be found in public saying such a thing? But, yeah, well, it is, in a way, contradictory, as Marx points out, that abstinence should be the basis of, a, of the high standard of living. It's, uh, well, I think, generally speaking, what people have tended to do when they think about the question at all, which is rarely, is to say that it has to be done. Somebody has to do it. Under a situation of private property, it has to be worthwhile. Or, in simple language, somebody, the men who do it, have to be able to live on it. They also take this rather social point of view. All things which have to be done have to be done by living men. And that means that from the nations, they must get enough to live by. Now then the question is exactly how much is necessary in order to get each kind of individual to do the work that he's called on to do. And then if that problem breaks down, the solution breaks down. It doesn't break down formally because there is a device which has been adopted, namely the transfer of the notion of rent from the rent of land to all other distributed shares. And uh, this is the famous stock example. Uh, is it true that some motion picture actor or actress would, would not continue to do his work if he were not paid $200,000 a year? Suppose the answer is no. He would not stop doing his work. He would continue. Then how, how far down could you go before you'd get to the point at which he'd say, I'd rather become a bus driver or something like this? It might be you'd have to go down to about $10,000 before he would actually change his occupation because he likes being famous and, and so on and so forth. So then they say, well, $190,000 of his, his income is rent, and the other is, uh, is wages or labor, uh, payment for labor service. With the understanding that the justification for rent has nothing to do with the provision of any labor service. Uh, of course, rent comes from the idea of the land, the payment for what Ricardo called the original and indestructible properties of the soil or something like that. Then, in other words, it becomes simply a question of supply and demand and uh, not the sacrifice on the part of the individual, which requires a certain compensation. So that's what I mean by saying that the, the the explanation of distribution in a way breaks down. But economists are, are not happy with the theory of distribution. That's where they're most visibly confronted with the, the moral question, so to speak. I mean, how can you talk about distribution without saying something about rights and wrongs? And so it sort of gets, uh, to the extent to which it can be done, it's transformed into another part of marginal utility theory. But it doesn't altogether work. Now, I thought that we were going to leave on, open only one more, one chapter, the general law of capital accum capitalist accumulation, but I believe we're going to have to leave open also the question of the conversion of surplus value into capital, that is to say, net capital formation greater than zero, and what that means, but that's not difficult. I will only point out to you by anticipation, on page 642, you can be treated to one of the rare uses in a technical economic treatise of the term the just price. Yeah, and I mean not in a historical sense, but uh, he's talking about the just price, meaning it seriously on the right hand side of the page, 642, exactly the middle of the page. If labor of B is employed with surplus values produced by labor A, then, in the first place, A supplied this surplus value without having the just price of his commodity reduced by one farthing, and so on and so forth. Uh, 
You know that's a term with a long prehistory. People have sometimes said that there's something about Marx which is reminiscent of uh, much earlier times. And some people even have said that Thomas Aquinas. Uh, I think most people who do that mean to disparage Marx by saying so and to imply that there is what's called scholasticism about it, which is uh, in some people's minds only the same thing as uh, strict deduction. But of course, it doesn't necessarily only mean that. Now, uh, Marx did have a very sad, uh, in part seven and part eight, particularly, Marx is concerned with the morality of the distributive order or the justness of it becomes very manifest, very clear. And uh, you might uh, notice this and also try to understand on what ground he can speak so indignantly about cheating, which he does, about injustice, if he doesn't uh, provide a sound basis for understanding man's morality, maybe by some reference to what uh, uh, human beings are. You know, the old question, human nature, otherwise somebody will come and say to Marx, well, your understanding of, of uh, cheating and so on, that's purely provisional, it doesn't depend on human nature or the ground of human behavior, but that's just pure preferences, Marx. Grace is difficult. If, if um, Locke's contribution was to make the spirit of the government simply that of providing rules for correcting basic individual actions on um, fundamental things like when they just die and they die and such things, could it be said that it was Marx's task to return to the political um, the spirit of distributed justice? Yeah, well, one could maybe say something like that, but always disturbed by the recollection that Marx's formulation ends in the withering away of the state or the political life. So that uh, it's, it would be misleading, I think, to say that Marx was attempting to restore the political. He was, I suppose you might say, trying to find a basis for justice without reference to the political. Uh, all over. Can you say in Marxist final formula of justice and the destruction of the political is implied? Because the political justice by its laws is distributive justice. From everyone to his capacities, to everyone according to his deserts. And Marx says to everyone according to his needs. This sexist tourism of justice. But one point uh, became clear to me now in the last uh, discussion, and I think in order to understand Marx's uh, argument regarding justice, one must distinguish two levels. And, and that is perfectly good. I mean, I don't say this critically of Marx, I say this only as uh, that's defensible. First of all, he has a kind of commonsensical notion of justice, to which it belongs, as a rule belongs, uh, how do you say, everyone has a right to the fruit of his own labor. Yeah? It's justice. But this is not the highest standard, as appears from the fact that in the final society, Everyone has the right to what he needs, yeah? uh, you know? And in other words, this is still mercenary. It's still mercenary, and that is, however, the highest standard of justice you can expect hitherto in human history. And capitalism is morally bad because it does not live up even to this average standard. But then, when capitalism will be superseded by communism, we will get a perfectly non-mercenary justice, if we can still call it justice. And that is from everyone to his capacity and to everyone to his needs. But he is, of course, perfectly justified in, in um, applying the common sense standard of justice to any given situation. It's not, not, after all, in all the moral thinking, we have uh, somehow a distinction of two notions of, of yeah, if we call it justice. So, I mean, something which is generally speaking practical, and then that which is simply perfect, yeah, that uh, we would find everywhere. And I think, you know, that is probably, I feel it would be a little of course. Marx tries to destroy the politics. Yeah, and the, the simple formula is the dial of distributive justice. 
Society, according to his foxy capacities, the mafia, and he must, of course, get also the reward for it, meaning very great authority and also lots of gravy, which goes men, of course, you know. I mean, uh, <coughs> they don't pick a young Russian uh, a working man's daughter by lot for accompanying Mr. Khrushchev to Washington, they take Mr. Khrushchev's daughter as they would do in every other society, you know that? But that is, however, the political standard which Marx rejects as below the true dignity of man. Now this, of course, I mean the notion of something trans-political and always exists. And there is always a way as a standard. And I don't know if it was a political, but it was always understood that the political is for you with man. And Marx ever thinks uh, the political can be abolished. consider the dynamic, so to speak, of the proportion between constant and variable capital, he had to begin with considered that relation in order to amplify the labor theory of value and to lay the basis for the proposition that the increment of value comes only from a certain kind of investment, namely the investment in variable capital or the sum of the wages paid, as he sometimes puts it. Now, here his purpose is not that, uh, say, analytical purpose or instantaneous purpose, but his purpose is to try to say something of the change in the ratio of constant and variable capital, as that change must necessarily take place by reason of the inner laws of the working of capitalism. Something must happen to the proportion of constant and variable capital as, cap as capitalism itself uh, develops over time. Now that ratio is what Marx calls the organic composition of capital, and that organic composition of capital turns out to have a very important function in a context that doesn't arise in, in uh, book one of capital at all, and so we can uh, dismiss it for present purposes. This organic composition of capital, I remind you, has two aspects or sides. One of them is what Marx calls the value side, and the other is the material side. What he means there is the ratio between the values of the constant and the variable capital, and the ratio, on the other hand, between the mass, whatever that might mean, of the constant and the variable capital. It isn't so easy to understand what he could mean by the real bulk of the constant and variable capital, for example. If it were to be a question of bushels of corn and, and uh, bushels of oats and various means of subsistence on the one side versus a number of hand looms on the other, it would be perfectly simple. But the fact of the matter is that the, the problem arises for Marx because of the qualitative differences in the constant capital as technology advances and how one is supposed to compare the mass of one set of machines with the mass of another set of machines is altogether impossible to understand. No one would have to reduce it to the weight or the volume or something like that. And in other words, there is no sensible comparison 
except what is reducible to the value composition. But apart from all that, it, Marx goes on to speak about the ways in which this capital is augmented, increased, taking up the argument from the previous work, previous part. And now the general principle has been established. The augmentation of capital is the result of the accumulation of surplus values. The addition, of course, this is transcending the simple reproduction now. And speaking of the progressive uh, augmentation of capital, what occurs is the surplus value is accumulated by the expropriators who uh, add it in some part in various forms. This is Marx's problem. The surplus value is taken up and then some, distinct, some uh, decision has to be made by the capitalist as to whether he's going to split that surplus into constant capital and variable capital in one proportion or in another. And Marx wants to come out to the conclusion that the increment to capital must inevitably be divided more and more and more in one direction rather than the other, with a growing emphasis on the constant capital part of the organic uh, composition ratio. Why does he do that? Does, did it occur to anybody? Why does, what, what is the great benefit to his final conclusion from the fact that the surplus value tends always to be shunted more and more onto the side of constant capital? Well, it means greater exploitation of the laborers because the laborers, the laborers' wages constitutes the trade. Well, you could say it, kind of, it, it leads to more exploitation, but on the other hand, doesn't it appear also as if it would necessarily lead to less exploitation? Because what is the ground for the, for the uh, employment of the proletariat? Yeah, what, on what does it depend? The possibility of employing the, the wage earners. Oh, the manufacturing plant. Yeah, but, but, well, in one sense, but <coughs> variable capital. See, the variable capital is that on the basis of which the employment of the proletariat is possible. It's the wages. Suppose that shrinks relatively, not to say absolutely, that variable capital. Then what about the possibility of employing the proletariat? I mean, I now speak very crudely, it's true. Unless it gets more. Yeah, you would, see, you would think that as if this cuts the ground out from under the expropriation of the next generation of surplus value. What does Marx say to this? Does it really do that? Well, that was the point of your first yes. conjecture, that it leads to greater expropriation and exploitation. Marx wants to come to this conclusion that as capitalism advances, there is a pressure on the capitalists always to apply more and more of the resources of the society to the constant capital side, leaving over less, at least relatively, for the employment of labor. Now this fund, the variable capital which is available for the employment of labor, is the source of the living of these men and women. If it shrinks, then, and you want to keep employed more or less the same number of people, it's perfectly obvious the dividend shrinking the quotient is going to have to become less and less, what's left over for each one. So Marx then has laid the basis for an argument to the effect that real wages have to fall all the time, must fall all the time. And yet, you know what I mean by this? That the, the dividend shrinking, but the number of people, let's say, remaining the same even for the time being, although as a matter of fact they've been shown to increase, then the quotient for each one must become smaller and smaller, which is the real wage. And this is Marx's point, that as capitalism advances, surplus value is taken away in larger and larger absolute amounts. He has shown how, in the previous parts, that mass of surplus value, remember, which he then shows in the development by a certain formula, the rate of expropriation multiplied by the amount of the variable capital. I, you remember I told you at the time when we worked on this that that was an extremely important proposition as tautological as it and, and simplified as it might appear. 
this that s equals s over b times b. And then you remember what, he's, what he did there. He showed that if the variable capital increases and the rate of expropriation decreases, certain things will happen. But if the rate increases sufficiently to overmatch the decrease in the variable capital, then the mass of surplus value will still increase. And that's really what he meant to show will finally take place, that the bulk of this S, out of which the constant and the variable capital have to come in the next generation, that will increase, but always with C getting larger and B getting smaller. But surplus, uh, well, surplus capital exists in the first place because labor power is paid for according to a, a theory of uh, a production theory of what wage labor is worth. And now uh, we find that labor is getting paid out of a wage fund theory of how much money there is to pay. Uh, so you have two theories explaining the, the amount of wages. And if the second one replaces the first, then you no longer have any reason to, to have the whole surplus value theory. Not, not precisely, Mr. Benjamin. You see, he provided against that when he said that the, the cost of labor power is not just how much it takes to stoke up the, the engine, but that there's a conventional aspect of it, and that there is, a, in other words, there's a kind of swing or a margin within which it's possible to adjust the wage. But that conventional aspect, uh, I would have assumed, would have been determined by sociological rather than directly economic factors. That is, not the amount of money around, but the customs, the style of life handed down by generation. That's, that, that's true. That's what he meant. So that, uh, in other words, you, simply because there was less money wouldn't change the customer aspect. No, I don't think that the quantity of money would by itself. Uh, the quantity of money for wages and wages. Well, even that wouldn't quite do it. He, uh, he, uh, let's take him to mean here real capital rather than the, the money sums. And I think that what he would say would be the amount of the means of subsistence available for payment through the variable capital can increase, all right, but it doesn't increase as fast as the mass of the workforce. Now, this is too bad to begin with from his point of view because it makes him look like a Malthusian. See, and then he appears to be saying that the human population has a tendency to outrun the means of subsistence without any business about arithmetic and geometric, but never mind. Now, he positively does not want to fall under the influence of any Malthusian theory of population. The reason for that is the Malthusian theory of population is asserted irrespectively of all social conditions. It's asserted like a natural law, and, and Marx doesn't want to be caught in any assertion of any allegedly natural laws which govern this or that state of society. And he wants to show the, the historicity of all of these allegedly natural laws. So what he has to do is to show that what looks like the Malthusian theory of population, which shows the population running out, running the means of subsistence, is really nothing but a, a temporal and local circumstance of capitalism. That's why he prepares his theory of population with some observations on the ratio of constant and variable capital, you see, and how the inner working of capitalism through the search for more and more surplus value and the addition on top of this of technology and machine industry leads to the need for more and more investment in machinery, while at the same time, more and more machinery has to be worked by more and more men, although not in the same proportion. If we go back to his rule that the machinery must be net labor displacing. The increase in machinery must be net labor saving. That's the source of the whole problem. The net labor saving means the redundancy of the population. See, well, so uh, that's what I meant to begin with by saying that this, these observations of Marx's with respect to the organic composition of capital are meant to lead up to a certain theory of population, which in turn is meant to replace the Malthusian formulation and to show that what was asserted as a natural law is really another one of the abominations resulting from the internal contradictions in capitalism. Now, what really does that amount to? Marx asserts it is not true that the whole amount of the population goes up and down 
in response to the variation in the availability of the, mean, of the means of subsistence. To begin with, Marx replaces the term the means of subsistence with the term variable capital, which is what arises out of his distinction between necessary and surplus labor. And now, if, if it is not true that the population varies in response to the availability of the means of subsistence, what is it that varies? Marx says it isn't the size of the population. It's the number of the employed that varies. So now, in order to operate a satisfactory uh, capitalistic economy, what is absolutely necessary is a redundancy of the population, a great pool of uh, available labor, which can absorb the variations of employment generated by the business cycle, with the understanding that the variations in economic activity generated by the business cycle don't have anything like the same period as a human generation. You see, if it were true that the business cycle lasted 20 years or 25 years or something like this, and you could fix it so that all the births came at the right time, namely at the, at the well, I don't know, I suppose at the peak of the one cycle to be ready for the peak of the next cycle, you know, then somehow or other, maybe it would work out that the burst and demand for goods and labor would coincide with the maturing of a new generation to be added to the workforce. But Marx said it's utterly absurd. In the first place, the cycle is of a decennial period, which is not true, but suppose it were. Uh, it, I mean, there is no such thing as the period of the business cycle, as people now know very well. But suppose even that that were true, it's true enough. And then, of course, the variation in the whole population becomes irrelevant. What is it that does vary? The size of the population, suppose like this, can be shown to be distributed between the employed and the unemployed at any given time. All that happens is that this boundary between the employed and the unemployed goes up and down, that's all. And there has to be a sufficient number of people around to be drawn back into employment when capital needs them. And there also has to be some place where they can be thrown out into when capital doesn't need them for employment. And he said, that's what this law of population reduces itself to. It's, a, it's really a law of employment, not of the numbers of the human beings. See, substantially. Is, is that uh, reasonably clear? I mean, that is the drift of this chapter. He tries to show that what looks again like an eternal law of the relation between men and goods is uh, something which really can be reduced to one of the minor inconveniences, analytically speaking, although humanly speaking, a very important thing, of the operation of the capitalist order. That takes the place of uh, Malthus. Now, you know his, his, his constant sniping against uh, Malthus. He, he objects to him on various grounds, but probably the most important is that he has tried to say something about the relation between the number of men and the increase in the bulk of subsistence, which transcends all social orders. That is his great offense. Malthus was not historical. <laughs> now, I can't go into the questions of the, uh, the details here. I will only point out to you this. He knows about the theories of demand and supply of labor. And uh, it, you know, he does not often lend himself to the conventional discussions, even so far as to use the conventional language. But uh, on page 699, You'll see he does take cognizance of the traditional or more traditional account of the, uh, the law of wages and the expansion and contraction of the supply of labor. What uh, he does is to distort the traditional teaching, however, and make the conventional economists say something which they could hardly have said without having been destitute of all common sense. They didn't say that the whole population rose and fell in response to the demand for 
labor because they understood as well as Marx does or did that this takes place or can take place in very short periods of time. And Smith was at great pains to speak of Adam Smith, of, to speak of, of the, uh, the long period tendency of these things to happen. Now Marx has not, I think, effectually disposed of that contention. He has not shown that over a long period of time, a decrease in the availability of subsistence will not lead to the effect that the classical economists supposed, and that increases in the availability of subsistence don't, generally speaking, promote an increase in the population. Now, other people have understood as well as Marx that this doesn't follow as the night the day, and that there, in fact, has been already understood and superimposed on the laws of Malthus that in a very prosperous population, there will be perhaps for some a time a tendency for the rate of subsistence far to outrun the increase of the human population, as for example in some of the Western countries now. And to some extent, therefore, Malthus was wrong in asserting that as a simple proposition. But that is not the point that Marx is making. That wasn't the point at which Marx's criticism arose. Marx wanted to connect the law of population with a law of surplus value. And that was what the classical economists failed to do. And that was the, uh, to do that was his intention in, in the way in which I uh, tried to sketch it for you very, very briefly. Now, it goes without saying that the, the final fruit of that theory or of that explanation of Marx's is an enormous increase in human misery. That's why it's true that the largest part of this chapter is given over to another uh, account of horrors of uh, modern industrial life, because the existence of that, in, uh, that uh, industrial reserve army of the unemployed with his various categorizations of uh, floating and latent and so on, that all adds up to one more uh, increment of degradation, misery, slavery, the piling up of people into absolutely unbearable slums, being driven around over the countryside in gangs of laborers, you know, various uh, shifts that they're driven to in order to try to eke out their lives in the periods when their work is not needed and they are not given any uh, way of earning a living. Uh, now, uh, all that one can say is what he, what he asserted is absolutely correct. Uh, that under the, under the circumstances that he saw and that many other people saw before him too, as he proves by quoting them, the conditions were absolutely abominable. The conclusion from that, however, is something very different from what he understood to be necessary. <clears throat> uh, I think that he, he would have been inclined to say such a thing as unemployment insurance, you know, with some provision being made out of the common stock of social wealth for those people who have been put out of employment for reasons unconnected with any shortcoming of their own is simply impossible. It's unimaginable. Unemployment insurance is unimaginable in a bourgeois society. The reason for that is it would cost the employers something, and they won't submit to it. <clears throat> now, he didn't say it in so many words, but I take it that his argument depends on the impossibility of that measure and similar ones. I wouldn't want to say that the future of Western civilization stands or falls on the, the basis of unemployment insurance benefits, but it's got something to do with it. Uh, the possibility doesn't arise. Uh, in other words, the amelioration of the difficulties by what we could loosely call political measures that, uh, that is not uh, acknowledged by Marx, and we'll have to consider this after a while. Now, on, on page 706, I would point out to you something which is merely interesting. It's a little curious thing. Uh, there is the paragraph that begins on that page, the lowest sediment, and so on. Now he says, exclusive of vagabonds, criminals, prostitutes, in a word that, quote, dangerous, unquote, classes. This layer of society consists of three categories and so on. I don't know whether the quotation marks are in the original. But it's, very, it's impossible to determine. But I, I wouldn't be surprised if they were. Yeah, I fail to understand the need for the quotation marks at that point. But you might wonder about this to see where Marx is lining himself up 
or <clears throat> what uh, view of human things and uh, eventually of social science seems to be congenial to that use of the quotation marks. Uh, I would point out, if I can only find it now, there is another passage, much, yes, on page 835, 836. The expropriation at the bottom of the page, last sentence, the expropriation of the immediate producers was accomplished with merciless vandalism, and under the stimulus of passions, the most infamous, the most sordid, the pettiest, the most meanly odious. I don't see any quotation marks. Yeah, but I think in this situation it's clear it was dangerous. Dangerous is uh, the qualification here, but the damage has been repeated. Sure. I think that people are reasonably well off. From the point of view of the truth, you know, dear, I think it's a very dear. Yes. They are not even to be repeated and not to be feared. Yes, I suspected that something of this nature was probably yeah. in the vicinity. Yeah, but uh, nobody should think that it was simply a question of value-free uh, social science. I point to your attention, uh, call, call to your attention that second passage in which he was yeah. quite free to make all sorts of distinctions. But then on page 707, he gives in the middle of a page what he calls the absolute general law of capitalist accumulation. Although it's absolute, it is modified and it's working by many circumstances and so on and so forth, but we don't have to go into that. The greater the social wealth, the functioning capital, the extent, extent and energy of its growth, and therefore also the absolute mass of the proletariat and the productiveness of its labor, the greater is the industrial reserve army. And then he uh, tries to show how the more, in other words, in the expression of this law, the more successful that capitalism is in its objective, which is the multiplication of surplus value and the increase of capital, the more it has to produce the seed of its own destruction by human misery, expropriation, and immediately by the increase in the size of the industrial reserve army of the unemployed. In other words, in simple language, the more it succeeds, the more it fails. That is uh, very important for, for Marx's teaching. Now, again, there's a, a, an important and interesting passage from the middle of 708 to the top of 709, but I can't uh, go into it here. It's another statement of Marx's understanding of the abomination of capitalist society. All the, the things that it does to the working people they mutilate the laborer into a fragment of a man, degrade him to the level of an appendage of a machine, destroy every remnant of charm in his work and turn it into a hated toil. They estrange from him the intellectual potentialities of the labor process in the same proportion as science is incorporated in it as an independent power, and so on and so forth. It's a very good statement in brief of Marx's uh, objections. Now, the rest of the, the chapter consists of the Bill of Particulars with respect to the various localities and the conditions, in other words, of more or less chronic unemployment among a large number of people, a growing number of people, and the uh, terrible shifts to which such people are put in order to try to keep their, their bodies and souls together. Now, he ends with some statements about Ireland. Yeah, that's the last part of this chapter. And yeah, all I can say is that uh, his statistics are, you know, rather uh, rough and ready. And it would be very hard to know whether he has really made out his case on the basis merely of the, of the empirical things that he adduces. Uh, I, I surely don't know how good the statistics of income at that time were. As you know, that's a very difficult question. And a lot depends on merely empirical things. To a certain extent, I believe what he's trying to say is that there was very great inequality in the distribution of income. And now that one would probably have to grant. Then, however, he goes on to make some, uh, to draw some conclusions about the relations between the 
number of people in Ireland and the incomes of some and ultimately the incomes of all without ever using the word income incidentally and there it isn't any, by any means clear how he is making his argument it's a collection of more or less empirical observations with a number of restatements of his prejudices already uh, expressed plus the fruits of his analysis down to the present time uh, in the argument and for example when he speaks about the fact that income has risen or certain kinds of income have risen notwithstanding the shrinkage of the, the enormous shrinkage of the population of Ireland uh, but that other cl classes of income have shrunk he doesn't pay any attention whatever to the fact that removing a large part of the population removes also some part of the demand for goods now it, Marx does this all the time he does not like to regard the, the population as part of the source of demand for goods it is his general purpose to play down the quality of the population as a as a, a place where the goods finally come to reside this isn't very good modern economics might have thousands of shortcomings and i'm sure in many ways it doesn't penetrate anywhere nearly as deep as marx does into uh, some fundamental things but at least they pay attention to some details and they do approach their work without the same doctrinairism that Marx is always guilty of, which is part of what increases the interest in his work, but at other times it depreciates his work. Now, you can't speak of the movements of population without speaking of the effect that the consumption on the part of the increment or decrement has on the whole evolution of income in the, the population. He obviously doesn't like to draw attention to the fact that when you remove some people, you might remove so much consumption that the rate of activity left among the others is adversely affected, and maybe even very much adversely affected for a certain reason. Because if somebody thought about this a little bit, he would see that maybe the increase in the population can have the same effect in the other direction. More people might lead to a multiplied generation of income for the whole community and therefore also among them. Now, how much this is true and what laws of economics govern this would be a very long thing for us to go into. And really, as a matter of fact, it's not well understood even to this day, although there is a lot of analysis of something called the multiplier. But if one doesn't somehow pay attention to this phenomenon, then certain facts that are massive can't be accounted for. Like, for example, that in spite of Marx's assertions that all these things must take place, they haven't. In the time since he wrote, there has been an enormous increase in the investment in constant capital, to use his terminology. But there has not been the technological unemployment that he predicted in the form of an increase in the industrial reserve army until eventually the weight of it would become unbearable. Something obviously must have happened to the distribution of income in the meantime, and some effect must have been produced by the mere increase in the number of human beings. Not to mention one other thing that he never gives any attention to, and there is a certain passage which I could find for you in a minute if, well, it's not worth it, in which he speaks about the increase in the mass of the constant capital and the displacement of the working men whose labor is made redundant now, but never pays any attention whatever to how that uh, new mass of constant capital came into being. Now, there must have, somebody must have made it. It's a very simple idea. Somebody must have been put to work making that enormous machine. He knows that the machinery was, was very large. In the middle of the 19th century, they already had big mills, and a, a capital item absorbed the work of many men, and not only the ones immediately connected with it, but, you know, all back in the chain of production. No mention of it. It has something to do with the empirical thing. I mean, it seems to me that Marx does take account as a consumer, but in a way which is more compatible with the Marxist approach, correct or that is, he's concerned only with surplus consumption or consumption 
which might have something to do with surplus labor. Uh, obviously, those who live consume, but obviously also they consume only just what they need to live. And this amount would always remain relatively constant, the amount being consumed this way. And he goes into production cycles or, or overproduction cycles where you have a problem of absorbing the surplus. And these become quite significant. But I, it doesn't have to be the normal consumption of the yeah, but you see, in this normal consumption, this is a difficulty with him exactly for the reason that came up a minute ago, Mr. Benjamin, you mentioned, raised your other question, that how much goes into the, into the consumption of the working class is partly fixed by convention, or let's say by practice. Now, that means that under some conditions, the standard of living could rise enormously. There is nothing about Marxism that shows demonstratively why it can't happen as long as he's talking about the conventionality of the standard of living. I mean, there is no limit to it, up or down. Well, down there is obviously a limit, uh, you know, after a while. But up, there is no limit. Now, as this little, this little empirical circumstance accounts for a very great deal of what has actually happened, so much, uh, in fact, that it imperils the more rigorous part of Marx's doctrine. How else would one describe the condition of the working class now in comparison with the condition of the working class, say, in the first third of the 19th century, as described by Marx, except that the notion of what is proper by way of a distribution of income has changed very much. And to a certain extent, what has achieved it is what he would never admit, <clears throat> namely, a merely political operation. The government, the rate of taxes, he speaks about that, but he speaks of taxes always as if they meant mostly either paying the interest on the national debt or else the poor rates. Well, as it happens, that's very inadequate. Uh, and so the public finance has had a very large effect on the redistribution of the national income as a commonplace. You know, as one could say, after certain men, uh, Newton and others, developed the calculus, schoolboys could do all kinds of problems which Archimedes couldn't do. And now one could say every freshman who's had a course in economics can manage certain problems which, or understand certain things which Marx uh, either didn't understand or willfully wouldn't understand or couldn't take into account as possibilities, namely the wholesale massive redistribution of income through public measures. But, and now you might say, well, that's purely empirical. <laughs> it is. Was Marx's qualification of the inevitability of revolution in the United States and Britain in the latter part of the fight based upon recognition that the distribution of income could occur? It, it could be, although I, I don't think he had a great deal of ground for confidence by the 1870s. Uh, the, of course, the, the, the chief instrument of income redistribution was the graduated income tax. Now, Britain's income tax by that time, well, the British income tax, as you know, is very old, but I think it didn't amount to anything until probably sometime after the First World War. Yeah, but, uh, we didn't have one. Yeah, labor unions, of course, by the... Yeah, but uh, now if he, if he was willing to say that the, uh, the collective bargaining would make that crucial difference, then it's hard to see how he could stick to the Communist Manifesto in principle. See, because then there is no end to what can be done by social democracy. Labor unions and things. But that's in, that's in fact what has more or less taken place. Well, there's no point in continuing this little skirmish with Marx all the time, but you know that he saw many things and he saw them very clearly. But for a certain reason, he couldn't see some things. And that goes back to points that came out when we were still talking about the German ideology. You know, what it is that is the root cause of man's consciousness and his mode of organizing his life. Well, all right. Now, there is a very interesting remark at the very end, the very last words in this chapter on the general law. Not the very last ones, which are in Latin, but the, uh, the paragraph there. Like all good things in this bad world, this profitable method has its drawbacks, that is, say, getting rid of the people by emigration. With the accumulation of rents in Ireland, the accumulation of the Irish in America keeps pace. The Irishman, banished by sheep and ox, 
reappears on the other side of the ocean as a Fenian, and face to face with the old queen of the sea rises threatening and more threatening the young giant republic. So what he was saying in effect was that the uh, massive wholesale transplantation of the Irish to the United States will lead to an anglophobia in the United States which will eventually be as dam more damaging to England than the anglophobia of the Irish in their native habitat because here their anglophobia will influence the policies of a great and independent country. That was a, that's it. You must admit he was a man with a very far-seeing eye. He, was, he, saw, he saw a great deal. He's very shrewd and very sensitive to political things. That's not nonsense, is it? And, you know, In this connection, you should also look at the premise of the first edition uh, on page 15, where it also refers to the United States. Uh -huh. At the same time, on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, yes. I think that you should be there. Uh, at the same time, on the other side of the Atlantic Ocean, Mr. Wade, Vice President of the United States, declared in public meetings that after the abolition of slavery, a radical change of the relations of capital and of property in land is next upon the order of the day. Yeah, these are signs of the times not to be hidden by government. Well, I see. Hmm. And later on, the, uh, it was the doesn't it say, within the ruling classes themselves, for all the installing. Yeah? The top of page 16, says the present society is not solid listed, but an organism capable of change. The present society is capable of change and is constantly changing. Yeah. He does not say here what he says on page 824, that force is the only way in which well, with, uh, incidentally, with respect to this, uh, this keen observation of Marx, it must be said that at least what he asserts with respect to the Irish here is not simply a question of his, his great shrewdness, but I think that quite a few people who observed the relations between the Democratic and the Whig parties in the United States before the Civil War during the slavery agitation and the emergence of the Republican Party uh, also knew that the presence in this country of a large immigrant population, and to a large extent an, an Irish population, had an effect on domestic policies. And in fact, I believe the Lincoln and Douglas debates are given part of their character by the position that the Democratic Party took with respect to the foreign immigration of free white labor, and also the impact that that had <clears throat> on our attitude as a nation towards England. So this is not simply spun out of Marx's great ingenuity, uh, but uh, the expression of it is very clear and very forceful. Well, I think we, we ought to hear Mr. Phillips on the so-called primitive accumulation, part eight. And, uh, well, your, uh, the part of the, the book that you had to deal with was in a way the most interesting because there, Marx, in a way, rewrote, the, well, wrote from his point of view the history of the Western world from the 15th century down. And his rewriting of the history of the Western world should have given support to his abstract remarks with respect to history that we found in the German ideology and in the Communist Manifesto, and indeed in the early part of the of the present book, and I was wondering uh, what you, what your general reflection was on uh, on this question. Do you think that when he himself wrote history, uh, that he made out the case very strongly for the position that everything depends on the mode of production? 
that the mode of production is really the beginning. It, he doesn't go into the question of man's consciousness particularly here, so it's relatively simple. But does he make out the case even for the argument that the social forms can be traced so exactly to the changes in the mode of production? Did you, did you think about that at all? I think in his discussion on why feudal society had to undergo these changes, uh, he didn't go into this in detail, but he made a few statements about the inability of a feudal society, even though it may have had production at a certain level, to ever get beyond this primitive stage or to expand strictly on an economic level uh, beyond what he would call a primitive level. So I think in that sense, he was describing some of the reasons why all these changes which follow, uh, in a sense, had to occur. So I think in this very vague way, he was trying to, well, I think in this very vague way, he was in accord with his earlier statements that the economic will determine the social forms of production, in as much as they trigger the kind of changes he's talking about. Yeah, but is there any support for the idea that because some sort of progress is desirable, therefore it must inevitably come about? I mean, so let's grant for the time being, which incidentally he doesn't make a great point of, that the feudal economic order was not capable of bringing about this big explosion of production, which is that's certainly stressed in the Communist Manifesto. It had to happen from one point of view, but the, can you see how he traces this change as it actually took place to the changes in the mode of production? Is that made very clear? Well, he mentions quite a few things that are responsible for changes in the whole social and economic order. But then if you look to see what kinds of things he enumerates, he says uh, the voyages of discovery and the importation of gold into the, uh, the old world from the new world. Well, that looks as if it could have some relation to this. But then he speaks about the rebellion of the Dutch against the, the Spanish and the decay of the old feudal order, uh, the old feudal nobility and its replacement by a new feudal nobility. In the conventional histories, what uh, is usually given as the, the ground for the decay of the old feudal nobility? What set of events? the eradication of the old nobility and the replacement of a new nobility. Do you have to remember? And in this sense, he steps aside from the arguments and outlines which you generally find describing the rise of the new tradition, the whole series of inventions. Yeah, but he doesn't, that's the interesting thing, he doesn't so much step aside. I mean, if I remember correctly, the, the people, the conventional historians, assert that it was the Crusades that had a great deal to do with the destruction of that old nobility who mortgaged themselves and then they also went and they traveled and they got killed and all kinds of things happened. And, and after that, they, uh, the, a new kind of noble order arose in Western Europe. He makes a point of the destruction of the old feudal nobility because that tended to loosen the bond between the upper class and the, and the peasantry. And uh, as a result of that loosening of the bond, the grip was tightened, and there was greater, you know, heartlessness, mere profit motive in the relations among the men. But now, who has ever said that the Crusades represent a change in the mode of production? Or that the, that the, the revolution of the Dutch against the Spanish to take something much more recent, that this had an origin in the, in the mode of production? You know what I mean? When he himself has to start writing history, it turns out he makes a great reliance on all kinds of things to which the mode of production seems quite irrelevant. And very often they come back to such things even as what some men thought was true or important about you know, the way of worship and the importance of some place in, in a part of the world which they call the Holy Land, that kind of thing. And that's got very little to do with the, now he might say sure, but then you have to go back into the mode of production in order to see why anybody uh, is so vain as to call some spot the holy land, and why somebody should rather be a Protestant than a, than a Roman Catholic or something like this. Well, by that time, uh, you come to the, you get the impression that you can prove anything that way, you know, 
if you're willing to be ingenious and persistent enough. But the fact of the matter is when he talks about the immediate effective causes of the changes in social life, he has trouble in many cases referring them to the, uh, the changes in the mode of production. Uh, uh, Dr. Okay, Strauss, please. I, please. I, I Well, I would raise this question. Was Marx's intention here to write history, economic history, as a leisure of economic history and others? I would say no. I think this is the last step of the whole argument, as we have had it hitherto. You remember, in the beginning, capitalist production, first simple stage, uh, the defraudation of the worker of his fair share by service. Yeah, that was interesting. But now you could, of course, say, and uh, all the further steps, and uh, you remember also the other step, which I think is very crucial for this argument, that once the capitalist starts, 10 years from now, the capital will be the sweat of the poor, and no longer his capital, you know. But still, then you could say, very well, yeah, that may all be true, but he who has after him will be given. And the fact is that you have always rich people. And that these rich people have amazing possibilities which the poor lack uh, is an object of envy for the poor and so on, but that is it. So there, is, there is nothing wrong with being rich. Uh, people uh, who are lucky, for example, say in former times, they lost two wives in childbirth, yeah? and uh, uh, well, take very simple situations in the countryside. They marry again, and then it means no doubt. And if such a chain of good luck takes place for two generations, a man is three times as rich as his neighbor. So what's wrong with that? So in other words, the question is, what Marx discussed in Book 8 is this. Did the rich come by their wealth to begin with, honestly, that's the question. That question he, he took for granted up to now, uh, the rich, he didn't question that. The rich are people who are legally and legitimately rich. And in the eighth book he shows, well, not regarding all rich people, but regarding the capitalist rich, that they stole their money to begin with. So the whole thing is a fraud not only now, but from the very beginning. Only in the beginning it is much more obvious because it was at the beginning even clear illegality. The enclosures are of commons and no compensation for the poor, the part of the commons, you know, and all the other things. I believe that is what he is, sure. uh, that is what he is trying to do. He is not trying to prove that Marx's uh, philosophy of history, he is trying to complete his analysis equal indictment of the capitalist system. Yeah, yeah, yeah sure, sure. sure. No, I, would, I would say so. Yeah. But the, the, I think that he's under some obligation to complete that in a way which is not grossly inconsistent with some of his fundamental principles. Yeah, but he could, uh, sure, and that I grant you. But uh, on the other hand, would say for the immediate purpose of the capital, that was the most urgent thing. Now, uh, of course, I think in, uh, one must also uh, not forget something which Marx suppresses here completely, but which he recognizes the Communist Manifesto, for example, and that is this. Now, if someone would be so impudent as to defend these malpractices of the 16th, 17th century, by this consideration that well, that is a bad ancestry for the capitalists, but what did the pre-capitalist societies do? Did the feudal lords originally come by their belts uh, in, uh, in a perfectly moral way? You know, what Marx does not do, what Rousseau does, by a strict a priori construction to show that all wealth is somehow theft. Yeah. And this is the sort of origin of inequality. Marx tries to prove it and kill it. Marx would, of course, learn that. But he would say in the first place, it's a particularly loathsome thing in capitalism is that it was not throughout straightforward violence. You conquer a country 
make the inhabitants uh, serve or whatever, that's sort of the capitalism that is somehow uh, discussed. But the main point uh, at which I'm driving is this. Marx would ultimately, of course, say uh, that ultimately the moral judgment is irrelevant. Namely this, why did people do all these things, these beastly things, conquering countries and saving the inhabitants and enclosures and, and what not? Answer, scarcity, fundamental scarcity. Fundamental scarcity combined with dissatisfaction with scarcity. As long as men were satisfied with scarcity, they were simply primitive. And there would, have, would not have been any development of human productivity, material, and intellectual. This development requires the development of the rapacity and the avarice and all these other busy things. In other words, he would only repeat in a different way what Plato indicates in his brief remarks in the second book of the Republic. You remember the transition from the city of pigs to the real city? Uh, when people were completely satisfied with a simple life, uh, uh, out of very bad reasons, because they want to have luxuries of some sort, but that is a necessary condition for the development of the good city. Uh, good. Now, from this point of view, capitalism appears in a somewhat different light. Capitalism is that social system which prepares the abolition of scarcity, which in effect achieves already the abolition of scarcity without, however, drawing the proper conclusions from it. You know, this high praise of the capitalist system in the Communist Manifesto, when he says, look at these things, these are infinitely superior to the pyramids, and the capital and whatever, the, these buildings, the famous post offices and other, and or factories rather, of the, of the late uh, 18th century, 19th century. Therefore, the, the modern condemnation of capitalism uh, is of course meant seriously the Marx, but it is dialectically integrated into a transmoral whole, if I may say so. Yeah. You know? Yes. And I think that is really the most, uh, the most interesting problem. And if I may, uh, uh, can you give me another five minutes? Yes, yeah. Now there is one passage which I thought was particularly revealing regarding our whole problem on page 835 following, where he speaks, yeah, that's a fairly long passage. I will try to find the most important passages. The private property of the labor in its means of production is a foundation of petty industry, and so on. And petty industry is an essential condition for the, the development of the free individuality of the laborer himself. Petty industry, i.e. private property. Yeah? This mode of production uh, uh, presupposes parceling of the soil, etc. As it excludes, yeah, as it excludes the concentration of these means of production, so also it excludes cooperation, division of labor within each separate process of production, the control over and the productive application of the force of nature by society, and the free development of the social productive powers. You have a free development of into the individuality of the labor himself, say in the fuel system. But you do not have a free development of the social productive forces. Now on the next page, uh, it's the second paragraph, well, what does it say? The transformation of the instruments of labor into instruments of labor only usable in common. Uh, that is what the capitalist process starts and what is preserved in the communist system. In other words, there is a very interesting half admission here that the development of the free individuality of the laborer himself is in a certain tension, to put it mildly, mm -hmm. to the free development of the social productive powers. Yeah, that I thought is, is interesting. Whether that this primary goal, the free development of the individuality, is really compatible with the socialization of the work. Now, I, I will con conclude what I have to say on this subject, or the overall subject, as follows in this simple principle of propositions. 
What Marx seems to teach as a whole, I'm not speaking now of his economic teaching religion, of course, is this. The truly human, the final communist society, emerges out of the subhuman by non teleological necessity. Yeah? And of course, the development of the capitalist system, out of the feudal system, is also not teleological. Certain things took place. Yeah? And then one thing leading to the other, you have the capitalist system. It's a non teleological necessity. Now, this means, however, since the truly human society consists in the control of nature, and the whole process is itself a natural process, nature produces its own overcoming. So I think that is no exaggeration to say. Because the true human society is, as a free society, rules society, is in control of, of uh, rules uh, nature, is in control of nature. Nature produces its own overcoming. Very well known in present day bourgeois social science is the problem of values. But to come back to Marx, the second difficulty. This contrast is the work of nature, because there is no fundamental uh, distinction into nature and spirit, or whatever you might call it. This contrast is the work of nature. Nature persists. Human nature persists. Think of the need for food. Then, for this reason, there cannot be an escape from necessity, from the realm of necessity. And we have seen this in more specific economic considerations, the obsolescence of the plants and all these nice things. No overcoming of nature. That, I believe, is the simplest way in which I can make clear to myself the basic difficulty in which Marx gets entangled. Well, with respect to the point that uh, Dr. Strauss raised about what Marx was uh, trying to do in this uh, eighth book, I would put it a little bit uh, differently. I, it occurred to me that what Marx felt was that he was under some necessity to give an account of the beginnings of the absolute beginning. Now, I'd have to say not the beginning of man, but yeah. uh, the, the coming into being of this system. And he was under a peculiar necessity to do that because of some details of his economic analysis. He was able to show that when the working man is separated from the means of production, then surplus value is possible. That is to say, there must be an employer-employee yeah. thing otherwise. Now, that presupposes the need for capital. There can't be this relation without capital in order to set it in motion. But, of course, before this arrangement has actually existed, where is the capital? So if one can say capital comes from surplus value, and surplus value comes from capital, that's all right once it has started, but it's no good unless you know where the beginning is. So he had to show how there could be capital without surplus value in the first generation, so to speak. In other words, to go back to the beginning. Now, what he had to do, in other words, to, was to show that the beginning was really quite exceptional, as beginnings are. That's what's meant by the beginning. It's not like the rest of the process. And therefore, it was peculiarly violent. Now, but still, although it had to be different from the rest of the process in some respects, it had to be similar to the rest of the process or consistent with the rest of the process in the most important respect. It had to respond to the same rules of historical change that prevail at all times. Now, there had been an account given long before Marx which tried to explain the coming to be of the difference between rich people and poor people and therewith the difference between capitalists and the others. And that was that there are some human beings who are rational and industrious, and there are others, mostly more and more others, who are not rational and not industrious, or one or the other. And that means that some will have wealth and others won't. And as a result of this, some will own the means of production and others won't own the means of production. Land to begin with, but uh, 
that's not important according to the uh, traditional account, that the means of production will land at one time and something else at another time. That's too, that doesn't, that wouldn't have interested Locke particularly, I believe. Now, it was of some importance for, uh, for Marx to show <clears throat> that this explanation of the difference between capitalists and others didn't make sense because this presupposed some real natural inequality among the human beings, uh, quality, differences in their, their character as men. And you can say, well, what Locke meant to do when others like him was to point to the fact that those who are rich deserve to be so because they were industrious and rational. And the ones who are poor deserve what they have too because lazy and ignorant. Now, uh, it's uh, absolutely of the essence of Marx's explanation that some other account be given and that it be possible for him to recur to his formulation of all of mankind with all differences internally becoming unimportant or uninteresting vis-a-vis -vis all of nature on the other side. In order to give his account, he really had to give a kind of history of mankind in the West in order to show how this act of uh, abrupt transformation could take place. Now, but his historical principle is the mode of production is what affects the, fundamentally it's what affects the social condition. <clears throat> and although I wouldn't in any way deny what, uh, what Dr. Strauss uh, asserted before yet, I would say to the extent to which Marx tries to give an account of the beginning, he is, let's say, incidentally drawn into the need for giving an account of the whole massive course of history. That's what he must do. And ultimately, it's what, and indeed, it's what he tries to do, although you can get the evidences of a certain kind of running down towards the end of the book. The, the treatment is very much more cursory. The broad subjects are treated very briefly. I think if you compare part eight, say, with part three or part four, that you, you get the notion that, that what happened in this book is like what has happened in quite a few other books, I believe that the author gets a bit worn out after a while. And the subjects of equal scope are not treated in, in, with equal uh, intensity here. This is the no, no, no. I mean, this is purely ad hominem. I don't mean to uh, depreciate anything, but it's, I think it's simply a fact. So, and moreover, he lets himself go in part eight in ways which he didn't do so much in others. For example, he becomes positively frantic, and one can see the color of his face changing when he writes the footnote about Edmund Burke. The, the abuse, you know, the real uh, passion and, and exasperation that come out without any restraint whatsoever is really quite operative and, and uh, it was plain frantic with anger about that uh, well-known sycophant and sophist who wrote that the laws of economics were the laws of nature. I mean, that, of course, is the highest and most corrupt uh, form of apologia that Marx uh, can recognize in any human being. Well, now, so then we would have to go into a lot of details, which in the first place I'm not equipped to do about the history of that time. And uh, moreover, as to the ones which I think I could say something about, we don't have the time to do it anyhow. But I only point out to you that, that Marx refers repeatedly to such things as cannot be traced to the changes in the mode of production in order to give an account of why the social order changed. And I don't mean to say that he was wrong in that respect, but I only mean to say that he fell into the same difficulty anybody would, I think, who tried to give an account of the history of Western Europe you know, over many hundreds of years by referring everything to the uh, changes in the mode of production. The simple truth of it is the mode of production didn't change by anywhere near as much as the massive social institutions changed over that period of time. So something else obviously had to be taken into account, and he did. You know, when Tocqueville wrote about seven or eight hundred years before, he, he spoke of the great watershed in European, in the, in the history of Western men, as being eight hundred years before the, seven or eight hundred years before the time he wrote. I think seven hundred years. That brings it back to sometime around the, you know, the book was 18, say 1830 to 1130. And people, people are still trying to figure out I think, more exactly what it was he could have meant. And I think in a, most people trace it back to the Crusades, something that are connected with that set of, of events. 
Well, lots of people, in other words, have seen that some massive changes took place in European life as a result of the Crusades. I say nothing whatever about the coming to be of a number of men whose thought constituted a radical change in the, the character of life of men in Western Europe sometime later, not the, not the 12th century. But these things, Marx has to take cognizance of only, so to speak, left-handedly. And it detracts and gives his, his whole doctrine the character of a construct with some measure of artificiality. Uh, it was just one question on this point. Yes. There was also a page of 789. 789. Um, in which it seems to indicate that while well, the growth of the capital is a part which is very important, yes. that there were two kinds of nobility. One yeah. was the good old nobility. Yes, that's, that's the passage I had in mind a few minutes ago. But the bad new nobility. Yes. That it was necessary to have a bad new nobility before they could do these things like enclosures. Very and good. So yes. Which is really a moral change within the human class of which had nothing to do with the moral production. Well, yeah. Well, by an accident, which was the feudal wars. Wars and I think the Crusades. Uh, but yeah, that, the bottom, bottom of 789, yeah, right, at the bottom of 789, Dr. Strauss, the last 789 and the top of 790. Yeah, that was the passage that I had in mind a few minutes ago when I spoke about the passing away of the old crew nobility and coming to being of the new one. Probably it had most to do with the uh, Crusades, but for, you rightly for, for mentioned also the War of the Roses, although I don't know which period he has. Is a, a moral change, though, in a sense. Sure. I mean, because the old, uh, at least from what I got from your past, the old was a decent group of people yes. who, uh, who kept the time honored traditions. Sure. And then all of a sudden, the new one is an avaricious group of people who uh, think only of money and who think of money, they do all these terrible things. Yeah, the dislocation of the whole social order. Well, uh, let me take cognizance of that observation and also make a more general remark which, in which I'll try to say something of what I understand all of this to mean. Now, what does Marx begin by showing us? <clears throat> that the origin of value is in some laboring of men. And what is the real bearing of this fact? When he looks at capitalist economy, he finds it altogether unreasonable because men are governed by a kind of illusion in their activities. And then you have these, these people who own the means of production and those very much larger number who don't own the means of production. And the many are kept in subjection to the few through an economic arrangement. But the economic arrangement looks to all these people like a natural and inevitable affair, something which is not historical, but which is in the nature of things, that there must be some who own and many who don't own. So a, a vast illusion. Now, at the bottom of this illusion, what do we find? Expropriation, the phenomenon of surplus value, through an elaboration and as an immediate consequence of the labor theory of value. So a kind of act of cheating. Now this, this leads him to say something about the whole character of the capitalistic economic order. What do people really do? What they really do is to provide the means of life and comfort for all of mankind through their operation. That's the real meaning of economic activity and production and so on and so forth. It's to arrange the articulation of man and nature for the sake of providing for human life with some measure of convenience. Now, but that's what's real. But how is it made to appear? It's all made to appear as a search for profit, a search for surplus value. That's what men immediately do, although the end result is the survival and the comfort of the humankind. Now, Marx asserts, in effect, this is the unreasonable thing about it. We interpose between ourselves and our real object, i.e. our comfort and convenience, our living, we interpose between ourselves and that 
i.e. between ourselves and nature, a social arrangement. And that arrangement is driven forward by a most unpalatable passion, the passion for gain. That's what really makes it work. To begin with an act of cheating, that act of cheating is perpetuated through the continuing search for gain by the expropriation of the many of the products of their work. What would be the sensible arrangement to avoid that mediation between man and nature <clears throat> and to have the simplest of all social conditions, man operating directly on the means of production without the artificiality of uh, uh, social devices and particularly without the need to have the social machinery driven forward by the appetite for gain. There is a footnote in part eight in which Marx says, in effect, how strange it is when we think of uh, the whole nature of things, how often the mediator is, is, takes the real gain and benefit from all sorts of processes, not only economic, which uh, go on around us all the time. It, it might even be that we can find this because it's, he gives some outrageous examples, among others. But uh, it's a long footnote. Yes, now I thought I found it. It's too bad because it really illuminates a number of things. Yeah, here it is, page 816. Uh, in the middle of that footnote number two. It's after the quotation in French. Already it is evident here how in all spheres of social life the lion's share falls to the middleman. In the economic domain, for example, financiers, stock exchange speculators, merchants, shopkeepers, and so on and so forth. In civil matters, the lawyer fleeces his clients. In politics, the representative is of more importance than the voters, the minister than the sovereign, and so on and so forth. And now, he had, let's say, and I don't mean to psychologize this uh, point, he had a, a, an objection to the mediation between the one thing and the other. And he thought that the mediation was somehow or other an artificial and altogether unnecessary hindrance. Between man and nature, there need not be any mediation, let's say, of a social system driven by the desire for gain. But plant man on nature directly, immediately. That's the sensible thing. That avoids the illusions, the fetishism. The fetishism of commodities is one example. But it, it avoids all kinds of other illusions as well, uh, you know, which he was not bashful to uh, uh, speak about in so many words. Man and nature, that's the whole. Put the one together with the other. Political life, religion, these other mediations, these are all part of the unnecessary claptrap of apparatus that has been built up in the course of centuries. Now, one gets the impression at some points that Marx, by 1867, or maybe even, to be generous, 1844, has discovered the fact that self-interest is the mainspring of economic activity. And now, he needn't have been at so many pains uh, to discover this all over again. I think if he had uh, read some of the preceding books with a, with a certain interest, he would have been able to find this not only concealed, not expressed implicitly, but this was said to be the main point and benefit of the modern industrial order. He need not have discovered it. He need only have read certain passages in The Wealth of Nations where it was not only conceded, but it was insisted that this was the point, that the reason that the economic arrangement A, worked at all, and B, worked well, was that it depended upon a certain passion or, or uh, appetite, which nobody thought was admirable in itself. As far as I know, nobody has ever said that the desire for gain and profit is in itself attractive, pleasant, or charming, or anything. But many people have thought that it somehow or other provides a, uh, an effective and tolerable mediation between one man and another, and between man and nature. Now, I'll put this thing a bit differently. <clears throat> it might be, it has been, I think, asserted in various ways 
that the government of men or the arrangement of social life depends upon a certain kind of mediation, the making use of certain things for the sake of other things. Why have men hit upon the passions as a, an instrument by which to achieve the social purposes? Well, you know that when this was first proposed in modern times, it was proposed with eyes wide open. There was an alternative which was well enough known. You don't have to take advantage of the appetite for gain. You could perhaps take advantage of the appetite for glory or honor, or you could take advantage of the possibility of human nature that leads to morality through law. Various things are possible. Yeah, each one of these is connected with some measure of freedom, of human excellence conceived in one way or another. And one has to make a reasonable adjustment of what one gets and what one gives up. Now, the men who, who asserted that human life could be placed upon this ungenerous and altogether unattractive basis of a desire for gain did so with a certain interest in mind. They thought that if you turn men loose under the influence of their passions, that maybe it would be possible to release them from certain other constraints. That is to say, motives developed from inside make superfluous certain constraints generated from outside. Now, that's a very long story, and it, isn't, it wouldn't be possible or appropriate to go into it here. But the fact is, it was thought that to allow men to operate on the basis of some passions made unnecessary some other kinds of uh, social regulation. Marx, apparently for the first time, believed that it was not necessary to pay this price at all, that the mediation of the passions was uh, altogether superfluous for the first time, that uh, in order to get the benefit of social, social life, it was not necessary to pay the price in terms of troubling to some uh, low and uh, contemptible selfishness and, on the other hand, to accept as the necessary alternative a measure of heavy restraint from outside that would lead to men being formed and controlled in their behavior and so on and so on. It comes back once more, I believe, to this belief of his in the power of man to become an altogether different kind of being from any that he has been known before, uh, that has been known before. Without that, none of this would be intelligible. Why should it be necessary to have this mediation of political and social institutions between men and, and nature, in other words, to make all these detestable concessions to human avarice and so on? But only because men have those passions in them. And Spinoza and other men said, now you rail against these passions. Uh, that's you're railing against human nature. And well far agreed as to say, indeed, that's the point. They're railing against human nature, and you now, Spinoza and Adam Smith and similar men, you say, well, all right, now we have a more enlightened view of human nature. And so instead of railing against the passions, we'll turn them to our own ends. Uh, but except that we'll, we'll understand it's not nice, and it involves all kinds of indecencies and so on, but after all, human nature is human nature. And at that point, Marx's qualification is, that's your big mistake. Uh, human nature has been human nature down to this time. But from henceforth, given certain changes which we think will affect the, the designs of operations, no concessions will have to be made. The passions will be subverted, eradicated. I don't know what will happen to them. They'll go underground or they won't work or something. But that source of the need for political life, the passions, and generally speaking, human imperfection, that will be banished once and for all. And that coming about through certain alterations in what he calls the mode of production, but I must say that I, as for me, I'm unconvinced that the mode of production will, can change sufficiently to bring anything like that about. For example, so far as the mode of production of the, the socialist society will resemble the mode of production of the capitalist society, these things cannot occur that he predicts and hopes for. So far as you still have men working at machines, they won't be artisans. You can't help it anymore. They won't be. That's gone forever. 
that kind of man will never reappear on earth except if there should be an amnesia of science, if by some cataclysm human beings should forget the science and technology that they have and return to an earlier age. I'm sure everybody's mind is now on the same eventuality. That could happen, but uh, it's not what Marx had in mind. And he didn't have that mode of bringing it about in mind either. That was not what he would call a change in the mode of production. That's a change in the mode of destruction. And that nothing short of that could bring that about, I believe. So, uh, well, I, my final observation would be that in the first place, as I've told you repeatedly, I believe so much of what he says is affected in its cogency by merely empirical things that there is a, a difficulty in accepting his entire construction. Merely empirical things. His, his forecasts break down at so many points, have broken down at so many points, that there is, uh, we have absolutely no ground for being confident that the main point still persists. And I would say that the reason for the breaking down of his forecasts has so much to do with him himself, with his own effectiveness in bringing about political changes, that by his own work, we see the weakness of his own theory. It's because Marx himself said certain things that the, among, I mean, Marx among other people, that men's minds were changed sufficiently so that absolutely fundamental changes took place in the structure of society, which defeated his own larger forecast. That's number one. But in the second place, I would say that without this transformation of human nature, the most important consequences of the labor theory of value and what it leads up to in the historical sense become absolutely unintelligible. And until the case is made out for the possibility of those, I must say I am altogether unconvinced. Please. The mediation business. But the term reminds me, of course, of Hegel sure. and Paul Ross, therefore, make the following addition. The mediation is, as in Hegel, absolutely necessary, absolutely necessary, and is eventually overcome. In the final state, there is no longer mediation. For example, immediate Brown. That's immediate. But that's all oh, this, which is immediate. No understanding is possible except by mediation, what we call reasoning in the wise sense of the term. But at the end, we have again a perfect unity and in a way a return to immediacy on the highest level. And that, of course, is what Marx has in mind. Uh, Marx, the mediation is not for, uh, for Marx as it would be for a simplistic anarchist. A mere folly of which we should get rid. The, media, uh, the mediation is and was absolutely necessary to bring us out from primitivism and bring us to that. Uh, oh, uh, one must uh, you know this, of course, but I thought one should have that. And then there is a remark which I would like, which I cannot suppress, as though it has only indirectly to do with Marx, and that concerns Marx. The mark on Berg, of which you reminded us. There is a certain, uh, Berg, as well as uh, any other interesting man, is of course controversial. And one controversy regarding Berg, which I regard as particularly useful and important for the understanding of Berg, is, is this. Uh, people have rediscovered in the last 10, 15 years how much pre modern classical and medieval thought there uh, is in Berg. And so much so that today there is a tendency simply to say there is no difference to speak of between Burke's teaching and the Thomistic teaching. This quotation of what Marx quotes is a simple refutation of this simple interpretation of Burke. I mean, that if it is true that laissez-faire is not an integral element of Thomism, to put it mildly, then Burke cannot be an unfortified Thomist. Yeah? That's only in passing. Good.
I, I think that the, the students have been, in a way, slighted yeah, sure. by, by me, anyhow. And by the group. But let us add another All right. Was there uh, question? Is there any poss possibility that the, when Bismarck um, uh, started battening down in 1873, bringing in social security and things like that, could he have uh, picked up problems from Marx? Yeah, that's a historical question that I, I couldn't say in detail. I mean, as to whether uh, by between 1867 and 1873, but I don't think it has to be Marx so very much himself. And, yeah, and uh, plenty of others. You know how many people Marx refers to with approbation, this point from this one, that point. There was a big current of, of socialism. Yeah. Sure, everybody. Well, every sale involves a price, one could say. If you sold out, you collected something from this mark. Yes, the price. Yeah, but the only democracy is. Well, and the fact of the matter is that even apart from what happened in Germany, you know, the, the social security kind of thing there, the trades unions, the legalization of the trades unions in Britain, which of course was before Marx ever came on the scene, apparently one could say these things were coming, and it was a question of time. And Marx undoubtedly helped to speed things up, because he was so immensely superior. You can't read this book without being struck by the superiority of that man. Many things that he said had been said by others, as he is perfectly willing to admit. He never denies that. The footnotes are full of attributions to other men. He was not ungenerous that way. But I don't think that anybody ever put it together with such a tremendous wealth of learning and such a great mental power, such a power of systematization, an enormous ability to, to construct so that's very impressive, and it simply cannot fail to have an effect. I mean, a man like that cannot fail to have an effect, which is, a, in a way, the most devastating thing one could say about him. Because, you know, it's men like him make the consciousness. It isn't something of who stands in front of what tools. That, of course, has a great deal to do with men's characters and so on and so forth. But what they believe, as distinct from their... Uh, their roundedness as human beings in his sense, that has more to do with men like him than it has to do with any tools they stand in front of, you see. Yeah. Yeah. On, on, this, on this very point that you alluded to before, uh, as though Marx's ideas uh, had this kind of effect in and of themselves, mm. well, could Marx easily say that uh, because uh, of the historical stage that the world was in and moving into, that uh, they were right for his ideas, and therefore that it wasn't really his ideas because he was, say, a superior thinker, and there were other superior thinkers then before him who were not taken up, uh, but, but he, his ideas, you might say, fell on uh, fertile soil, he could maintain. Uh, uh, fertile soil that was Set up by the very historical process. Yeah, well, it seems to me, though, that the, uh, the, that, that's an argument that he, he couldn't possibly win. Because if the time was ripe and so on and so forth, he was superfluous and his book was a work of supererogation. And that he surely wouldn't assert. Yeah, but if he was not superfluous, then uh, what, would the, what would the course of development have been without him? Uh, I, I'm sure that he made some difference, he had some effect. And I'm also sure that the, the currents of reform were in existence before he came on the scene. Now, undoubtedly, there would not have been something called Marxism if Marx, I mean, and I'm not pointing to the petty quibble now that it would have been called uh, uh, Jonesism or something like that, because some man Jones would come along and do the same thing. But I mean to say that uh, the, the particular form that the reformation of modern society has taken has been very much affected by the singular fact that he, Marx, with his powers and his learning and his construction, 
formulated the needs as he did and as he understood them. Now, how he could derive his work so directly from the material circumstances surrounding him is very hard to see. And moreover, I think he never makes any claim that that is true so far as he himself is concerned. See, that's all that I would uh, assert with respect to him. I don't know if this is just all together. It doesn't matter. Yeah. Well, then in that case, I think we...